So we are live. One second is connecting. Okay. So we are live? Yes. I, I can see some echo. It's connecting. I'm going to mute my micro. Yes, maybe if, if you have the YouTube open or whatever, then there is eventually some echo. Okay, so if we are live, I think, uh, I believe we can already start. Uh, so uh, hello, everybody. Uh, it's uh, midnight in Central Europe. So uh, good afternoon in, in Asia Pacific and good morning in, in America. Welcome to everybody to the first IHR uh, Congress, especially devoted to the young professionals. My name is David Ferras. I am the vice chair of the Education and Professional Development Committee of IHR, which is the committee in charge of the organization of this Congress. This is a World Congress in the sense that uh, it is uh, worldwide and it is for young professionals and by young professionals, as most of the authors, they are young professionals. That's, that's the main reason why it is also an online Congress, a virtual Congress. Uh, of course, coping with the uh, current uh, uh, global context of COVID is a good reason to, to make it online, but the main reason is that we want to overcome the difficulties of uh, long distance trips from young professionals, and we want to maximize and to involve as many young professionals as we can. I would like to introduce now the first speaker of this opening session. So it is my pleasure to and great honor to introduce Professor Joseph Lee from Hong Kong University Hello. of Science and Technology. He's the uh, president of IHR since last year when he was elected during the World Congress in Panama. And he was the vice chair during uh, between the years 2007 until 2011. So he has broad experience on the management of the association. And during his talks, he will be talking about the strategic themes of uh, IHR and its relation to young professionals. So Professor Lee, the floor, or better said the screen is yours. Okay, thank you, David. Uh, so let me go to my uh, PowerPoint. Uh, uh, hello, everybody, uh, colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be invited to speak to you uh, uh, for this uh, first uh, IHR YPN Congress. And uh, I'd like to congratulate the uh, local organizing committee as well as the International Scientific Committee for all the nice work. I can see we have a very nice program that will allow a lot of the young members to interact uh, with the technical committees. And mounting a good event like this uh, during challenging COVID times uh, also reflects the resilience of IHR as an organization. So thank you very much. IHR, we are celebrating our 85th anniversary this year. Uh, over the past 85 years, we've made a great strides uh, contributing to the development of water engineering and protection of the environment. And, and we are, I would say, a truly international association that produces knowledge products that lead the industry in many fields ranging from uh, environmental fluid mechanics to hydraulic structures to water quality control. And uh, Many of our institute members have also contributed uh, to provide solutions to sustainable development in many countries. And I'm sure that many of the young YPs, uh, young professionals present today, uh, will carry on the torch of fine tradition in the coming years. The future is in your hands. Now, what I'd like to do today is to talk about the IHR strategic themes. Uh, the Council met since Panama, and, and we've uh, developed a four-year strategic plan focusing on certain strategic directions. And this is reflected in the themes of the upcoming Congress uh, summit in December. Uh, and that's eco-hydraulics and nature-based solutions, AI and water, and water security in Africa. These are the 
three major themes related to our strategic goals. And this is uh, not to say that we, uh, we don't do anything else, but it's building on the traditional strengths of the uh, technical committees. We, we focus on these things that we would like to focus on a little bit, eco-hydraulics, nature-based solutions. And these are the speakers in the fourth coming summit. Now, what I'd like to do today is to actually just talk about these, uh, these the first two themes, eco-hydraulics, AI and water, uh, using a few examples, a uh, bit of uh, no details, but many issues and challenges and opportunities to share with you. Uh, as for the third focus, uh, I appeal you to attend the summit in December because we will have the Minister of Water and Energy from Ethiopia, the former Vice Minister of Higher Education Research from Tunisia, as well as our honorary member, Professor Jörg Imberg, at Stockholm Water Prize Laureate, speaking. So it will be a very high level, interesting uh, session. Uh, and if you want to know more about the third theme, please come. Now, what I would like to do today is actually just to uh, say a few words on these global challenges, uh, which I look at drivers of change. Uh, traditionally, uh, hydro environment engineering has been about, uh, you know, uh, water supply, hydropower, moving water from one place to the other, drainage and so on. But the global challenges that we face are, are very different is uh, population growth, climate change, urbanization. And underlying all that innovation technology as a driver, economic growth underlies all of this, as you will see. And in a way, our strategic plan relates to these global drivers of change. So I, I will just by way of chatting mention two examples of eco-hydraulics that I've uh, worked on, but more so from a historical point of view, why I worked on it, the challenges, the research challenges, the, uh, as well as the, what you can do to help with sustainable development. And I'll talk about artificial intelligence, why AI and water I see as a, a major focus. And finally, I would like to end with a short note on uh, SARS, 203 and COVID-19 and what it has to do with IHR. Just, just a few, so I have a chat, some, some uh, things. So the global challenges you all know well, I think uh, population growth, climate change, uh, et cetera. And, and, and it leads to problems with too much water floods we have to deal with the extreme weather the high intensity rainfall and the droughts. And uh, it, it also necessitates uh, 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 smart water conservation management. Uh, water too dirty, of course, pollution, but modern day problems, uh, as I indicated here, this uh, water quality uh, touches on very uh, complex interdisciplinary issues. And in fact, all the strategic themes I will talk about are interdisciplinary, and I'd like to say a few words on this. So I just illustrate a few examples on this. And, you know, in the future decade, uh, we will be seeing innovations in water for an ecological civilization. Now, this is a term actually that started from the US. And, and the focus is all on water conservation, protection of the environment, uh, enhance the ecology, protect wetlands and birds. And the focus is on changing from combating nature to working with nature. And you see this, uh, this is a, and really is a strategy, I would say is a, a slogan to put conservation at the core of the strategic development of any society. Uh, and, and to solve these water and food security problems uh, all require innovations involving what we do in IHR, uh, assisted by big data, machine learning, and there are many opportunities. And the key is, I'd like to mention these opportunities. This is a fish farm in Hong Kong. 
And I used to make observations of water quality on a fish farm and, and was awed by the power of nature. Sometimes when the environmental conditions are right, the microscopic algae can grow to astronomical concentrations and the dissolved oxygen in the water can drop to near zero, wiping out all the fishes in the bay. I remember very clearly July the 21st, 1987, a long time ago, we did a field survey there. I went to the US for a conference. One week later, I came back, all the fishes were gone, boom. All because of low dissolved oxygen and algal blooms. But sometimes the water can be saturated with DO under apparently the same conditions. And I, I used to wonder, can an engineer like IHR member help in solving this problem, which seemed to be a phenomenon studied by biologists in test tubes? And can we predict water quality in the hope of better managing the environment? And the same problem actually, it's not just fish farms, it occurs in many urban cities, many harbors, and I'm putting myself back 20, 30 years. I mean, you can imagine situations like that all over the world when you have a lot of uh, uh, wastewater going to the harbor, it will lead to low dissolved oxygen, high ammonia nitrogen, high bacteria levels, uh, leading to many, many problems, beach closure, uh, et cetera. You can't just can't use the, the water. And I want to show this because uh, this is uh, like before we fixed the problem. This was uh, we, in Hong Kong, we have a, a very nice harbor and every year we used to have a cross harbor swimming race. And this is uh, back in the seventies. In those days, people seem to be a lot fitter. You know, people just uh, participate in the swimming race. But it was suspended because of uh, poor water quality for 30 years. Uh, it was, uh, you know, rain for 60 some years and then it was stopped because of poor water quality. And then, and then uh, uh, in, I think in 2012, it, it resumed this cross harbor race again due to the work of hydro environment engineers. And I was uh, witness such a race, uh, one occasion, two ones. It was very impressive occasion. Uh, and you can swim again, uh, of course, due to a lot of efforts, uh, due to the work uh, involved, IXR members are involved in. And so you can really make a difference in sustainable uh, development. And it turns out that uh, the, you know, the, 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 whether the beaches are reopened, whether we can reopen the swimming race has something to do with bacteria. The bacteria levels have to be meet certain standards and E. coli levels. And so the question is, we wonder many years ago and still wondering now, can we actually forecast water quality? And what I mean is this, you know, sometimes you observe the DO drop to near zero on one day. And on another, apparently the same conditions, it seems it's, it's very high. And then can you actually explain it? And sometimes you also encounter situations like why is the bacteria level very high at one beach? But at a very nearby beach, it is very okay. The water quality is okay. So, so we are, when you talk about hydro environment, you are, you are talking about uh, very complex uh, problems. Uh, that, that can maybe assisted by uh, big data. So what we did, I mean, I, I'm not going into details, but what we did over a period of decades is to develop a, actually a smart uh, environmental management system that, that's able to forecast the daily beach water quality forecast, whether in, in four categories, one, two, three, four, for every beach in Hong Kong, and that's called WaterMan uh, system. And that, that uh, of course, has a lot to do with hydroinformatics uh, and uh, it's useful for uh, disaster, emergency response, EIA, et cetera. And, and, and so this is uh, uh, the, the problem prompts that and it involves a lot of uh, uh, research. Now, not, not only beach water quality forecasting. Uh, what, what we are, have been working on the, over the past 30 years is actually something to do with uh, fisheries management because we're running out of fishes uh, in the sea, period. 
And 50% of the fish demand in Asia, for example, comes from mariculture, comes from um, you know, uh, fish farms. And so it's important to be able to understand the ecosystem. And you talk about ecosystem services quite a bit. And so what we've developed here as part of the former system is to really find a way to combine the hydrometeorological data, hopefully high frequency data with uh, models. And then uh, somehow uh, every day, if we can somehow predict the temp uh, vertical temperature and salinity gradient, in other words, how, how stable is the water, uh, that it depends, the turbulence depends on the stability of the water column. If we can uh, somehow have the data for the sunlight, which provides the energy for photosynthesis, and if we somehow can have the data for nutrients, which provides the food for the algae, maybe somehow we can forecast a prognostic forecast. Uh, you know, it's like a, a risk of a risk of algal blooms the next day. And believe me, if you can do that for one or two day lead time, you can do a lot to minimize uh, damage. Okay. Now. What I want to show here is just recently, and of course, in, uh, in, in traditionally, traditionally, uh, water quality monitoring involves uh, field surveys. You collect a sample, you go back to the lab for analysis. And even today, the most reliable way is still done this way, measuring chlorophyll A, uh, measuring cell counts, looking at which species, still under a microscope by and large. And so that's very uh, manually, uh, very labor intensive. And, and also it, it stretches to the resources of agencies to the point that you cannot no longer afford it because it just problems too many. And you, you require measurements that take time. So one, one work that's ongoing one internationally is to use these so-called imaging flow cytometers, a very, a, a lot of electronic gadgets with LED lasers there. And the idea is somehow you can put it in, in place and you can acquire these images of the algae in the sea uh, real time and you can acquire up to 30,000 images. And so this is uh, the, the why you know, AI can play a role because with such a lot of data, you, then you can talk about AI. And, and the idea is somehow if we can use uh, machine learning techniques and robust image processing and feature selection software or, or methods. And then we use uh, these extractive features and use image uh, analysis and classical uh, techniques such as random forest. Then maybe we can classify, look at these images and tell, tell us remotely and automatically whether there's a harmful species in the sea. So basically this is the idea. And so for example, these are, we've chosen 14 target species. These are like uh, diatoms and uh, very slender looking. So all these are kind of different shapes, different texture. So the idea is under the, un, in the sea, can you actually uh, detect this? And, and this is a kind of a confusion matrix where, where uh, if you use the right method and develop uh, you know, the method, uh, you can achieve success of 80% of the time. And this is still, of course, at the research stage, but if you think ahead, can we think of developing AI chips that actually have these, uh, you know, built in and you just, if you can make such a product, I'm sure there are good business opportunities that you can use on fish farms worldwide, for example. Now, just to along that thinking, I just want to show you that a lot, you know, innovation entrepreneurship is the key that many startup companies related to AI and water. And this is an example of a company uh, that used unmanned service vehicles to clean up rubbish. In fact, just to, uh, and, and this is a company, uh, young guys, uh, I, I mean, this is uh, in, in, in mainland China, but I'm sure that there are many com companies worldwide doing the same thing, just to illustrate. So, so kind of this is the, the eco hydraulics AI uh, kind of a, a, a situation. Now, 
when we talk about eco hydraulics, we also mention nature based solutions and the kind of things we talk about actually also we need to consider such problems for coastal reservoirs, which are very popular now. People are talking a lot about coastal reservoirs. So that what that means is along a coastline, if you have a natural topography, you dam the water and you create a reservoir out of it. And in fact, this is the world's first reservoir from the Sea Pilbara Cove Reservoir in Hong Kong built in 1970, creating 230 million cubic meter just out from the sea. It, it was, uh, uh, you know, a lot of uh, IHR, Wallingford uh, had a lot to do with this. And after many years now, coastal reservoirs are evoked again. And, and if you want to develop a coastal reservoir, then there are many problems such as the one we've discussed, many eco hydraulic problems that you need to worry about. But I just want to, this is kind of uh, using uh, nature to solve problems is, is, is uh, you know, is invoked again. So such as the kind of just in passing, just a, a few thoughts, you know, uh, eco hydraulics in the discipline research, AI and water, they, I think, you know, worldwide there are many, many opportunities for young people. And, and you know, you just have to uh, kind of open up a little bit to see these opportunities. And I hope YPN Congress like this will facilitate this exchange. Now, in closing, I want to just touch on, you know, nowadays, we are amidst the COVID pandemic. And it reminds me of my experience in SARS. We struggled with SARS in Hong Kong in 2003. And, and in a way, what is SARS? For those of you who uh, don't know, it's really, it broke out in high rise buildings like this where a patient visited, visited somebody in, in a flat and it, it broke out and, and 300 people died in Hong Kong. It was very, it was very deadly in, in, and, you know, and uh, it was a big thing globally. And it all happened in a high rise building with very, very congested uh, light wells, if you like. And so if we go back in history, we were overwhelmed. Uh, we had 300 deaths, uh, you know, in, within a few months and the whole city was like uh, deserted and, uh, and uh, nobody knew what was going on. But it turned out it has something to do with virus and moist air droplets, like what we are talking about today. In fact, uh, what, what actually happened was the, the infected patient had diarrhea, used the uh, toilet facilities, and somehow the, the, it, the, the virus got into the moist droplets in the shower and it went into the light well. And you know, moist air is lighter than air. So it rises in this light well, like a plume, like a buoyant plume. And, but the problem is in this light well, you actually, by the time this virus gets up to the top, it's diluted only about five times. You really get very, very limited dilution. So it has a chance to infect all the, all the flats uh, here. And by, by the way, this is very narrow, like 1.5 meters in that particular, place where infection occur, like you can open your window and shake hands with your neighbor. It was very, very particular situation. So that, that was now, so this is my kind of final slide a bit. Uh, so nowadays you talk about COVID-19, you talk about safe distance and people sometimes have meetings like you are an evil you know, neighbor, you know, three meters away and so on, which to me is very unscientific. And in fact, a cough, or by an individual, is really a violent release of buoyant, hot, moist air at high velocity, carrying pathogens in the form of droplets. And so actually you can, people have done a lot of experiments and you know, the velocity can be 10 to 20 meters per second. But it turns out if you understand this process, like jets, plumes, thermos, puffs, you can use rather simple calculations because a coughing event is like a turbulent puff. Even using rather simple things, you can convince yourself that the safe distance is around two meters. In fact, this is likely to be conservative because we didn't even uh, look into the sinking velocity. So sometimes when, when, you know, when the, the, the media 
uh, is such that uh, you know makes people feel like you have to be 10 meters away to be safe, which is really unfounded. I think I go back to my SARS experience and anyway, COVID, 1.5 to two, whoever is the right distance. And in fact, that's very safe because of all the assumptions involved. So, so anyway, just a, a note. So finally, I have one slide to share. Uh, I went through, you know, uh, in the discipline research and all these years I, I worked with biologists, epidemiologists, mathematicians, entering from different fields. And, and you can see the opportunities both for research and business are in the interdisciplinary fields. And I have some uh, kind of things I learned over the years doing interdisciplinary research. I won't read this out, but I hope you, you, you kind of see what I'm trying to say. Uh, to really survive in the new world, so to speak, I think there are two things that are most important to do in this research. One is learn to appreciate others. And secondly, be humble in the front of experiments and field data. Sometimes we get too hung up with 3D models and believe that's the reality, but, but no, it's, it's actually very far from it, usually. So uh, in closing, uh, I hope I uh, you know, have shared uh, some useful thoughts and um, I wish you well. Thank you. So thank you, David, that's all, all I have, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Lee, for this interesting and inspiring talk. And to share with us the vision, the vision of IHR concerning uh, so important aspects related with the main strategic themes, their interdisciplinarity, and uh, the relevance of the young professionals in how to tackle them. Um, by the way, I, I would like to add that uh, coughing is a very transient flow, no? And uh, since last year, there is a new working group in IHR specially devoted to transient flows. So. Uh, who knows, maybe a new research line for this group. Okay, so now I would like to pass the word to, uh, precisely to a um, prominent young professional uh, um, called uh, Siddhar Session, who used to be involved in the baden württemberg uh, Young Professional Network in Germany. And last year he was awarded uh, with the um, prestigious JFK Prize which is the most prestigious uh, prize for young professionals in our field. And currently, Sid is uh, based in the Netherlands, where he's carrying uh, his PhD in the Research Institute of KWR. So Sid, please uh, feel free to share your screen and, uh, and go ahead. Yeah, thank you, David. Uh, just sharing my presentation. David, can you confirm everything is okay? Yes, we can see your presentation. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, David, for that uh, kind introduction. And I uh, also would like to thank uh, Dr. Lee for a lovely uh, opening remarks and some very, very fascinating information there. Uh, as uh, David had mentioned, my name is uh, Sadat Seshin, and I would like to uh, briefly just discuss uh, my experiences as being an IHR young professional and the benefits that I've faced uh, uh, with my membership and how it's helped me progress in my career specifically. But just to quickly start off uh, to tell you who I am. Uh, well, as David mentioned, I, was, I am still a current member of the IHR Baden-Württemberg YPN, which is uh, based in Stuttgart. And I also served as a president uh, from 2018 and 2019. And last year I was honored the IHR YPN uh, Kennedy Award, uh, where I got to go to Panama City for the IHR World Congress to receive it. And uh, right now I'm a scientific researcher for the KWR Water Research Institute based in the Netherlands. And uh, we are a research institute that are generating knowledge to enable the water sector to operate water wisely. And uh, we, our motto is uh, bridging science to practice. So at KWR, we have a sense of professional and social responsibility uh, for the quality of water and our scientific findings uh, and the results that we generate uh, is to contribute worldwide to a sustainable uh, urban water cycle. We work in a, poly in a variety of themes like water quality, health, uh, water scarcity, emerging substances, and so on and so forth. And finally, I am also a PhD student, as also David mentioned in, uh, in TU Delft, 
where my research will be investigating real-time control of wastewater treatment plants uh, to reduce harmful greenhouse gas emissions like uh, such as laughing gas N2O and to also ensure uh, operational efficiency. And this is done with uh, with a with an innovative way to try and uh, develop models in a hybrid format where we use process-based models and even artificial intelligence and to see how we can achieve plant-wide control in such a manner. So try and merge the two worlds as that's also the buzzword uh, with AI and machine learning as also Dr. Lee has mentioned quite a few times in his presentation with the different research. Uh, so, but all of this that I have I have achieved so far in my short span of life is, is all based on some experiences that I've had in the past that has greatly helped me. And uh, one of them that has been a very critical part so far has been my membership with the IHR YPN in Baden-Württemberg. Uh, and uh, just to give a quick, uh, you know, short uh, shout out to uh, the YPN, uh, we are an active member of 56 uh, students and young professionals and researchers based in Stuttgart, Germany. Uh, it's also coincidentally actually the first student chapter of IHR. So it was the first one to ever happen in, 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 in terms of all young professional networks which was founded in, in 2000. And it's dedicated to promote student uh, activities to facilitate uh, their communication with young professionals all around the world and also with international renowned researchers. So it's a powerful academic network uh, to aid in the transition as it could be quite hard, which I something faced myself last year to transition from being just a student to a young professional or a researcher. So the y YPN is a very strong network to allow you and, and and give you the opportunities to have a smooth transition while attending various events, socializing with other students and professionals from a large variety of countries. So it's quite diverse. Um, so some of the events that uh, the IHR YPN has been doing and are still doing, of course, this year was a slightly different with the, with, the, with the pandemic. However, I think spirits were still quite high and we did as many things online from, uh, from what I've seen and there was uh, Things like to develop your skills, like uh, applications and how to write a how to write a CV, as simple as that. Uh, sounds simple, but is quite hard in practice. And uh, it, the training is always useful, particularly for international students who are coming to Europe and would like to pursue a career in Germany, for example, where it could be quite different. Uh, another very interesting and good program was the Buddy program, where the IHR, YPN, and the members uh, took it upon themselves to create a program where each of the new incoming students and potential YPN members will get a buddy so that they can go through the transition more smoother into being becoming a student again and also understanding what perspectives are there as a professional or as a researcher moving forward, what all opportunities you have, what all skills could you develop and how you can use that into really become a more better professional or a, or a more a holistic researcher or a consultant wherever you want to go uh, moving forward. And uh, also, a good thing is a lot of field trips that happen, for example, to uh, the water utilities or the drinking water treatment uh, facility in Lake Constance next to Stuttgart, for example. So, you know, to learn by actually seeing, not just in the classroom. So I, the Young Professional Network also was able to try and have these kind of events where we can actually go and see things that we are actually designing in class or learning about and see how things work in real action. And uh, sometimes uh, we also had a lot of uh, sports events or other fun events where we would have soccer tournaments or football tournaments uh, and uh, where we would in friendly competition uh, have, have uh, games and try and find a winner who is the best master's program or, or any in within the young professional network or something like that. Unfortunately this year it was postponed uh, for obvious reasons but I'm sure uh, once things subside we can get back to that. And it would be quite hard to do a virtual soccer tournament so hopefully next year we would certainly uh, have another event on that. Um, and yes, so oops. So we also, just to show some more pictures of how happy we are within the Young Professional Network and how, uh, how um, the things that we also do, like a colloquium, which is an annual event where we also, students are given the opportunity to, to part, uh, participate and present their research, be it master thesis or any other, any kind of research programs as well as professionals from the from the real world, as you might call it, from consultancies or, or renowned researchers can also come and give their experiences through projects or through some kind of great journal articles that they've written to, to show what is the opportunities that we have out there and what, what could be done, what is happening out there and how you can go as a young researcher and you know try and find your way in the different interest areas that exist in the hydro environment space. 
And uh, there's also a lot of lab tours that we do where it actually give on the flip side, the PhD students in a young professional network can also provide uh, younger students or younger researchers, the, you know, their findings, their research to show what they're trying to do, what they're trying to achieve, and they can show in hands-on environment what is there to learn as such. So that those are some of the events also that happens in the Young Professional uh, Network in IHR, Baden-Württemberg, and I'm sure in many other young professionals as well. So we could have a good lecture series where, you know, very renowned professors come and give uh, a lecture, a technical uh, uh, lecture on what what are some things that you can learn, or we could go and have a little more fun and go somewhere outside in nature, uh, where we are after all some form of environmentalist, that's why we're in this field. So it'd be nice to be in nature as well together as a community and also learn by seeing and then just by being out in nature. So overall, I think uh, the IHR Bajan Wurttemberg YPN has been a great, great experience for me. And as you can see in all our very happy, lovely faces, including some uh, very, very uh, renowned people within the leadership of IHR as well, supporting us. Uh, we are definitely, uh, I think, being uh, giving the opportunity to be together, learn a great deal. So there's a lot of benefits that I have seen in my membership with IHR YPN. And I just thought it would be nice to sort of talk about some of them or point them out uh, with all these pictures that I've shown you. And one of the things is to be part of a vibrant network where you consist of a variety of people, of students, of researchers, professionals in various interest areas. After all, hydro environment research or, or engineering is a, it's a very vast space. And within that, there's also more interest areas and niches that you would like to learn from or, or get in part of. So the YPN is very strong in being able to give you that guidance or give you that, that great architectural space for you to, to be able to explore these kind of things. And uh, it also bridges the gap between students and professionals, which I and many students do face it to be a problem where we don't know where we want to go two years from now when we start a master's and there is a whole journey that we need to go through. And the YPN gives you that platform where you can actually be able to interact with some kind of professionals and explore future corporations and there's exchange of knowledge. And finally, attending or one of the things is attending various events that can aid in your personal and skills development and stimulate that scientific thinking that you might need that can enable you to do use it in your own research or when you become a professional uh, in, in, in a consultancy for for example and um, of course attend opportunity opportunities to attend global events such as the IHR World Congress personally I was lucky enough to benefit from that as well and that was only through my my participation within the YPN and that gives you the opportunity to meet so many people from all around the world, very esteemed researchers and professionals, and get to know really what is happening and being part of a true, strong hydro environmental community, if I might say so. And of course, be part of an international community, as I mentioned, and very important, I think most important of all is to make friends. I think you're part of a community of like-minded individuals. And I think that gives you the opportunity to be, have make more friends of people who you can understand and relate with and together you perhaps can go out there and try and achieve the things you would wish to achieve and uh, solve all the issues that Professor Lee, for example, has talked about in, uh, in his presentations. Uh, so future perspectives, as I said, the bridging the gap between students and the academic world, that's, that's where the YPNs come in extremely, uh, is very strong at doing to promote student activities and research through IHR's global presence. Of course, IHR is a very big, internationally renowned organization and the YPNs have the opportunity to sort of uh, benefit from that, like myself right now, if I might say so. And, uh, and, and you can also be part of the movement of advocating the role of science in the development of solutions for global water issues. That is a fundamental IHR mission and concept. And we as young professionals also have the opportunity to be part of that movement through a young professionals uh, network. And how, how do we do that? I mean, we, we have a lot of things going on. And I think one of the things is like international YPN events, like this very Congress itself, we are coming together as young professionals to talk about the research we are, we are part of and, and the things we want to do. And that is a way for us to network and also seek guidance and understand from more, uh, more uh, esteemed and uh, respected and experienced researchers who are here to guide us and to allow us to understand what is the path moving forward? And that's the whole, that is exactly what IHR I think is all about. And we want to grow this YPN family and a pro immediate action item that we could have is to have an IHR in, in the Netherlands as well, where I am right now and so is David. And uh, this is in fact a immediate action item that we are most probably going to take up 
So if anyone over here is very much interested in being part of that, please, please do come and contact us. And if you're not already yet, I might say again, become a member. If you're here and you're not a member, please, please do become a member. And I think, I hope my benefits that I've showed is a great way uh, to, to understand what you can get from being an IHR YPN as I have myself. And I wish everyone else could also get similar experiences. So with that, I would like to uh, thank you. And I wish everyone a fun and fruitful IHR YPN Congress and feel free to contact me if at all needed. And uh, yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sid, for this uh, very passionate uh, talk. And uh, yeah, you, you transmitted your experience as a young professional in a very clear and clean way. Um, I would like to talk a bit also on the, about the young professional networks. So let me share my screen. So I hope you can see my screen right now. Um, okay, so um, I would like to talk a bit uh, of what are men, the young professional networks, and how we came up with this idea of the of a, um, an IHR Congress, especially devoted to the young professionals. So first of all, what are these young professional networks? This YPN acronym that we mentioned that much. Um, IHR supports the education and professional development of future engineers, scientists, and water experts. As, as Seth mentioned, uh, the YPNs are this framework in which uh, young professionals, students, they can gather together and talk about their work, their project, share experience, travel together, etc. So uh, this is what, in essence, YPNs are. Uh, the uh, picture in the right, for instance, is one example of the, one of these gatherings. If I'm not wrong, this was in uh, Kuala Lumpur during the World Congress in 2017. But this is just the peak of the iceberg because the, the YPN network, it's a huge network. IHR, it's a huge network of young, young professionals, among other things. Um, and it's very, as you can see in this map, it's very much spread uh, worldwide a total of uh, 2,500 young professionals, for, uh, 46 young professional networks, and they are distributed in uh, 52 different uh, countries. The 39% of these YPNs, they are in, in China, 35% in South America, 19% in, uh, in Europe. Uh, it's, um, although it's small, there are many YPNs in Europe and, and active as, as the example of the German YPN, and 6% uh, in, in the US, also in many countries in, in Iran, uh, at the 2%. So, uh, well, you, you may wonder why, the, why in Africa there are no YPNs. Um, as Professor Lee mentioned, um, water, security, water security in Africa is one of the strategic themes of IHR. So we are willing to open uh, new YPNs in Africa. So if there are any young professionals listening now uh, from Africa, keep, keep this in mind and do not hesitate to contact us, to contact the membership officer of IHR and ask how to set up a, a new YPN or how to join any existing YPN. Why to join? Um, well, Sid made a great summary. So I believe I can uh, uh, move quickly through these slides, but uh, just to mention, uh, it's mainly about networking and sharing experience, and it's the right framework to, to do so. Uh, so also to collaborate with different uh, YPNs, not only the one you belong to, but also there are many activities between different YPNs to join uh, field trips and group trips, like the example, the example below, if I'm not wrong, uh, this was in, in Panama last year. Uh, to take part in IHR events, such as symposiums, seminars, uh, the World Congress. The picture in the right was during the World Congress in The Hack in the Netherlands, 2015. And the YPNs, they had a crucial world, uh, role in the organization of this, of this Congress. Also to benefit from uh, training and mentoring from senior researchers in the association, uh, to get funding for uh, travel uh, run opportunities or um, yeah, for career development and attending IHR congresses. Um, 
Also, uh, there are uh, awards specially devoted to young professionals, like uh, the, the example you saw from Sid. So you already know the guy from the right, uh, Camila is uh, in the center. And these were the two awardees from the JFK Prize last year. The one in the left is uh, Rope Tema, who is the person in charge of organizing this, this prize. Then you have many membership benefits at the same level of a regular member in terms of access to knowledge at lower rates. Uh, so basically, access to, to the IHR journals and associate journals and books, conference proceedings, etc. Uh, also to engage in fundraising efforts to gain support from YPN activities and active, actively participate in the IHR technical committees, which uh, it's uh, actually where the magic happens, no? where the uh, research in the main themes of uh, IHR are being pushed forward. These are a bit the highlights of uh, this year concerning the Young Professional Networks. So um, to push forward the Young Professional Networks, it's also a very important uh, target for IHR. So this year, uh, it was created a task force especially devoted to the purpose. Then new young professional networks were created in Chile, Korea, Peru, also in Italy, in Spain. If I'm not wrong, the ones in Italy and Spain, they were a rearrangement of existing ones. The YPN webinar series were, uh, was launched. There was a couple of months ago, there was a webinar on how to write a good paper, an editor's perspective. This was organized by the YPN in Poland. And uh, the speaker was the chief editor of the Journal of Hydraulic Research, Mohamed Kidawi, who did a very nice talk. Uh, now there is uh, in the pipeline, we're already working on it for another webinar on how to find a good job. It will happen on December or eventually by the beginning of next year. There are the Conversa Conversaciones Fluidas, Fluid Conversations webinars, uh, organized by the YPN in Venezuela, Agua y Café, uh, live broadcast series, from the YPN in Panama. So many events. Uh, the, the Latin American YPNs, by the way, they are very active. And that's why there was the creation of a specific working group for the Latin American YPNs. And of course, la last but not least, this uh, Congress, the first IHR Congress for young professionals. And these are the prospects for the next year. Um, so from this Congress, um, the best abstracts will be selected and the authors will be invited to, um, to write down a full paper and to submit it in the Journal of, of Applied Water Engineering and Research. Then during the next year, there will be also the fifth edition of the Latin American Journal for Young uh, Researchers, the uh, Young Professionals Hydro Environment Challenge Contest, I will talk later what I mean by, by this uh, contest because this is also a new initiative. Uh, the web, of course, the webinar series will continue with this new webinar that I mentioned and other, other more to come. And eventually, a second IHR Congress for young professionals. We still have to decide that. We still have to decide if it will be uh, done in an annual frequency or biannual, like the World Congresses. Uh, but we are uh, willing to learn for, for, from this experience and, uh, and to repeat the experience next year if we can. And of course, many other events are being cooked in the pipeline. So about the, this Young Professional Hydro Environment Challenge. This will happen during May, June of next year. And uh, it's a kind of contest where the participants, they will be grouped in, uh, in teams and they, and they will have to solve a series of um, engineering challenges based on some case studies. These are the four case studies we're working on, on fluvial hydraulics, equi-hydraulics, hydropower, and water supply. As you can see, there are several, uh, a number of industrial partners involved in the initiative. They are helping us to set up these case studies. And, uh, and also they will be helping for the mentoring of these groups. So this will be uh, more than just an academic experience, but also somehow a, a professional experience already. So uh, the registration is already open from today. So you may feel free to have a look at the website. And if you think it's interesting, of course, you can ask further questions, but you can already also register for the event. 
Another uh, important benefit from being an IHR member, also a young professional member, and maybe the, the, the most important benefit is the access to, to journal, free access to the IHR journals, most of them, like the Journal of Hydraulic Research, which is the, um, the flagship journal, or the Journal on Applied Water Engineering and Research, uh, Revista Iberoamerica, specific for Latin America, on Hydraulics, Rural Basin Management, um, and also the Latin American Journal for Young Professionals. Also, uh, you, you would receive the Hydrolink magazine and a uh, reduced fee for the IHR associated journals, which, uh, yeah, there are also a number of journals. And of course, um, access to conference proceedings, books, monographs, white papers, you name it. And all of this for this uh, very great price, no, from spanning from five euros until 22 euros, depending in the country uh, you are and on your status a bit. It's a pity that uh, I'm not uh, 30 year old anymore, I'm above, uh, because as I mentioned, you, you will get the same membership, membership rights as a normal regular member. And a regular member is paying around 90 euros per year. So there's quite a huge difference. Uh, so if uh, you feel interested and uh, you feel curious and you want to ask more questions, you can contact Sally Feng, uh, which is the IHR membership officer. And, uh, and also keep in mind that you can always contact a, an existing young professional network if there is one in your country. And if there is none, as uh, Sid mentioned before, you can also set up your own young professional network in your country. So uh, um, don't feel afraid for that. Just ask and you will see that there are not so many uh, obstacles that you need to face in order to set up such kind of young professional network. Okay, maybe uh, I can give also some uh, figures uh, concerning the current uh, um, Congress. So we got 140 abstract submissions. And uh, in this map, you can see the distribution of, of the authors. So totally uh, spread worldwide. These are the real stars of this Congress, no? because they will, uh, during these two days, they will be sharing their work with us. Then uh, this Congress would have not been possible without the help of the International Scientific Committee. We had uh, 50 members helping us uh, in reviewing the papers, and also they will be helping in sharing the sessions. And uh, when I did these numbers, it was a couple of days ago, we had 643 attendees. Uh, we checked this morning and they were already above 800. So we expect during these two days to have quite a number of, of attendees, authors, and of course, uh, International uh, Scientific Committee members connecting in these uh, webinar rooms. These are quite uh, quite uh, great numbers, considering that this Congress is for young professionals and by young professionals. When you were registering, you had to answer a couple of questions. One of the questions was uh, about the membership. If you are or you aren't an IHR member, and if you are associated with a YPN Young Professional Network. So around the 70% of the attendees, uh, they are not uh, IHR members yet, uh, but this is an open uh, event. So we are, uh, we are grateful and we're very happy to, to have this number. Uh, then the, around the 30%, they are IHR members. And from this 30%, most of them, they are associated to a young professional network, which is also good news because that's, that's our target to, um, to organize this event for young professionals, either members or not, or not members. Also, you have to, uh, to answer a question concerning the, the themes of your interest. Uh, so in this plot, in the x-axis, we have all the main IHR teams, basically the technical committees and working groups. And in the y-axis, the level of interest uh, to these teams. And distinguishing both non-members and members in red and in yellow. So not surprisingly, the, the most trendy topics, uh, maybe they are the, the ones related with global concerns like climate change adaptation or uh, water resources management, but also the traditional uh, classic IHR teams like fluid mechanics, experimental methods, and also eventually, not surprisingly, the non-members, they have 
a bit slightly higher interest for these global concerns. And the IHR members, they have a slightly higher interest for the, um, for the classic teams. But the message I would like to give in this plot is that we are uh, quite correlated. The two groups, the non-members and the members, they have they share very similar uh, interest. So uh, this is also, why not, a strong argument for the non-members to, uh, to join IHR, and especially from IHR members to welcome uh, new members. And maybe now we can move to the, to the program. Of course, the, the plot that I showed previously was uh, a good tool to define the program. We tried to align as much as we could the program to the research interest of the attendees. Uh, in a few minutes, we will move to the uh, two first technical sessions on hydroinformatics and fluvial hydraulics. Uh, then there are sessions in parallel. Uh, then we'll have climate change adaptation, urban drainage, and water resources management and global water security, which will be a plenary session. By the end of the day, we'll have a keynote from Angelos Findikakis talking about the role of IHR uh, in, the in the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So maybe now, um, as it's almost time to go to the um, to the sessions, I can show you, I can guide you how to how to move to the webinar rules rooms. So if you go to the Congress website and you scroll down, you will see that here there are the main links. So, of course, registration already, you still can register, of course, but for you attendees, it's already over. Then the general program and the detailed program for the first day and for the second day. So you, can, you have access to the main rooms here, but maybe the easier way, if you want to check a bit what's the program today and decide at this moment, what's your, uh, um, your room of higher interest, your session of higher interest, just, you just click on the current day, 17th of November. So we are now in this session. Sorry, I cannot see my screen anymore. Oh, yeah. OK. And uh, then here you have the detailed program. So uh, minute by minute, by minute, presentation by presentation, who will be presenting the, the main uh, topic of the session. And uh, below the title, you have the room. So you just click on this link, and you will be addressed directly to the webinar room where this uh, session will be held. So this is for the next session on hydroinformatics. And in parallel, you will also have the session on fluvial hydraulics, which is in room two. Room two for fluvial hydraulics and room one for hydroinformatics. So now you can uh, feel free. Maybe you have uh, uh, two minutes to grab a coffee. Why not? And uh, to move to these rooms. So I hope you enjoy the opening. but. Especially, I hope you will enjoy the, the technical sessions. So today and tomorrow. Have fun and enjoy. See you in the, in the webinar rooms. Bye bye.
So I assume we can start to talk. Of course, we have to wait at least for Eva. And to see, uh, okay, then I stop to talk. So welcome, Frank. Um, do we have the participants already here? Um, otherwise we will need to invite them in to talk. So, um, I would probably... Eva, hello. Yeah. Hello. Hello, Ibrahim and Frank. Let me help you to find the participants, okay? And I will... Make that would be fantastic. Yeah, I'll be doing that. Okay, the first two have been added. I will continue. You would, if you wish to start, they should all be following the session eh? while I upgrade them to panelists. Yes, that's wonderful. So welcome everyone to this session on hydroinformatics. So um, we have two of the people who actually are senior members of IHR who are going to chair this session and also help with the discussion and analysis of the papers later on. So I would like to invite Frank Malkinson to uh, chair this session. So welcome everybody to the session on hydroinformatics. I don't know what I have to do, but I'm just starting. So I think we are two chairs in the session. One is Ibrahim from Iowa. The other one is Frank from Cottbus, Berlin. We are both members of the Hydroinformatics Committee of the IHR. So uh, I myself, I'm coming, let's say, from Hydroinformatics 25 years ago, starting with uh, computational hydraulics, numerical schemes, and doing in the last 25 years a lot of, let's say, new things. Uh, where hydroinformatics is developing to, let's say, new areas, not only artificial neural networks and artificial intelligence methods, but a lot of other nice things like web-based collaborative engineering and so on. Um, so I'm happy to chair the session today and maybe Ibrahim is also give short uh, talk about him. And then I think we start with Alejandra with the poster session. So maybe Ibrahim, you would like to add some words about the hydroinformatics or two minutes or whatever. Sure, sure. Thank, thank you, Frank. So uh, I'd like to yeah, welcome everybody joining our session. So my name is Ibrahim Demir. I am a professor at the University of Iowa. As, as Frank said, I'm also working on hydroinformatics for the last maybe roughly 20 years, mostly working on soft computing, information systems, scientific visualization, communication, and intelligent environments. So we both serve with Frank at the IHR Joint Committee on Hydroinformatics, where we uh, organize a biennial uh, conference as well as manage the hydroinformatics uh, journal. And we, we uh, work uh, on topics around information and communication technologies in, in hydrology and water resources. And we welcome you all to our uh, committee and learn about our activities and join our conference and maybe participate in scholarly activities with our uh, journal. Thank you, Frank. Okay, so we have in totally today nine poster presentations, if I count it correctly. Okay, the first one is already shared. Uh, so the time is roughly three to five minutes. Yeah, and to keep the time, I think, so that everybody has a chance to present the poster. And afterwards, we have half an hour session for free discussion. 
uh, depending on your question. So if you have a question, put it in the Q&A box. And at the end, when all the nine posters has been introduced by the uh, colleagues, then we can have a general discussion about the posters as well as all other topics about hydroinformatics. So not to waste time, I think I will give over the floor to Adajandra. She is presenting her poster. So I will switch up my microphone and Adajandra might switch. Good morning, my name is Alejandra Tenzaira. Today I will introduce you my paper title, Analysis of Organization in the Use Land Cover Change an impact on land surface temperature with Landsat, MODIS, and Area 5 imagery. More than 60% of Bolivian population lives in urban areas. Urbanization pressure replaced natural vegetation to artificial, to artificial surface inducing urban heat island, which affects environmental condition and human comfort. Land surface temperature and vegetation, vegetation indexes are widely used to study this phenomenon based on remote sensing. Therefore, this research uses Google Earth Engine to demonstrate a multi-temporal correlation between land cover change and land surface temperature in the three most important cities of Bolivia using um, NDVI and EVI indexes methods. The study area is in La Paz, Cochabamba, and Santa Cruz cities during the years 2001 to 2018. We use Google Earth Engine online platform to process the data. The land surface temperature computed using, was computed using the stat, statistical mono window algorithm using Landsat series and other satellites that help us to calibrate the algorithm. Then we perform NDVI and AV using Landsat and MODIS. Finally, for air temperature, we use ERA-5 satellite. Uh, we can say that MODIS and ERA-5 has an advantage to be ready to use the data selecting a specific data. Um, to analyze the data, we execute a linear, linear regression for each, for each city. Results, the increase of land surface temperature per year in La Paz, Cochabamba, and Santa Cruz are 0 0.15, 0 0.5, 11 and 0 0.17 degrees, respectively. For air temperature, on the other hand, uh, in La Paz and, and Cochabamba, we compute 0 0.04 uh, degrees per year, and in Santa Cruz, 0 0.03 degrees per year. NDVI and EVI indices uh, were classified according to a scale, where La Paz presented in average 0 0.12 which mean uh, bar, bar vegetation or barren rocks. Santa Cruz in Avalanche had a 0 0.32 and Cochabamba with 0 0.21, which represents shrubs and grassland. The results show an increase of uh, Landsat surface temperature and air temperature where there is an when there is a decrease in NDVI and EVI indices in most of the years. Each city has different results such may have occurred due to diverse geographic locations and environmental conditions. La Paz has the lowest vegetation coverage due to is located in a plateau region with an altitude of 3,600 meters above the sea. Instead, Santa Cruz, that is a tropical region with 400 meters above the sea. Conclusion. It is observed that land surface temperature has an increase of the, over the years on the metropolitan areas. Four indicators uh, were considered in order to better understand the relationship between land surface temperature and land cover in terms of vegetation abundance. Assessment of land surface temperature provides important information for surface energy, land cover change, and modification for climate. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot for the presentation and keeping time excellent. So the idea, if I understand correctly, is that we move directly to the next poster. So all those who have maybe questions, you can put them already in the Q&A box 
or maybe in the chat so that at the end of the session of the poster session in this coffee break discussion round we can go back to all the questions so the next one is uh, nicolas yeah he is already there so i think if i uh, will yeah. change the poster and ah the poster is already there so i think you can then start hi uh, can you hear me fine Yes, sound is excellent. Yes. Okay, thank you. And you are seeing my post. Thank you. So, uh, well, my name is Nicolas Zucker and I'm going to present you this work that is entitled Improving Rainfall Fields in Data Scale Basins, a comparison of band scaling, interpolation, and merging schemes. Uh, well, we all know that the reduction of precipitation measurements around the world has increased the uncertainty in rainfall fields. And that to tackle this problem, there are several alternative data sources to help to improve the rainfall fields. For example, in remote sensed precipitation measurements, a atmospheric reanalysis estimates, but there are also other in environmental variables that can help to improve that estimation. For example, vegetation index. So we perform in our work in a basin in Colombia, here is on the map of South American Colombia, that is called the Sogamoso River Basin. And we choose that um, uh, basin because it has a lot of rain gauges and that allowed us to perform several experiments uh, creating different uh, rain gauge networks in different densities of rain gauge networks. Those rain gauges that were not selected for perform the interpolations or the margins were used to uh, perform an independent valuation. So which methodologies we used? Uh, we performed first a downscaling of the multi-source weighted ensemble precipitation, that is a global precipitation product of 25 kilometer resolution, and the enhanced vegetation index acquired by the MODIS uh, instrument in both Terra and Aqua satellites from NASA. We relate that uh, those sources of information using a linear regression to a downscale from the 25 kilometer resolution to find a, a one kilometer precipitation area. That was one of the methodologies. The second one was a merging between the AIMS web and the rain gauges in the basin. Uh, the method was called double smoothing and it's really simple, it's just an interpolation of the point difference between the rain gauges estimates and the uh, satellite precipitation that is the m -square. And as a benchmark, we use uh, two classical interpolation methods, uh, the IDW and a regression treatment. And to evaluate uh, the performance on, of all the methods that we use, we perform an across validation and an independent validation. So what we found? In, the, in this first figure, you can see uh, the error in the y-axis of the methods, and in the x-axis, you can see the densities of rain gauges uh, that we use to compare or to perform the interpolations or margins. You can see here first that the original M's with uh, performance is, has an error of around 10 millimeters, and that a uh, simple bilinear downscaling of that M's web original data reduces a little bit the error. However, the downscaling using the uh, vegetation index further reduce the error. However, is still a bit high of around nine millimeters of error, as you can see here. When we compare that lowest error of the downscalings to the errors of the interpolation methods, we can see that the interpolations have a, an error, a lower error than the downscaling methods. For example, here you can see in blue the regression treatment uh, error. However, we would like to highlight that the error of the interpolation methods tend to increase when you reduce the densities of the rain gauges. And that the lowest error was found, uh, was found with the uh, double smooth emerging algorithm, emerging between the m swap and the rain gauges. So the conclusions of our study were that obviously the lowest error was found with the uh, merging of the m swap and the rain gauges, both in high and low densities of rain gauges. That uh, 
downscaling using the vegetation indexes reduces the error of the ends web more than a simple bilinear downscaling and that we can improve that downscaling and the emergence using, for example, first a moving window downscaling, not just a simple uh, linear correlation or a linear regression. Use a moving downscaling can further improve the downscaling and also using other physiographic variables can improve that error. For example, the elevation, the slope, or other physiographical variables, and also uh, merge that uh, downscaling with the rain gauges. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks a lot for the presentation. Uh, again, maybe for everyone joining us in the session, please really use the chat and the Q&A uh, opportunity to put during the presentation, maybe some remarks, some questions or comments, which we can discuss later with the presenters. Okay, uh, thanks also for keeping the time, that's fine. So we can move directly to the next one, which is Maria. Is she in the present? Yeah, no. Okay, the presentation is there, that's good. We just, uh, I'm not sure whether Eva has Maria in the panel. Yes, I'm here. Uh, ah, okay, great, I see you. Okay, so then I will switch off my microphone and give you the floor. Sure. Thank you. Good afternoon to all the young professionals attending this, this session. This study started last year as part of an investigation project and was developed by students, seven semester students, with the goal to uh, integrate education, science, and participation. Uh, the, this study describes the initial efforts of building a citizen science-based monitoring river system for flood for forecasting in the Rima River. This is an important river in Lima, Peru, a city that is severely affected by floods and mudslides, especially during the El Nino years. Throughout the years, these situations continue to endanger the cities that are settled in the Rimac riverbanks and its tributary and its tributary streams. However, the available hydrometeorological information is not enough or is insufficient to build any kind of um, early warning system to to pro to protect the population. Within this context, the study focuses on a system that will be based on videos recorded of the Rimac River taken by regular citizens with their cell phones when the water level begins to rise. The videos will be processed to obtain useful results to alert the population in case of flooding. To validate this system, three videos were recorded in bridges along the, along the Rimac River. Then they were processed using large-scale particle image velocimetry, LS, LSPIV, to, to obtain the, these corresponding flow rates. The bridges were chosen taking some parameters into consideration. For example, the distance from the bridge to a city of importance, the curvature of the river, the flatness of the surface, or the, the accessibility to it. The selected bridges, as well as the hydrometric stations managed by the National Water Authority, ANA, by its uh, acronym in Spanish, are shown in, in figure one. Uh, the videos, had to be recorded for a minimum of one minute, and they had to show four control points during the entire length of the video. As you can see in, in figure two, the control points. Um, also, this, um, this, the location of each control point as well as the distance between each of them had to be known in order to process the video. As you can see in figure two B, we thrown uh, sawdust particles on the surface as an artificial tracer in order to um, engage the video uh, accuracy processing. Then the videos were processed using large scale particle image velocimetry, LSPIV to extract the river mean velocity. This works by comparing pairs of images and contrasting the displacement of the current between, between them. Uh, the river program, then the river RIVER, uh, calculates the speed vectors along the selected area to then obtain the discharge velocity. 
uh, the river program was developed by Antoine uh, Badalano and uh, and it was taught last year to some uh, to some students that had the opportunity to spend an internship in the National University of Cordoba in in Argentina. In Figure three, you can identify the cross section as well. Uh, sorry, the delimited area or the area of interest, as well as the cross section design in orange. And 3B, you can observe the, uh, the speed or the velocities in the surface. In table A, uh, the application of a velocity index of 0 0.85 was used to convert free surface velocity into mean velocity. This is a coefficient used for natural channels commonly. In table one, uh, you can see the results that the hydrometric value for San Mateo 1 and San Mateo 2 is the same because they were located nearby. And in table two, both absolute and relative errors were, cal were calculated. Um, the result obtained for San Mateo 1 with artificial tracers is the one that gets closer to its official value. Uh, in order to define if the LSPIB processing underestimates or overestimates the, the official values, more videos should be processed. Based on our results, uh, we conclude that this system is accessible and that it's practical and can be scaled to obtain more validation, to extend the database, and to be so much bigger and integrated. As future research plans, a hydrodynamic model in HECRAS will be developed to predict flood propagation along the river network and estimate the most affected sections. Furthermore, the final aim is also to develop a, an automatic processing of the videos to maintain an active response to the population needs. Before, before ending, it's important to, to remember that as this system is based on citizen participation, it is important that all the citizens are aware and are informed about their role on prevention. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks a lot for the presentation and the poster. And I think we get just straight forward to the poster number four, which is from, maybe the pronunciation is wrong, Junqi or Junqi. So that's my problem, but I know at least something about Bavaria, that's a good news. Uh, yeah, okay. Okay. So, <laughs> greetings to Munich. And if Eva is able to share your poster, we can okay. start. Uh, okay. I, I hope this uh, screen share is fine. Yeah, here it comes. Okay. okay. Um, good evening, I'm Junki Mao, um, a master's student at Technical University of Munich. And currently, actually, I'm in Chengdu. So um, the presentation for my poster is uh, related to flash flood hazard mapping. Uh, and uh, it is based on GIST and the multi-criteria decision making, uh, especially for the natural condition. And for the former German flash flood hazard map, and instead of just uh, using the inundation map for flash flood hazard analysis, uh, I attempt to, um, con to con con consider several indicators. So I'll just um, make the figure one larger. And figure one shows the basic process of what I did in, in, in this project. So for, for the hard map, I, I would like to draw, uh, I used uh, four indicators, land use, flow occupation, slope, and uh, soil type um, for consideration. And for each indicator, um, I, um, I made several layers to, uh, to illustrate one indicator um, and uh, to collect uh, each indicator to flood hazard. I used uh, uh, the real records from 10 flash flood events in 10 different catchment in Bavaria. And so to um, collect uh, um, how many flash flood points in, in each layers. And uh, the effective points I define is the inundation diffs over 0 
25 um, meters. Mm, so to, to make some statistical uh, analysis, then I used uh, 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 um, and the frequency ratio as the value for each layer. So um, each layer has its own frequency ratio value for the and flash flat points. And, and then um, by the weighting analysis, uh, uh, each, um, each point in the study catchment can, can has its own flash flat hazard values. And thus, an, a map for flash flat hazard can be drawn. And uh, I used the uh, Jinx nature bricks to uh, classify the hazard level from very low to very high as five uh, levels. And the, the, the result could be look like um, this for the raw hard map with a classification and uh, uh, the um, mature products with classification and, and, and the 10 catchments just uh, distribute in, in, in from, south to, from south to north in Bavaria and uh, they also stand for uh, the um, plains, hills, and uh, mountainous regions. Um, and and uh, the feature for the products is like um, for uh, mapping a catchment scale, uh, the geographical feature is very uh, obvious. But for the holistic Bavaria, only some general information over a uh, highlight can be seen. And apart from the products, and uh, some validations will also be made. And for instance, and uh, to some validation to test uh, if uh, the majority of uh, real hazard blood records just uh, distributed in the regions belong to hazard level high or very high, and uh, the result like uh, more than eighty percent of staying water records. Um, that that was if effective inundation depths are included in high hazard and very high hazard regions. Uh, uh, and uh, other indicators also um, lead, lead to some similar results. So in general, the classification is valid. Thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot for the presentation. And again, keeping the time, that's easy for me as a chair, so I have not to interrupt someone. Uh, we have already a first nice question. A second one was already answered. Please, again, do not hesitate to put in the Q&A already some questions for the coffee break. Uh, we will go now to the poster number five presented by Leonardo. So I think if we're, if I in between is looking for Nicole. So if Nicole is in the session, so maybe you give in the chat a hint to Eva. So in between, I think Eva is fighting to find the presentation from Leonardo. Or Leonardo is doing it. Okay, here it is. So I will give the floor to Leonardo. Hi. Uh, this is investigation is part of my thesis. I'm Leonardo Gutierrez. The title is Climatological Analysis for the Agroecological Zoning of the Peach Tree in San Pablo de Pillao, Huánuco. The abstract. Planning in the, distribu in the distribution of crops in rural areas through the agroecological zoning has become a useful tool for precision agriculture and sustainable development. With this purpose, in the district of San Pablo de Pillao, with, our, with an area of, of five, five, nine, five, nine thousand uh, uh, hectares and located in the center of the department of Huanuco in Peru, the optimal areas for the cultivation of peach trees were determined a crop with a stable value in the market and highest profitability in Huanuco. To do this method of the analytical, analytical process hier, hier, hierarchical was applied, which is usually, usually used in multi criteria analysis for the determination of areas of the site according to the level of aptitude for the agroecological de de development of a certain plant. 
the methods. This the studio area located in the Andean region region of, of Peru. Um, this is the picture, and the the information on weather stations from the Pisco product of Tsunami, Peru, was used product of precipitation 1990 to 2020. Uh, temperature from 1987 to 2016. The mountain information was extracted to, for the study area and interpolated with the geostatistical, geostatistical techniques of IDW for temperature and ordinary creeping for precipitation. Then, with this information averaged for the study area, the analysis of this monthly and annual time series was made with box plots, isograms. In addition, a trend analysis was performed with the non-parametric McKendall test on the annual data. Finally, for the analysis of droughts, the SPI standardized precipitation index at monthly scales of three, six, and nine months. The aptitude levels for the P3 are defined in this table. For, for this level's aptitude. And the results in this picture, I present the, the time series of precipitation and temperature time series. For the SP, SPI index, this is the variability in, in for the three, six, and two month scales and uh, the, pro the probability of occurrence for the drought extreme is 1.7 1 for six months. And the conclusion, the multi-annual climatic variability shows a trend with significant, significant to increase the annual average precipitation at a rate of 90.6 millimeter per year, which favors in the page three. Moreover, show a trend significant to increasing to the average temperature at the rate of, of this value is centigrade per, per year, which would not significantly affect the page three since it has a wide range uh, of ad adaptation to the variability of maximum and minimum temperatures. While the probability of occurrence of extreme droughts in the study area is le less than 4%. Therefore, it does not uh, represent a danger for the agricultural development of the peace tree. This is all, that's us all, thanks. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I think we move to the next one. We stay in South America, but going to Argentina, uh, Mayra, Mayra, sorry, uh, will do the next presentation. So he was changing the poster. We have already are uh, in the Q and A questions. One question is about will these poster be available to view after the presentations? So I think, I hope that we can, of course, having them for the discussion. And I uh, expect that they are also available for everyone. But I think this is a question which we have to give to the uh, organiza organization uh, committee how to, the posters will be published or how they will be accessible. Okay, so we can go for the next poster. It's now the floor of Myra. Okay, thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Myra. Thank you for listening. 
this work aims to describe the implementation of two-dimensional modeling carried out to evaluate the impact of anthropic interventions in the Paraná Delta in Argentina, uh, carried out in the context of the development uh, of planning kit of, uh, for the integral management of the Delta. The Paraná Delta is considered a unique and vast mosaic of wetlands of international importance, cover more than 70,000 square kilometers, and its characteristic, characteristic include the rich biodiversity and valuable uh, range of ecosystem good uh, and service provided by the, uh, the wetlands of the Delta. The proximity to the highly urbanized and industrial corridor of Buenos Aires province, the extensive uh, modifications of the natural system and the lower delta, and a slowly decreasing uh, populations living uh, in the delta. The model was uh, implemented in the Delta 3D, 3D uh, flexible mesh in collaboration between INA and Deltares. Uh, it was implemented for the flexible mesh incorporating the topography and railway and road structures. Uh, the domain includes uh, the model and from the delta, the digital terrain model and boundaries conditional indicated in picture one were provided by INA and software training and technical support by Deltares. Uh, the coefficient value used was 0 0.015 for rivers and 0 0.1 in alluvial plains, according to the literature. The um, upstream boundaries conditional used uh, in the Paraná River by the Arroyo Seco City were according to the um, one model developed uh, in INA, and variable levels were included in the downstream boundary in front of the delta. Uh, a flexible mesh was developed uh, in defined domain with quadrilateral cells and triangular cells. To validate the model, water surface elevation observed along the Paraná River and the different hydrological conditions were reproduced. It was verified uh, that the simulation returned elevations within the expected levels. For this purpose, uh, the observation stations were defined as scales of, of uh, Villa Constitución, Ramacho, San Pedro, Ibiqui, Zarate, Campana, and Canal Nuevo. Can you see that in picture two and three? To evaluate the most critical hydrological condition, the historical flood for the Paraná River was defined uh, as the base scenario. Um, two temporary conditions were proposed and four situations of anthropic variations to the environment according to the base scenario. The hydrological change uh, was a current scenario and 15 years uh, climatic change scenario. Uh, the anthropic variations was um, new road tra uh, trails, uh, open dike and polders. Can you see that in picture three? The results of the simulations express that all the scenarios that represent anthropic modifications rise the what level um, uh, somehow compared to the simulation without um, interventions. It, the simulations, the highest effect on the levels are visualized with, the, with dikes and a combination of interventions. As uh, for the minimum impact, it, occur, it, it occurred for the intervention of uh, the new Apple Mini International Connection. You can see that uh, um, in picture four. The implementation of a two-dimensional hydrodynamic model in the 3D flexible mesh is an optimal tool to assess fluid uh, impact and tropic interventions. Before finishing, I want to thank the great te technical and human team, the El Programa Hidráulica Computacional uh, of the Instituto Nacional del Agua, especially to Martin Zavarot and Pablo Garcia. They made this a reality. And to Delta is in depth, especially to Anke Becker, it uh, was a pleasure to work with her, and Andrea Fonseca, Begonia Rellano, and William Olimans for making my stay in Netherlands happier. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation and the nice poster. Um, maybe Daniel is already preparing himself now for the next presentation because we just get informed that the next poster the original plant next poster by Nicole will be not presented. I think she has other duties to do in this time. 
So we might move then to Daniel, who, of course, to give him maybe one minute more time to prepare because it's just uh, not what he might be aware of. Uh, and I think then we have also a little bit more time at the end for the discussion, which might be also helpful. So uh, Daniel, are you ready in principle for starting just now, a little bit earlier than expected? Okay, I'm ready. Okay, so then we need, okay, it's fine, it's coming. So then I will switch off my microphone and give you the floor. Okay, just start. So Daniel, are you available? You have, I think you have switched off the microphone. So your microphone at the moment is off. Okay. Yeah, now it's there, okay. So just start. Okay. Um, so you see the screen and you can explain your poster to us? Yeah, okay. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Daniel Rios from Colombia and today will expose, uh, expose you our work titled PhD platform to support the teaching of fluid mechanics during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so in this research work, uh, we present the result obtained to use the platform to teach of fluid mechanics in the Cooperative University of Columbia because the practice uh, became a big problem due to the agglomeration in reduced space. And um, we're looking for a didactic solution um, to replace the practice of energy loss due to friction on pies. And finding the PhD interactive simulation project, uh, the which is development by University of Colorado and Boulder. And um, for the practice laboratories, uh, 10 discharge were selected in the range between 1,000 and 10,000 liters per second. Later, uh, the velocity of flow was calculated. Um, the relationship between velocity and energy loss was constructed uh, for the students for different uh, materials. Um, the finding, the most important finding is the connection development between the students and the planter due to the confident condition. In general, uh, the use of PhD planter was like to gain and improve the mood of the students. Therefore, we conclude that the PhD planter is excellent tool for teaching of fluid mechanics during the COVID-19 pandemic and for the time post-pandemic, if the student has a good computer equipment. Uh, we thanks to University of Colorado and Boulder for sharing PhD interactive simulation platform to academic community. And we thanks uh, also of students of Cooperative University of Columbia for your interest and efforts in the laboratory practice. Thank you so much. Thanks for the presentation. Short, but I think the key message might be come over. Um, I might have later one question at least. Okay, but I think last but not least, we can go to the poster number nine, which will be presented by Alexandra. Um, and just checking. This is Daniel. Okay, we need. Okay, Alexander. thank you so much. Yeah, we will. We will. Uh, let's say we will first do all the posters, and we go then uh, for the discussion. So, if somebody else has question, of course, still use the Q and A opportunity. 
So we are looking now for Alexandra. Hi, I'm here. Okay, so now we need your, uh, I think Eva is now sharing the screen and give you the control. Yeah, that's working and getting your poster. Okay, so. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today. Uh, my name is Alexandra. I'm from Russian State Agrarian University. My scientific leader is Professor Vitaly Ilyinich. Uh, I think we, we got lost by the poster. It's, it was yeah, a German operation system. So maybe Eva can help to give us a poster back. Okay, here it comes back. Okay, yeah, okay, that's, it's, okay. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, fine, great. The theme of my presentation is assessment of maximum storm precipitation changes over last decade. The impact of climate change on annual temperature or precipitation can receive a great deal of attention around the world. Many studies have been conducted to illustrate that these changes are becoming evident on a global scale. This study focuses on detecting trends in annual precipitation change in different regions of European territory of Russia. The purpose of my research is to analyze the possible criteria for assessment of storm precipitation change in different geographical zones of Russia. We have used data from different stations in various natural zones the foothills of the mountain, the forest zone, and the steppe zone. Chronological changes in the maximum general precipitation are shown in Figure 1. Here we can see a positive trend of chronological changes at all stations. The obtained graphs are not sufficient for a full assessment, so we have used Mankendall's numerical criteria for estimation of storm precipitation trends. These estimations were made for three time windows. First time period is from 1940 to 2017, second one from 1950 to 2017, and the last one is from 1960 to 2017. All obtained values were positive and greater than 100. It means that all observations have a positive trend. It is necessary to note that the values of man candle tests are very significant. We believe that there is a clear positive test. Even such value is located within 10 to 20. The next criterion we have used takes into account the quantiles of maximum daily precipitation. We have separated our data from two, two equal time series. First time period is from 1940 to 1980. And the second time period is from 1960 to 2017. The results are represented in figure 2. The figure shows that the values of the second series are higher than the ones on the first. It means that there is an increase in precipitation in last year. Also, we have to note that almost all quantiles of maximum daily precipitation during the last several decades are above the quantiles of previous decade. The difference is more significant for smaller probabilities. Finally, we can say that all the considered criteria relate each other. So we can conclude that there is an increase in maximum daily storm precipitation during last decade. Thank you all for listening. Thanks a lot for the presentation and keeping the time excellently. So we are now, I think, finished with all the eight posters to present it today. Uh, we have, I think, still time until half past two Europe Central European time before the next session will start. I think the topic was something, just checking quickly. Uh, so if you stay in the room, it's flu. No, okay, forget it, it's climate change adaptation. Okay, so we have now, let's say, at least half an hour time for discussion of the posters uh, and exchange of ideas and general things. So maybe I make a short comments from my side. Uh, when I had a view to this eight, nine posters, uh, it was interesting to see that I think there is a clear, I'm not say trend, but similar trend as we can observe in higher informatics. So, 
A lot of things we're dealing with remote sensing, GIS, spatial data, especially mass data, and doing data analysis, whether it's more rainfall data or other data. There was climate change included. There was also teaching included. So how to use the modern ICT to teach students to understand all the different things, to integrate our numerical simulation and simulation results to planning, flood maps, and all such kind of things. So I think these are trends we observed also in the hydroinformatics disciplines in the last 10 years. So I was not really surprised, but it's already, let's say, showing that this might be really topics uh, which are, let's say, state of the art in research or still research questions. Uh, when I, let's say, was starting with hydroinformatics, we were fighting more with coding of numerical tools. So this time, I would not say it's over, but uh, I think has been going to this new trends. Um, just a personal comment maybe from my side is that when I'm discussing this with our students at my university, we have an international course programs on hydroinformatics. What I observed is that students are easy to handle all these nice tools, GIS, uh, two-dimensional uh, flood modeling tools, HECRAS 2D or MIC21 or whatever the names are. Uh, but sometimes they are not really knowing what's behind this. So I think this is a challenge for your generation, not only able to understand the basic theoretical parts of the numerical simulation, you have also to understand all this data analysis methods you are doing. You have to fight with the mass data coming from remote sensing, from the simulation tools, from the measurements and the fields. So I think this is really a big challenge. So and I hope that you can, let's say, go in this direction in a successful way in your PhD, in your master program, uh, and later on research. Um, this was just a general comment. Maybe just to the posters, two, three sentences. So what I observed is a typical effect of different styles of posters. So we have uh, some posters which have a lot of nice figures, workflow, and were more graphical oriented or graphical dominated. We have some posters which were more textual, uh, let's say, dominated, and some in a mixture out, out of it. So what is a bit, little problem is normally that we have when you are presenting posters, indeed, we have the interaction with the auditorium. So when you explain your poster with people two, three meter distance to you in front of the posters, you have the action. So I think it was a really big challenge for you to present us poster without the interaction from the auditorium. And maybe we can also discuss at the end, uh, or in the discussion, uh, how to present posters, but also how to present posters in this virtual environment. I think we as a lecturer are changing our lectures for online teaching. You as in maybe lectures of tomorrow, or even let's say uh, supervised students at the moment, have also to change the style. So that might be also something we can discuss in the, um, yeah, discussion just now. So I'm not sure whether Ibrahim would like to give also some comments or we should just open the floor for everyone. It's the first time that we are doing it. So there's no experience about this. Yeah, I just give maybe a couple of minutes, uh, just a summary as well. So I, I agree that we are seeing a more and more trends toward uh, data science and, and when we think about the, the traditional uh, hydroinformatics, we, we were and seeing a lot of uh, traditional modeling, physical modeling. Still it continues, this is critical part of the science, but we are seeing more uh, trends towards working on data science tools, data analytics, and all these online platforms like Google Earth Engine and many others provide us lots of capabilities on analyzing and, and visualizing large scale data set. Uh, as, as Frank said, we are seeing more on GIS tools, and especially as the web uh, systems getting more powerful. We can handle large scale data analysis, visualization capabilities directly on the web, even on the client side systems. Uh, the remote sensing, we are collecting more and more data every day. Probably petabytes of data we collect every year through remote sensing, through satellites, radars, and ground-based sensors. I think there are lots of capabilities we can do with web-based online environments, as well as uh, remote sensing and GIS. So definitely we can explore more towards this. And I see a couple of presentations around the citizen science. We are using the power of the user so we can collect, we can use the, the community to collect more data, to analyze data, 
and, and label data. So we can definitely use the power of communities. Citizen science is, is growing as well for collecting water quality samples and many other activities can be done through uh, citizen, citizen science as well. So I think we will have a good uh, set of presentations today. And, and as Frank said, uh, we have to uh, think about uh, the, the platform that we are presenting. The definitely a poster presentations is common in on virtual sessions, but definitely it should be easily readable on a single screen, or you have to uh, zoom in and, and move around on the, the large scale uh, information. Lots of text will be harder to, to read. Even the graphics uh, require close up view to understand the labels and all the, the axes and everything. So I think uh, we, we have some work to do on and how to present on different platforms. Uh, and also how to prepare uh, presentations that are understandable directly by the, the reader without any extra information, but also uh, visible through different uh, mediums. I think we have, uh, like, yeah, as, as Frank said, we have like 30 minutes to go over some questions on the chat box, on the Q&A, and we can directly interact with the presenters as well, yeah. So we have still 97 participants in the, let's say, channel. So, which is a really large auditorium for such kind of virtual meeting. Um, so, I think we start already with some questions and answers. So, uh, okay, one poster from Nicholas was was at least good uh, evaluated by one. Uh, so, this is done. So, will be the posters available to view after the presentations? I hope yes, but maybe uh, this will be yes, and the poster will be shared and published on the website. So, from Elsa, we got already the reply that we get all the posters uh, available. And I think the other question was already answered. Yes, and there is only one open question from uh, Dina to Maria, but I think this is also maybe a de detailed question. So if uh, every, anyone from the 96 participants would, would like to give a comment or putting a question, please feel free. Uh, from the, those who have presented the poster, I think you can also open maybe the uh, microphone if you want to put a question there. Uh, those who have presented the poster, what I can offer at least is because I don't want to discuss every individual poster now and to, to start to say here's a check, uh, character number 26 and line number 24 can be, be more bold. So if those who presented the poster want to get an let's say a personal evaluation from me and maybe from Ibrahim, uh, just let us know and then we can make a private session, let's say, and to discuss the details of your poster from our personal point of view, which is of course a very personal point of view, but maybe it's helpful. So those for who have did the poster presentation, if you like, contact us and we can do it afterwards. But I think uh, the general discussion should not go in the details of any poster. So did somebody has comments, remarks, general things? Should we get an answer for the open question? It was asked for the uh, Maria's presentation. So there's an open question. That yeah, this is okay, but uh, yeah, yeah. maybe yeah. Maria I, should then answer, sorry. I was typing, but I can say it maybe uh, out loud if you prefer. Sure, yeah. Uh, yeah, please go ahead and answer, Maria, because it's us directly asked to your question, to your presentation, yeah. So yeah okay. I think you can uh, click on la answer live if you like. Okay, um, where is the answer? Yeah, okay. Uh, okay. So the main goal, I think, is to obtain the information and to validate it with these challenging situations, like for example, the supercritical flows, so that the correction can be applied having that situation in mind. Um, let's see if we know kind of what is the, the error applied um, by the processing, then this factor can be applied to all of the videos that are that are kind of, of processed. Uh, in floods, uh, we know that it's dangerous to make any kind of, of measurements for the for the equipment, for the personnel. So this is kind of an option to obtain information that is not available and that it's not going to be available in any kind of intrusive uh, way. So 
that can be my answer. All right, I think, thank you. So I think for those of you who cannot see the, the question, maybe we can repeat the question also uh, for others to see your uh, answer. Uh, yes, uh, so the question was, sorry, uh, LSPIB is challenging to use with supercritical flows as in case of flux. How can you overcome this with citizen science obtained data? And also, well, um, if it helps uh, as part of the of the of the project, it's an idea that when this happens in in dangerous situations, uh, the citizens um, in the mapped areas that are dangerous are supposed to be also kind of trained um, for how are the measurements how the videos need to be recorded, what points need to be demarked, and also to train firefighters or personnel, uh, medical personnel that is in the area to also collaborate with this database. Thank yeah. you. So maybe one relevant question for Maria, since we are discussing the citizen sciences. Uh, so can you, yeah, Maria, if you can answer, like uh, what are the common challenges for citizen science like finding the volunteers, training them for collecting the samples or uh, explaining the procedure and everything. So can you tell us about your experience with this project, uh, the common challenges that you see interacting with the volunteers, the, the citizens? Uh, well, in the part of uh, the interaction, I would say that there, there was no no big deals or no problems such big. For example, when we made to do the field uh, data collection and film the videos, there were some citizens that approached us and were like, what are you doing? Um, and they, they, told, they told us about what happens when the El Nino events happen and how they, how they get affected. And I think they have this, this energy to be part of the of their own protection, kind of, kind of, they are they are protecting protecting themselves in some kind of way. Also, in if you if you Google some some El Nino events here in Peru, uh, the population is very into filming the the event. Like mostly, they they film all when normally when the river passes. So it's kind of what they are already doing, but more technical. So yeah. All right, all right, thank you. So there's another question for you. So they are asking about the, what software are you employing for LSPIV analysis? It's in the chat box, the Q&A. Yes, I'm looking for it. Okay. Yes, the software employed is the Reverb uh, software. Um, it's, uh, it's developed by Antoine uh, Patalano. Uh, this is a software that is used to convert like the flow into um, the mean velocity of the, of the channel. And uh, well, actually this was, this was taught to some of us of the, of the project when we were in Cordoba, uh, Argentina. Um, but uh, that's the software uses River um, 2.2 and the initials of River state for uh, rectified image velocimetry results. All right, thank you. So you could also, I mean, for anyone, any other presenter, if you want to answer the questions, you can also type a short answer and put some pointers in the Q&A box as well so that others can also read joining later or if they cannot hear the, the specific name of the software or any specific names, you can also type the answer in the Q&A. Yeah, thank you. So there's one question from Tafik about what are the main criteria for making a good poster for presentation to the chairs, so to uh, Ibrahim and me. Of course, this is a nice question, but difficult to answer. So a very, let's say, general answer is a good poster is if you can, let's say, transfer the message you would like to give to the auditorium. So if you are able, let's say, to give the details and the main message in a nice way so that you can attract your auditorium for your research, then it's a good poster. So when I'm looking to posters, normally my eyes are automatically looking to some eye sketcher so that I want to get with few views automatically, ah, 
he, she is presenting something about this topic. Uh, this is maybe the key message, the key conclusion, the key information. So I think this is on the one side very uh, challenging uh, to give a quick overview so that the eyes automatically can catch the main idea. And on the other side, of course, when you are starting to present your post or people are coming for a detailed question, to have enough details on the poster to explain the difficulties, the main objectives with all the different conditions to fulfill it and to get the details of the result. I think this is what I normally try to do to have a good balance between attracting the colleagues with a main message on the one side on the other side, to have enough details to discuss with the other specialists in my domain about the details in 5, 10, 15 minutes. So I think the balance between good graphs and good text has to be given. What I normally try is to avoid too much text, which are written sentences, like in a paper. I think key numbers, also text alphanumeric numbers, to put their clear numbers, which has a message, a semantic, so that the people get automatically, OK, there is a number. And then the same with the graphs. I think as simple the graphs are, uh, the key graphs, I mean, uh, as easy as to give the message. So, and I think this is also very, let's say, difficult to find the right scale. That's a, uh, scales are not too small and visible. So I think a general answer from my point of view, criteria one, two, three, four, five, if they are fulfilled, it's a good poster. Unfortunately, it's not possible. What I always recommend to my students, if, if they're preparing a poster, make a first draft, show it to somebody who has no idea what you are doing, maybe your grandma. And if your grandma is able to understand it, then it's a good poster uh, for attracting, let's say the first people. And then show it to your PhD classmate, who is of course maybe knowing more than your grandma about this. And he's also able to get quickly uh, what you are doing in detail then it might be a good poster, but it's just a very general answer. So I could add maybe a small comment as well. So I agree with uh, Frank's comments. Definitely, most of the time, you have a very strong and clear message you want to deliver with the poster, you want with your research, and uh, definitely you can put that in the center. So there are some new designs that uses like sixty percent of the poster with a very bold and big message in the center with a figure. This is not the, like the, 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 the next generation format, but still this is just one example how you can deliver the message clearly, maybe not just with the title. If it's not reflecting as much, you might have a strong message in the center, maybe with a figure that summarizes the entire message. And then you can still have supplementary information, talking more details, giving more uh, information about your study. Definitely the text and the figure balance is critical. But the poster itself, you don't expect people to stand in front of your poster and read the message for 10, 15 minutes. So you should definitely have a planet more like you can consume the entire poster in two, three minutes. Just quickly read the, the text and the figures go over the text in three minutes. Maybe it's just a small guideline to help you to design the poster that can be uh, self-explanatory as well. You don't expect the, the presenter always uh, uh, standing behind, beside, beside the poster. So if I visit a poster booth, I should be able to read it myself and understand myself without uh, too much help from the presenter. So it should be self-explanatory. And definitely external resources is critical. So you can add a couple of links, but they should be also easy to, to type. I don't want to write, type a long URL, like hundreds of uh, keywords, whatever. So maybe adding a small QR code, Maybe a DOI will help to access this information quickly. So you can think about this kind of modern connections to the technology, the QR codes, uh, the short URLs, DOIs will help us to, to reach uh, external information. And the text and then the figure balance is critical. And the figures are should be also big enough to read the labels and information. Also, not too much crowded uh, with lots of, lots of information in a single figure. So definitely more like a small and nice summary of the entire research with a pointers to external and extra information on the sites. Yeah. I think there's another question, Frank. Yeah, I so just saw, okay, what are the main current challenges in hydroinformatics? So I think if you ask 10 experts, you will get 20 answers. Uh, <laughs> so maybe you get now two answers out of this 20. So. Uh, 
I think from my personal point of view, the current challenge is that we have too much data and we have too much software. We have too much, uh, let's say, methods on the one side, and we still have a lack and gap on data, methods, and software on the other side. So uh, what I mean with that is, for example, with the remote sensing data and all the satellite images and so on, we get more and more data, but it's sometimes not the data we really have. So there are still catchments, for example, uh, where you have not measurements for discharges or water levels. Uh, so on the one side, you have sometimes too much data and you have to fight with big data and to extract from this data the real key information you need to answer your engineering questions. So hydroinformatics, I think the big challenge is really to deal with mass big data in a suitable way, as a not, uh, let's say, to get in a short time from engineering point of view, an efficient method to, to uh, extract the key information, knowing that the data you have is maybe in some parts with gaps and lack of information and to deal with that. On the other side, the software tools are there. Some of the tools are 30, 40, 50 years old. So that's nice. They are easy to handle with some tricks, of course. So also generating a lot of data, but you have to think about the uncertainty. So what the decision maker asks us, for example, in flood modeling, uh, is my village safe or not? And our problem is, of course, we can't tell them it's safe or not. We can tell them we estimate a water level or we estimate a, a, a shortcut in water or whatever the problem is. And I think what you have, all, what we have to deal is also with this uncertainty of all these results we are generating from data as well as from our nice numerical or uh, artificial intelligence tools. Uh, I think this is, from my point of view, uh, a current challenge. Uh, of course, when we go in detail, then we can discuss, okay, are this method good or this method good? But I think the general problem is fighting with too much data and scare of data and fighting with too much methods and tools on the one side, but maybe not the most efficient, suitable one. I meanwhile, I'm maybe because of my age, <laughs> I going back to more simple solution. So why, why not using manning strickler equation to make a simple manual calculation before starting a 1D, 2D or 3D model. So to so simplify the things is maybe also sometimes a solution. And I think this is also what we can do in hydroinformatics. Again, not to make it complex with IT, but to find simple solution. Just one personal opinion. Maybe Ibrahim has a similar, different one. Yes, yes, I, I definitely agree uh, with your points. Definitely I have uh, similar ideas around that the challenges I think we are lucky in a sense that we now collect more and more data uh, ever than, uh, more than ever before. We have uh, better computational power with the GPUs, the uh, high performance computing systems, grid computing. So we have more computational power on one, on one side. We have more data on the other side. Now the, the challenge becomes, how can we analyze this data in a better way, more efficiently and, and extract as much more information possible and get more insight for the science. So we need better data analysis tools, data analytics tools. We need better computational systems in terms of integrating all the data. There are lots of challenges comes with these data collection efforts. So on the one side, we have lots of remote sensing data coming in. We have lots of ground-based sensors, but the data itself is distributed into many, many different sources. So there are challenges in the data standards, data formats, uh, the pre-processing. I think we also need better tools for uh, sharing the data, sharing the models, because another challenge we see today here is the reproducibility of science. So how can we reproduce a, a, a method, a, a study that you see on a paper? So there are challenges on understanding the entire methodology, all the details so that, that you can reproduce the study entirely easily. So there are now new standards, new, uh, maybe the tools that you can uh, work on workflows that will allow you to replicate the entire study with a couple of clicks uh, in, in system. So I think uh, we have to be more careful about sharing our data and, and, and sharing our models and providing uh, support in the community at large. So there are some, I think uh, we have seen more efforts by the publishers for enabling data sharing 
uh, sharing models. There are lots of large scale uh, cyber infrastructure systems that you can share your models, share your workflows that connects everything in your research and also get recognition. I think one challenge we have seen in the past was uh, if you share your data, if you share your models, and will you get a recognition out of that uh, collaboration or this uh, support of the community? Because you cannot easily uh, share your data. You have to prepare the data in a way that will be understood uh, by others. So you have to prepare metadata and all the other uh, relevant information with the data itself. I think now we have better uh, tools that we can get recognition for our data. You can share your scripts that you prepare visualizations and, and, and small analysis on the site, and you can still get recognition, like citations for your data, citations for your models. I think now we have better incentive for researchers to share their data, share their models, but still we have a, a, a long way to, to have a, a community that understands the need and challenges and share data and models in a way that's understandable. So maybe we also need better benchmark data that we can compete with each other when you look at today for maybe hydrological modeling, you can see everybody is creating a new model for a new region and, and getting the best results, but nobody can replicate the results for another region, another maybe domain. So I think we need better community level modeling, community level data uh, sharing efforts like benchmark data sets that we can study the same area together with different models and understand the, the performance between the models easily without too much effort. So I think we need better uh, benchmark data sets, uh, community level models that we can collaborate together to create models that can uh, hopefully get the input from many different researchers at the same time and, and, and build on that kind of experience. Maybe last point here we can think about is the web-based systems. They are getting more and more powerful. You can have full-scale GIS level analysis or hydrological modeling on the web. On the client side, you can access GPUs directly from a client side web systems. You can access uh, desktop level languages like C++ directly within web systems uh, without too much effort. So I think we have lots of potential on utilizing the web, which allows reproducibility, which allows access to the user without installing any software, without uh, too much learning curve to set up a model. You can enable a high level interaction, collaboration between researchers using a web system. I think we can definitely explore more about these systems that, that further support the collaboration and interoperability and as well as the, the reproducibility. Yes, thanks. Um, maybe just when I listen to Ibrahim, uh, a kind of appeal to you, I'd say, for the younger generation, because when uh, let's say what I observed, maybe even the generation before us, uh, was that a lot of people were, let's say, taking data as power. So it was very difficult, let's say, 20, 30 years ago to uh, get data because the people know if you have the data, you can do the modeling and you are the only one. So they try to keep a data monopole and so on. So meanwhile, with even the internet, with security and whatever, but we have now a sharing opportunity with the internet, with the international scientific community, with organization like IHR and the Young Professional Network and the chapters and so on. So I think to be able to share our information, I think this is very, very important. So reproducibility of our, let's say, work to do this is really important to share the data as well as to share the models and all the things. So what I do as an appeal is, let's see, be in a, a proactive way. So if you do research, open all the things you have done, write protocols, what you have done, and publish this, not only by I did a nice work, but publish maybe also what Ibrahim meant, benchmark data sets. It can be always, let's say, published on demand so that you have not to put the data free available in the internet, but if somebody is asking, why not sharing the data so that we can make use of the different experiences, not by only reading nice papers where some information are finally hidden, the key factors of tuning the models, so really sharing the things. Okay, that's just a kind of appeal. I think in the past, some, some people were, let's say, a little bit protecting their data and experiences, but I think in our modern, uh, uh, especially scientific environment, I think we have not to make the mistakes from the past or playing the games which are done in other disciplines which are non-scientific.
Okay, other comments, questions from someone? Um, excuse me, I have a question. Let's just do it. Okay, I would like to ask about the importance of validating the sat satellite data within zero data, considering the budget limitation in a small universities in develop developing countries. So I couldn't hear most, some of the, the question, but I think it's about the data access for developing countries in general. Um, I don't know uh, what is the importance of validating um, satellite data with in situ data, uh, considering the limitations in a small university. Yes, uh, Frank, would you like to answer that question or? Uh, I, I, I'm not sure whether I fully understand it, but okay, I think the problem is really to get data. I think, and uh, I think there is one chance from, let's say, for every country is a remote sensing data. I mean, the global activities. Uh, what I observed also for, let's say, uh, what you call the developing countries, whether in any part of the continents, that the data, the local data, even if it is measured, it's really still not available because they are somewhere in the governmental authority hidden behind the desk of somebody who do not want to share it. So I think the best uh, is then to use the global available data like remote sensing data, where you might get then from satellite, uh, let's say rainfall data, at least to estimate this. So the other thing what from my students uh, is of course to ask the local people for observation is maybe not giving you data, but it giving you a physical insight. And they might remember, let's say a flood scenarios two years ago and whatever, and then on this base, sometimes you can collect the data, but this is, I think, a general problem existing. Yeah. Maybe another aspect of your question was about calibration with the, or yeah. validation of the data with the ground-based sensors. So definitely, if you have access to ground-based data that you can validate the remote sensing, it said it will be great. But it's not available uh, everywhere in the world, uh, even in in develop. I mean, in um, countries that have access to this uh, such data, it's not available throughout uh, the each area. So definitely it's a challenge for everybody, maybe more challenging in some developing countries, but uh, I think uh, wherever the data is available at the remote sensing level, then it will be great to, to use this data. If you have validation data possible through these ground-based sensors, uh, it's another, and, and, and maybe another addition, but if not, I think you should go with the ground-based, I mean, the, just the, the remote sensing data available through some uh, federal sources. I mean, I think NASA and many others share data or European Union has several satellites that they share data publicly from their websites. I think there are lots of data available in remote sensing all around the world. If you have data on the, the local level that you can validate, there'll be an addition. If not, I think the, the remote sensing data is getting more and more powerful and you can definitely use in our studies and then trust at certain level uh, if you don't have any validation data available. But uh, I think there's also potential just in directly using the remote sensing data as it is, yeah. I Thank think uh, the beside calibration, there's also what I call plausibility. So if you are not able to calibrate your model because you have no, let's say, local measurements available, I think what you can do it at least, let's say, to make a plausibility study, for example, asking experts, do you observe the same results? It's maybe they're not uh, one centimeter accurate for the water level or whatever, but to see that the trends are in the model. And maybe that you can calibrate the model with another catchment, which has a lot of similarities, and then using this let's say, uh, yeah, similarities to say, okay, it's not calibrated for my specific catchment or for my river or for my pipe system or whatever, but at least by plausibility, by similarities, you can argument that this might be nearby reality. Even if you have a perfect calibrated model because you have a perfect data, you have always to remember the computer model is always wrong relative to the reality. And you have always to evaluate it uh, how accurate or how plausible your model is. Uh, we believe that the computer models are nice and give good results, but we have always to remind that uh, reality is not uh, modeled one by one in the computer. There are always assumptions behind this. So, and maybe 
again, a simple model with basic assumption and a higher uncertainty rate gives a more better answer than a complex model well calibrated with the best data, uh, but maybe with the wrong assumptions or whatever. So what I observed is that the number of participants is increasing. And maybe uh, this is some trends that we have to finish soon, uh, still five minutes time, because uh, the participants from the next session are joining. Um, I'm just checking, I think there is another question was coming up. Yeah. I think there are two questions, one in the Q&A and one in the chat. So we can maybe answer, I think it's pointing to another presenter we can yeah read the question maybe for the from the q a and then maybe the presenter can answer this question okay so uh let's say from uh the colleague from munich university junkie uh i was wondering which criteria did you use to validate your model and about the unit you are using uh, uh are you still uh, in the session to be able to answer this question in the q and a so I'm just reading the part. I'm afraid if uh, uh, we're basin, uh, basin units, in order to know this, how you can explain basin units and the way you develop. And I understand an example, the slope map, uh, it has different classes. Yeah. So maybe if it's not possible, uh, uh, first of all, are you able to answer this just now, uh, Zheng Chi? If not, I'm not sure whether you are still available or not. I can't see in your panel list. So maybe that I think it's from Cesar Manuel, uh, maybe that you do it afterwards. I'm not sure whether also the email are, uh, from the presenters are shared so that this might be answered then later in a bilateral uh, meeting or a bilateral email exchange, because I'm afraid that he is not actually in the at least not in the panel list. So maybe he has left already for another session. And in the chat was one question. I'm just moving to it. Uh, what recommendation would they give us for the roughness calibration, Manning, Chasey, or Strickler in the model SECRAS open telemark due to the sensitivity they present? Um, I'm not sure, let's say, how, whether it's a general question or a specific one. Of course, uh, roughness calibration is, uh, as you know, that the Manning, Strickler, and Chasey are empiric. Uh, uh, the idea is to have an empiric uh, equation, which means uh, this Manning, Strickler values are, let's say, artificial values. You cannot really measure in this point of view. You have to do it for every river, for every specific situation. You can do it, a measurement, and you can maybe potentially find this by the simplification. Uh, but this is really guessing. That's the reason why we are using it for calibration because we don't know what is the exact value and how to distribute it because sometimes we are taking a 1D model just a global by averaging everything. So in this point of view calibration, if you define for every cross section, for every grid points, a specific uh, Manning value or Strickler value, of course, you can make an over-optimization of the system. So again, I think this is something which is engineering knowledge and this might require expertise from the local authorities. So if we are calibrating a model for a river, which we have never been in touch, I think it's really good to ask the local experts, do they have observation about changing vegetation, about the sediment, about the rocks and whatever. And then with, together with them to find out what are the best values. Is it useful to make a global mining value or should we do it in the floodplains and the riverbed different? Or should we carefully be in this area because it is always changing every year, the conditions? I'm not sure, uh, let's say, whether this is the answer. So I think we are thrown out now. <laughs> uh, so first of all, I would like to thank everybody to join the hydroinformatics session. I just say, let's keep in contact uh, on all levels. And yeah, I think stay in the session and go for the climate change adaptation now. Thanks, everyone, and see you soon somewhere online. <laughs> Goodbye from my side. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks for joining here. Thank you, Frank, and thank you, Ibrahim, for being mentors for this session. Also, thanks again for all the presenters. We're now moving on to the next session.
so let's just give people a minute to join. So we'll have climate change adaptation in this uh, room and there will be an urban drainage session in the other Zoom room. So just give people a chance to join. So Roberto, are you ready to chair this session? Looks like we've just um, experienced some technical problems, maybe. Uh, there he is. So hi, hi everybody. It is uh, uh, Roberto Ranzi. I am the uh, chairman of this uh, session about uh, uh, climate change <coughs> adaptation in the uh, young professional uh, section of IHR. I'm very glad to see uh, so many uh, young students. Uh, I read uh, most of your abstract uh, and so I'm um, I'm glad to start the session. So you have uh, from three to five minutes time to present your, your work, and then we move to the next speaker. And then uh, at the end uh, of the session, which lasts for one hour, there will be time for questions and, uh, and answers. And I will guide this uh, question and answer uh, discussion during this uh, virtual uh, coffee break. So I, I hope you add the, the list of uh, speakers uh, and we will start uh, with uh, uh, Carolina Cerqueira Barbosa. Yes, I see in the top uh, left uh, and you can start, uh, you're welcome. Thank you. Can you see me? Can you? Yes, yes, I can me? see you. I can see your presentation. So go ahead. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. My name is Carolina Barbosa. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. I will try to summarize in a few minutes what the poster is about. Regional climate model next to global climate models play the role of providing the details needed for local impact studies regarding future climate change. So in the present study, we evaluated the likely future change in water level of a Brazilian multipurpose reservoir for, for the 2050s. For that, we used the IPCC representative concentration pathway, RCP 4.5 and 8.5 for downscaling projections of the Hadley Century Global Environmental Model, Hedging 2 ES to compare with a 10 years baseline. Itupararanga Reservoir is located in an urbanized region in Sao Paulo State, Brazil, built for many purposes, mainly to drinking water supply and power generation. The reservoir tropic state has shifted over the years, currently showing mesotrophic behavior, and the phytoplankton community has been dominated by cyanobacteria. Projections from the Hedging 2 ES were regionalizing using Brazilian National Institute for Space Research Regional Climate Model, the ETA model. The model domain encompasses most of South America and Central America and part of adjacent oceans. And those data is free available on the Projeto website. The one dimensional vertical hydrodynamic general lake model, GLM, was used to simulate water level. The required data by the model were provided by the energy company and Brazilian governmental agencies. The model was calibrated from 2009 to 2013 
and validated from January 2014 to March 2019. A performance assessment was applied using the root mean square error and the Pearson correlation coefficient. A period between 2009 and 2018 was considered as being the baseline to, to the scenario simulations. So the baseline simulation was compared with the simulated projections considering the alterations in all meteorological forcing variables and then in each meteorological variable individually. After the calibration and validation, the model was able to represent the water level fluctuations. The meteorological forcing projections, projections show a significant difference regarding the baseline period. There was a pattern of daily precipitation reduction and average air temperature and short wave radiation increase in both RCP scenarios with higher intensification in the RCP 8.5 projections. Such changes would directly influence the decrease in the water level in comparison with the baseline scenario. In the simulations using the both projections, the reservoir dead storage would be reached in the mid-2050s, as we can observe it in figure two. Also, the average water level would decrease for each meteorological forcing of RCP 8.5 scenario, with the exception of the air temperature projections. In conclusion, the present study considered only meteorological forcing chains to simulate future water level alterations in the Itupararanga Reservoir. However, the results can be used as warning to the decision making. The water level decrease could generate serious damage to the water supply and power generation. So deep investigation would be required to develop adaptive management strategies for the reservoir operation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for having also kept the time. And uh, so we'll uh, move to the next uh, speaker, uh, Purnanjali Chandra. She will talk about the social quantitative analysis of water, energy, food, climate nexus in India. So let's move uh, to another continent. So the floor is yours, so you can uh, speak. And Uh, is my screen visible? Yes, yes. Go ahead. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I will be summarizing a few points uh, from my paper, The Social Quantitative Analysis of Water, Energy, Food, Climate Nexus in India. So the paper primarily looks into the impact of climate change on the water, energy, food resource sectors and how India as a nation chooses to mitigate them. It looks into these three vital resource sectors as an integrately connected operating engines, um, the motors in the engine, and which in turn is kind of affected by one of the external drivers, which is the climate change effect. There are a number of instances in the Indian context to substantiate the statement made. One of the most recent and applaudable shift made by different policy documents and the government has been towards increasing the use of first generation biofuel fuels. However, the move has been to reduce down the use of fossil fuels to reduce carbon footprint and to mitigate the climate change impact, but it is a move taken only through the perspective of energy. This is one of the gaps that has been identified in the paper. Mitigative measures, even when addressing drought situation or in case of addressing rainfall variations across the different geographies, there has been a more silos approach and a discrete approach towards addressing these resources uh, in addressing the management of these resources per se and not a very broad nexus approach. Therefore, the paper tries to highlight on these aspects like using a biofuel, which is a first generation biofuel can be really beneficial. But for a country like India, where these fuels are procured from first gen from the flex crops, which are maize and sugarcane, it can be extremely embarking of a greater trade off between water and the food sector, as well as hampering the regional economy of the place. Therefore, the paper also makes these kind of comparative conclusions through different kinds of analysis of policy documents, published articles, reports, and data sets on consumption and production patterns. It therefore goes ahead making some vital recommendations where 
a more cross sectoral approach has to be brought into the ways policies are developed and also in the ways they are implemented and the technologies that are meant to mitigate these effects and manage resources it advises for a larger uh, step to take in towards a decentralized approach towards resource management in india thank you uh, thank you for your <laughs> presentation and uh, let's move to the next uh, speaker let's move a little east uh, to china uh, the floor is uh, for uh, cheng cheng i cannot see him it's not here uh, probably ah, we have him and ah, yes 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 you are there Ah, okay. You need to, somebody needs to upgrade Chen Cheng to panelist. Okay, you can. We need some technical advice. Ah, okay. Chen Cheng is not here. Um, they are here somehow, but I can't upgrade. I'll, I'll check. Um, ah, so Stibalitz, uh, Stibalitz says that uh, Chen is not here, so. Okay, we'll just go to the next one. Yes, okay. We go to the, uh, to the next one, uh, who is uh, David Yaranga Lazzaro. We return to Latin America. <clears throat> it seems uh, neither David is uh, here. Uh, David, uh, I see here one. One David. I see Hello. David. The Hello. floor is yours. Hello. Hello. Hi, David. You can project your. Okay. Go. Okay. Good. Perfect. You can go ahead and start your presentation. Yes, my name is David Yaranga. The study analyzed the impacts of climate change on future water availability in the Mapacho River Subbasin, Cusco, Peru, evaluating different global climate models of the CMIP5 and the ignition scenarios RCP4.5 and RCPH.5. This process, the SWAT hydrologic model simulating the dye in two scenarios future Cercaino, 2020 to 2050, and future Leyeno, 2070 to 2100. The materials and methods used are materials, subbasin of the Mapacho River, gridded information, pisco, precipitation, and temperatures, digital elevation model, land carver, and soil type, daily flow series, methods, the limitation of the Mapacho River subbasin to the Tambo Hydrological Station and Generation of 21 Micro Basin. SWAT Hydrological Model Calibration and Validation. GCN Spatial Scaling Using IDW Interpolation. Correction of bias the DCN Corax C Esiro point K3.6 GFDL ACM to M and MIRC using PISCO, Simul simulation of the dye flows for the near future and distant future, result and conclusion. Nash indicators of 0 0.68 and 0 0.64 we are obtained in calibration and validation. Averse 
percentage different of the flow compared to the current state 2000H at 2018. The projection of any discharges in the far future for RCPH.5 indicate a probable in increase of 50.58 percentage to 99.2 percentage in the water supply while in the wet season version from 24.1 percentage to 90.9 percentage could be obtained which it could cause possible flash. However, for RCP 4.5, the annual discharges in the near and far future are very varied. That is, that is there will be variation that could can generate and and the rise or overestimation with respect to the historical flow period in the order of less 14.14 to 14.3 to percentage and less 11 to 11.43 for the near and the distant, distant future respectively. Thank you so much. So uh, thank you, David. So it seems uh, that uh, uh, Cheng Chen uh, is now uh, fine with his uh, connection. Can you confirm to me, Chen? I can't see you around. So probably Estibalids has to promote you to panelist so in the in the meantime uh, we can uh, uh, move to the sec to the next speaker who is uh, Omar Perez uh, in the meantime i will check uh, with uh, the uh, the organizers uh, whether we can give the floor also to to Chen uh, so hello how are you Omar uh, the floor is yours Okay, let me prepare my poster. Let me... Your post is on. Yeah. Hello? Yes, yes, you can go ahead and present your poster. Okay. You have always three to five minutes. Perfect. So I'm, good morning, everyone. Today I have the opportunity to present my project, characterization of the variability of flows in the sub-basin of City Grande until the Cañones Hydrometric Station for the period of 1988, 2017. So like first point, I'm gonna start with a small explanation with using my abstract. So, Always the Panama Canal Authority need to warranty the existence of the water for the operational, for this global operational business. So that's, it's important because we need to do some hydrological study to see or to have a more precise knowledge about the water sources availability, uh, available, availability in all these watersheds. So for that reason, I took that to, I took um, this project, the characterization of the flow variability. So I'm gonna present my methods. I, I was using uh, the method what the people in the high operational hydrology unit water resources section of the Panama Canal use. That is always in, in the practical guide, guide of the World Meteorological Organization, number 168, and that is part of the United States Geological Survey. So like first point in my investigation, in my project, I use the forest cover and then I, I use that to do like a relation between the parameters and variables of the basin. For example, basin morphometry, general parameters of the basin, basin shade parameter, relief parameter, drainage parameter, flow analysis, and rainfall analysis. Here in this picture, you can see here what happened here. Okay, so 
Hey, we can hear. Yes, fine. You can. Yeah, the isometric okay. curve is one representation. It's a graphic representation about the different uh, uh, watershed behavior and the different uh, uh, ages of the basin. For example, in the in the first in in the first uh, let me use this in the first uh, blood curve that is the use phase. That means the erosion potential. In the second blood curve, that is the maturity phase, you will have the hydrological balance in your basin. And the third phase here, that is the old age phase. That means when you have a sedimented and rocky watershed. So if you see the red curve here, that is my basin, that's uh, City Grande Sud Basin. So that City Grande Sud Basin are in the all age phase. So in my results, I have the flow duration curve. For me, it's very important because here I can see the all the different uh, flows what we have all the time. For example, I with this graph, I can represent the different percentage of the time where the flow can be equal or exceeded. For example, for me, the most important percentage are 15% and I will have 8.2 cubic meter per second. And the 75%, I will have 3.2 cubic meter per second. And if you see here, you will have the x, x axis, and the y in the y, you will have the flows, and, and here you will see the different percentage. In my conclusion, uh, the City Grande uh, basin is very stable, but I got some dry years. For example, in the year 1997, is too dry, but Oh, now it's very stable and the uh, sub basin is, is very elongated and the concentration time are very fast and the infiltration is very fast very fast too um, thank you so much so thank you for this uh, important case study last year many of us were in uh, in panama so we could see the Panama Canal Basin. Uh, it was very interesting. And uh, so now it seems uh, that uh, Chen Cheng is, uh, is again. So uh, Omar, can you disconnect your presentation, please? Yeah, let me connect this. Yeah. OK, so. Um, I don't see yet uh, Cheng Chen, so probably I ask the the organizers check uh, his uh, upgrade as a as panelist. So in the in the meantime, uh, we move to the next speaker. He won uh, G from uh, Korea. Good. Uh, you can uh, go can ahead uh, and take. Yes. Does he hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. I'll, I'll present now. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Hyun Ji from Seoul National University, and I'm going to present my research about the drought risk index for nationwide comparison in South Korea. Our most drought research is focused on drought index to measure the methodologic droughts, but drought is a disaster that affected the social system a lot, so we need to study how much socioeconomic damage will society suffer. Uh, although many international organizations are conducting risk assessments, but its scale is for global scale, so uh, this study reframe for local scale. Drought is a complex concept, so it is uh, important to define it clearly. And I'll uh, reference, uh, reference from the uh, fear of climate change adaptation and risk reduction. I uh, uh, so I make uh, this kinds of definition. Drought risk is the probability of potential damage causing drought affected by climate change, and I. Uh, divided the, the risk into hazard, exposure, and capacity. 
And actually, IPCC risk framework uses vulnerability instead of capacity. But here, uh, but since vulnerability has negative meaning and capacity terminology is more easy to apply and understand for stakeholders, so I changed the terminology from vulnerability to capacity to local scale with the uh, local state. Um, and uh, I make uh, the draw risk is cal calculating the in index uh, suitable approach for relative comparison. And next application, uh, based on the formation definition, I calculate hazard exposure and capacity indicator using 22 data. Uh, since, since the cost of drought is due to lack of precipitation, I use SPI for hazard in indicator. And exposure is the water demand for municipal agreement, agriculture and industrial demand. And last capacity, I uh, separate the coping capacity and adaptive capacity. First, coping capacity is uh, using water resource infrastructure data and the adaptive capacity is using for socioeconomic states and ability data. So each component's uh, weight is uh, using Pearson cor correlation coefficients between the component and drought damage. Uh, last about the results. I didn't uh, write on the poster, but uh, using Historical data, I got the uh, 0.56 Spearman uh, correlation coefficients. So from here, uh, the trend of future DRI as mean uh, under ICP 4.5 increased in the earlier century, but I've under uh, 8.5 increase in the mid, mid century. Although the mean of future DRI is increasing or decreasing according to the future period, it is confirmed that or maximum of future DRIs are higher value than in the past period. So this is a figure two. You can see the what is, it, what is the uh, result. And, and table one is uh, show the future DRI with your guest past DRI with the uh, GCM scenario. So conclusion for the special comparison, the increasing trend indicates the region near the metropolitan cities, including Seoul, while the decreasing trend shown near the Southeast area of South Korea. Thank you. Okay, thank you for this uh, uh, new approach uh, to, to assess uh, the Ah, yes. Yes, thank you for your presentation. We can uh, move to the uh, next uh, speaker, remaining always in uh, Korea. If you want to show your, your face, uh, if it is not a problem for you, we would uh, appreciate uh, to see some people alive uh, and not only voices. So if it is not a problem for you. <laughs> So, in any case, uh, Ye Heun Kim. Okay. Okay, so the floor is can yours. You, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, can you see the slide also? Yes, if you like, okay. you can show your face so that uh, people can uh, know you better. <laughs> Okay, uh, but it's not I, mandatory, but it is preferred. Yeah, it's actually at 11 p.m. here, so I may. Have ah, my, okay. So my face. <laughs> you were ready uh, to go to bed, and so. Yeah. So, however, good afternoon, everyone. So, uh, 
I'm kind of excited to be here to share my work with you guys from all over the world. I am Ji Hyun Kim from Seoul National University. So the title of the research is Analysis of Recent Climate Change Research on Water Resources in the Korean Peninsula. So uh, to begin with a little background information, there are Korean Climate Change Assessment Reports published in 2010 and 2014 by the Korean Meteorological Administration and the Ministry of Environment. Uh, this year, the new version has been published where my research group was in charge of the water resource chapter in the WG second part, uh, which stands for the working group two. Therefore, this poster briefly summarized the result of the report. And if you are interested in further information, the English summary reports are also presented in the internet, so you can download it. Well, uh, since many of you are familiar with the concepts of uncertainty, the results of future climate change projection varies on the choice of which GCM or RCM downscaling method scenarios that you may have considered. Uh, hence, the main purpose of this research is to gather and analyze the uh, ensembles of climate change simulation results in order to give an agreement level in favor of decision making. So a total of 161 research published in 13 journals from 2014 to 2019 were analyzed. And I thought sharing this result would be worthwhile since many of them are written in Korean which are not available for the international audience. So the findings were classified into three groups, meteorological variable, hydrological variable, and environmental variable. Also, as you can see from the table one in the bottom left side, the agreement level of the results were set in three sections, the substantial agreement, moderate agreement, and the restricted agreements. Uh, the Substantial agreement is the findings with high agreement and robust evidence. The moderate agreement indicates the findings with medium agreement or high agreement with low evidence. And lastly, the restricted agreements show the findings with low agreement and limited evidence. Okay, to move on the result part, the common results were presented with the agreement levels in parentheses. So the annual precipitation has generally increased where the summer rainfall has clearly increased along with the frequency of extreme rainfall over the past 30 years with substantial agreement. And the maximum rainfall, probable rainfall, design rainfall, and extreme rainfall were also projected to increase. Therefore, future discharge tends to increase in general, uh, particularly in summer with moderate agreement with the uh, frequency and intensity of the future flooding were likely to grow with moderate agreement. Moreover, the frequency and scale of drought will generally increase in the future. As you can see from the figure one on the upper right side, uh, the drought damage was projected to excavate, especially in the Han River and the southern part of the country. Finally, in conclusion, with the change of the rainfall pattern, both flood and drought damage were expected to increase in Korea. So I believe this study could be used as the useful data for adapting the climate change and establishing strategies on the Korean Peninsula. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, presentation. Um, while we are trying to solve the, the connection problem of uh, Chen uh, that possibly will uh, give him the, uh, the floor as a uh, uh, last uh, speaker. Uh, in the meantime, uh, if uh, there is uh, Abdullah uh, Katarne, I give him uh, the, uh, the floor. So the, the topic uh, is a little far from the core of our session, uh, but it was assigned to this uh, Sorry. session. So the floor is, uh, is yours. It seems that you started quite, uh, mine was about 10 minutes from now, so I just joined. And now, 
Yes. Okay. So you have the. Uh... All right. I can just start then. Um, um, the topic is valorizing driftwood from waste to an anode and sodium ion battery. It is um, a topic that I personally worked with Abdullah Klarna along with Kavchin, uh, Dupont, Hervé, PJ, Virginia, and Mario Franca from uh, many different universities uh, IHE Delft, uh, ANC Lyon, University of Lausanne, and uh, Switzerland, and Technical University of Delft. Uh, to start with, what does uh, driftwood uh, refer to? Driftwood is um, wood that is being transported by via rivers. They come from both uh, natural and anthropogenic origins, and they play a positive role in the ecology of the river system. However, um, they seem to have a destructive power uh, um, uh, when it comes to floods. Uh, usually, the, the, the problem with these wood, they are being collected, and they are usually either combusted or landfilled, and this is where the climate change factor comes in. Um, the increase of uh, uh, climate change can increase the, uh, the severity of floods, and we expect an increase in the total amount of these uh, of these woods. So what we did, we studied we studied a, a case study in in, in Genesa, uh, which is northeastern of Lyon. There, about 1,300 tons of driftwood is collected annually. If you uh, transfer that into uh, carbon, it's about 200 tons of uh, carbon uh, CO2 carbon. If they burn it annually. They extract it for safety of the, of the, of the dam. And what we, we, we try to look in the um, uh, genres or different composition that, of, of the wood that is collected there. And they are a five main genre and they're named Ulnus, Fraxinus, Populus, Salix, and Cunifier. What we did, we used um, uh, a thermochemical treatment called hydrothermal carbonization. We study it based on um, a, uh, a certain operational conditions of uh, 200 Celsius and 11.5 residence time. And these are a way to kind of cook the wood or different genres of food. Uh, and then we studied uh, the, uh, the, the products of this, um, uh, of this process uh, and, this, and we tested the suitability for uh, a sodium ion battery. Um, I'm just moving quickly to the results and the figure above figure four, you can see the product's mass yield of the hydrothermal carbonization and the X axis, the genres and on the Y axis, the mass yield. You can see that uh, of gas, uh, liquid and hydrochar, you can observe that the hydrochar, which is the solid product that comes from the hydrothermal carbonization seem to have uh, the uh, highest uh, amount and they are between 65 to 70%. And hydrochar can be used for different applications, actually more than 90 applications that you can uh, relate the hydrochar with. The liquid product also contains some carbon that you can use for uh, soil amendments or, uh, or even you can recycle. The gas um, mostly contains CO2, which is um, one to 3%, which is why we think it's a, an environmental friendly uh, uh, process. Uh, moving on quickly to the ash content, and the ash content is pretty much the inorganic elements that can, that uh, that you have in the hydrochar. In the x-axis, you can see the, the uh, different genres and the y-axis, the ash elements. And what, we, what we also observed that this hydrothermal carbonization uh, led to reduction in the amount of inorganic element, which is something beneficial for different applications. Uh, what we also observed that the hydrochar seemed to have a higher carbon content between 55 to uh, 50, uh, 57%. Um, uh, and uh, again, the, hydro, the hydrochar uh, that we observed, we also um, did some analysis of the morphology, and the morphology is the shape and uh, of the surface of this uh, hydrochar. You can see it in figure six. Uh, we study it in the, using SEM, and we also observed the formation of something called microspheres, and these are agglomeration of carbon that is believed to have a a beneficial impact when you when you uh, study when you want to use them as an anode and sodium ion battery. Lastly, we did um, a preliminary testing of the hydrochar, uh, and we we observed about 80% efficiency when it comes to their electrical performance, which is significantly high compared to the ones done in the literature. Just to wrap up uh, uh, to the conclusions, uh, what we what we uh, believe is that the driftwood that is being collected um, in many dams around the world, they are a resource that can be utilized instead of, um, instead of just uh, wasting it. 
Uh, hydrothermal carbonization, which is a technology that we use, seems to be able to upgrade this driftwood and, um, and is an environmental friendly uh, uh, process with low emission CO2, only one to 3% of the initial uh, mass yield. Um, uh, what we also observe that the, the different genres uh, in, the, in our, in our um, case study does not have a significant impact um, on the overall uh, process. And um, the driftwood that we studied seemed to have a high potential for use in sodium ion batteries. Um, and that's pretty much uh, it for me. So thank you for this uh, uh, innovative um, uh, topic related to also to climate change uh, mitigation uh, and uh, an impact uh, uh, on, um, on floods, uh, on the generation of this uh, uh, driftwood. So now we, we move, I believe we have solved the, the, the connection problem of uh, Cheng Chen, but uh, just for order, we end up with uh, Jacopo Busato, and then uh, we, uh, we end up uh, with uh, uh, Cheng Chen, because we have time, so no problem. So you have both about uh, five minutes to present uh, your poster. OK. Hello to everybody. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. yes. Perfect. Maybe if I do like this. Can you see it now? Yes, yes. OK, perfect. Good evening to everybody. I'm Jacopo Busatto, and I'm a PhD student of the Roma 3 University in Rome. And I work as well with the CNR uh, in Rome. In Rome. So my research topic is the study of the Agulas current and the Agulas system, that is the western boundary current of the Indian Ocean, that it flows along the east coast of the Africa down to the Agulas Bank, uh, where it retroflex and start flowing eastward along the subtropical front. In this retroflexion, uh, it starts shedding uh, waters in the form of uh, mesoscale eddies uh, in the South Atlantic. And this water carry uh, heat and salt, and this and this ad adduction is believed to. Uh, to modulate and enhance the Atlantic uh, Atlantic circulation and the meridional uh, overturning circulation of the Atlantic Ocean. So, uh, so uh, the aim of, of the research is to study uh, whether this, uh, this eddies called Agulas ring can affect the, the circulation and in this way, the global climate. To do so, we start analyzing some data, some satellite data, such as uh, temperature of the surface, uh, kinetic energy of the eddies, and latent heat fluxes, and latent and all uh, surface heat fluxes. And as we can see in figure one, we have that, what happened? I, I lost my screen. Is everything okay? Can you see, still see my presentation? You, you have to restart because there was an um, uh, interference. So okay, so I have to not share. your fault. Yes. Okay. So this one, share this screen. Okay. 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 Go okay. Ahead. Yes. Yes. Go okay. ahead. So uh, as we can as we can see from Figure One, we have an, a neat separation from the cold water of the South Antarctic current and the warm waters of the Indian and Atlantic Ocean. And this the limitation is the subtropical front where the current flows eastward, uh, right here. Mm. And from the climatologies, we can locate the subtropical front at forty degrees south. Uh, if we if we study the trends, so the linear uh, the linear slope of an interpolation, we can see that in the Agulas region, we have a, a strong positive trend. That means uh, that the subtropical front is shifting southward. This uh, shifting means that the gap between the, the subtropical front uh, latitude and the, the South African coast is, uh, is widening. So uh, more waters can flow into the Atlantic. 
And the same results is, uh, result is provided by the eddy kinetic energy. And as we can see in figure three, we have that the Agulas region is very turbulent as we have some orange and red dots on the, on the map. And if we, if, we, if we study the trend of the eddy kinetic energy, that is the variance of the kinetic energy of the, of the current, uh, if we perform an average uh, on the south on the southern part of the Atlantic Ocean over the the Agulas leakage zone, we have a positive trend, meaning that more turbulent water is shed into the Atlantic from the uh, from the Indian Ocean, and this means that more eddies are shed uh, from the Agulas leakage. Uh, so these two results are in accordance between them. Uh, Latin uh, surface heat fluxes. Uh, unfortunately, I, I could not fit the plot in the in the poster. Uh, shows that uh, latent heat flux and, and and sensible heat fluxes that that are the heat lost due to evaporation, the first one, and the uh, atmosphere convection, the second one. Shows that uh, in the Agulas region we have a strong heat loss, and the trends show also a. Uh, uh, an enhancing and an increasing trend in these two kind of uh, heat flux, meaning that a lot of heat is lost in this region. So it, it can really affect the, um, the Atlantic circulation due to thermaline uh, uh, variations. So next steps will be to study also the wind, the wind stress, the wind stress, wind stress curl in the effects on the current and perform Lagrangian simulation to track eddies and see whether they can reach the equator and the north part of the Atlantic to see the, the real influence of these eddies and these warm waters of the Agulas current in the Atlantic. Thank you for the attention. Thank you for your presentation. Okay. Yes, now we have solved the problem of a connection of uh, Cheng. So the, um, the floor is uh, yours. So we move back to the third poster about data fusion of precipitation products. So you can project your poster. Okay, could you hear me? Yes, yes. You can okay. project uh, your poster with the share screen. Okay. Okay. Could you hear that? My poster? Yes. Okay. Go okay. ahead. Okay, okay. Okay. Uh, sorry for the mistakes. Hello, everyone. My name is Chen Chen. Uh, I'm honored to be here to share my research topic. Uh, the topic of my presentation is data fusion of precipitation products based on triple collocation method. Uh, as we all know, precipitation is an essential factor in the study of global climate change. Accurate precipitation estimates are crucial for agriculture, uh, irrigation, flood prevention, and so on. Traditionally, the ground-based rain gauge observations are considered as the most accurate observation of precipitation. However, the ground-based uh, observations are especially sparse. In recent years, a lot of grid-based precipitation products have been produced, uh, which provide uh, precipitation monitoring at global and uh, regional scales. However, these uh, precipitation products are in an indirect way to monitor precipitation, which contain regional and uh, seasonal systematic biases and uh, random errors. Uh, diffusion is an uh, effective way to improve improve the accuracy of multiple precipitation observations. And the triple collocations method was ori originally proposed to access the error of ocean wind uh, speed products, uh, which can solve the error statistics of three independent measurements without knowing the tree value. And thus it has the potential to be incorporated into data fusion uh, algorithms. Uh, therefore, 
and we conduct a study on data fusion uh, of three grid based uh, precipitation products based on the uh, triple collocation methods. And three independent uh, precipitation products uh, at daily scale over the Yangtze River Basin were used in the study, and the three uh, independent precipitation uh, products are uh, satellite based GPM emerger uh, products. And the re analysis based ERA products and the source moisture based uh, SM2 ring products. Uh, as shown in the pro as shown in this uh, poster, uh, a, a linear uh, square based data fusion method was used uh, to calculate the way. Uh, of each uh, estimates in this study. Based on the triple collocation estimations, the basic function of the data fusion is showing uh, as these uh, equations. And the results are showing in table one and uh, figure one. And as shown in table one, we can find that uh, ERA products has the best uh, uh, CC but uh, uh, and the smallest uh, uh, root mean square error. And the data fusion results uh, by the triple collocations uh, had better performance when compared to the three original three inputs. Uh, it indicates the effectiveness of the triple collect collocations based on data fusion method. Uh, in terms of the special uh, distribution of the main daily rainfall in the Yangtze River Basin, it can be found that uh, this data fusion results uh, had a similar special pattern with the uh, rain gauge uh, uh, observations. Uh, however, it uh, should be noted that uh, the main limitation of for the application of the uh, triple collocation based method is a requirement of three independent inputs. Although there are many available multiple source precipitation products uh, in recent years, and they are difficult to mildly meet the independence requirement because of the uh, same data source among them. Uh, since it is challenging to Acquire three independent precipitation data sets. Uh, more efforts should be paid to develop a, uh, a robust uh, to variable algorithm for, for precipitation data fusion in future studies. Uh, that's all for my presentation today. Uh, thanks for your listening. Okay, thank you to all the, the speakers. Uh, we, we ended up in, um, on time, uh, and so uh, uh, I thank you. So uh, in principle, uh, now we, we have a, a short time, so I, I would like to, to start the, the discussion on time at uh, half past uh, uh, three, Madrid time, uh, of course. Uh, and so I give to you a couple of minutes uh, to, to have some rest, uh, to take uh, a coffee. In the meantime, we, we collect uh, questions and answers. So we have about 93 participants. Uh, so, um, so you can, uh, you can pose uh, questions. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, me and, uh, and uh, I can pose to you questions and trigger the discussion at uh, uh, half past three. Uh, however, feel free to, to pose questions uh, in, the, in the question and, uh, and answer. So for instance, I see already there is a, a question uh, to Kim and others, so I will collect uh, uh, the, the questions I will share with the participants. So 
Uh, okay, so have uh, some minutes uh, rest, and then at half past uh, uh, three, we, we start the, the discussion. We already have two questions in the Q&A and I would really uh, encourage everyone to put questions in the Q&A, both for the presenters and also for our mentor here in this session. So feel free to grab a coffee and then put all of your questions, everything that you always wanted to ask presenters or our mentor into the Q&A.
Mm, okay, uh, so it is uh, half past uh, three. So there were a couple of questions on the Q&A uh, uh, interface. And uh, so I, we will start uh, from this uh, Q&A and then I will uh, trigger the discussions to the uh, to the speakers. So anybody of you who have about uh, 82 participants uh, is uh, free to pose uh, questions uh, on the <coughs> uh, Q&A um, uh, yes, uh, menu uh, in the bottom. So one first uh, uh, question uh, was, uh, was posed uh, uh, to uh, to Purnanjali Chandra, so it was about uh, the, the first and second uh, generation of uh, biofuel uh, you, you were considering uh, when discussing the, uh, the food water uh, climate uh, uh, nexus. So can you uh, answer and start a discussion on that? So thank you for the question, first of all. Uh, so basically about considering first generation biofuels, that is kind of the most common form of biofuels that are coming into the use and is also, if we look in terms of production, is way more convenient to make a paradigm shift into the nature of energy being consumed for so many decades now in India. And talking about second generation biofuels, these tend to be a pretty more expensive when it comes to generating the biofuel and making it available to the larger public as a resource funded by the government. So in that kind of a situation, in terms of uh, procuring a certain resource and then making it available to the larger public at a very reasonable rate, a larger idea of the economics behind that infrastructure service comes into play. And that is uh, the major reason why second generation biofuels are not considered in the Indian context. However, a third and uh, adding to what I said is also a fact that the second generation biofuels are also attracted, are also extracted from some kind of crops. So a third generation biofuel are better choices which are extracted completely from algae and there is no such kind of a scope of any kind of intersection between the food sector and mitigating the energy requirements for the nation. Yeah, this is quite uh, crucial because if the biofuel interacts with, uh, uh, with the food sector, so it could be uh, a problem is, uh, is postponed to the, uh, to the food sector uh, instead uh, to the CO2 uh, <coughs> emission mitigation. So we have to take care about uh, this, uh, uh, this issue. Then there was uh, another uh, question to, uh, to, um, to Ji Heun about uh, the um, systematic literature uh, review. Uh, can you answer to that question by uh, Mohmadiza Hashim? Okay, uh, so my short answer is that yes, you can say it's a systematic literature review. And the reason why I chose this topic was to share the general research trends and common results in the Korean Peninsula, since many of the research were written in Korean, so they were not available for the international audience. Okay, thank you. There is uh, another Q&A. Ah, Capucine, okay, thanks for the clear answer. So this is a, a thank you to the previous uh, uh, speaker. Um, okay. There's a question so. in the chat that might be aimed at all the panelists and maybe also to you, Roberto. Uh, what okay. are the most relevant keyword solutions today to respond to climate issues in the context of water resources? Oh, so it is a $1 million <laughs> question, <laughs> I, uh, I, I believe. Uh, so but I, I will leave the, the speakers uh, to raise hands uh, 
and uh, try to give their their answer first uh, so that we can uh, activate a debate and then i will uh, give also my my point of view okay is there anybody from the the speakers uh, willing to answer to this question in the chat what are the most relevant keywords or solutions today to respond to climate issues in the context of water resources? So if the, the audience um, is thinking about possible answer, I will give some of my uh, points, uh, points of view. So I believe that uh, uh, we, um, see the, uh, we have not much uh, to do from the water sector uh, with the mitigation measure. So mitigation measure to, to combat uh, uh, climate change uh, and global warming uh, have to be taken in, uh, in other sectors, so in the energy sector, in the population sector, in the economics uh, and, uh, and social uh, sciences. So mostly in the, in the water uh, sector, we can, uh, uh, we can uh, face the problem with uh, adaption or adaptation uh, measures. And uh, so some uh, some keywords. So I would uh, point the so focus the the attention on the uh, efficient use of water. So efficiency in the use of water could be a, a keyword. So uh, uh, so uh, <coughs> relevant. Uh, 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 issue. So the, the topic of uh, micro irrigation, uh, precision uh, uh, irrigation. Uh, so uh, use the water where it is needed and when uh, it is uh, needed. There is also a problem of uh, um, efficiency in the use of water at the the global uh, level. So if in some if some areas are uh, rich in water because of uh, the, the hydrological cycle there is, uh, uh, is, uh, is is very active so there is abundance of uh, uh, precipitation uh, also the the topic uh, of the so-called virtual water trade could be uh, could be considered so uh, producing uh, 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 food, uh, for instance, in, uh, in areas where there is a, uh, a lot of water, paying, of course, uh, a lot of uh, attention uh, in, the, in the impact uh, on the local uh, economy, on the local uh, society. Uh, then, um, yes, structural measures uh, cannot be, be ne neglected. So, uh, just for instance, in, uh, in this year, uh, finally, we, we tested uh, in a real case uh, 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 event uh, the, the, the Venice uh, Lagoon barriers, uh, which were constructed also to face uh, the sea level rise, uh, which was observed uh, in the lagoon of, uh, of Venice. And so at the end, one of the solution was the was structural uh, measures. But this is not the the only possible uh, solution. So uh, a combination of uh, structural measures and uh, non-structural ones, uh, I would say focused on the efficient use of uh, water in the right uh, place and uh, time. So this, in my opinion, uh, are the, the keywords uh, and the, the core uh, topics to be uh, addressed. Then uh, from uh, uh, Purnanjali Chandra, she, so you, you have the, the floor, you can uh, express uh, your point of view. 
so I just wanted to add that it is believed that climate change impacts affect the groundwater levels. It's even in India, we know that in certain parts of the country, the groundwater levels are declining at alarming rate. And uh, there, and it is interpreted that climate change does have an impact. So uh, what would be your take on that? I mean, is there, is there a way to, you know, address that or mitigate that? And if at all, then cannot that be addressed from the perspective of the water sector? Or does it require the management of a, re of a different resource sector? You need to unmute yourself. Sorry about that. Yes, also the, the use of groundwater is a, is a problem. I, I had several uh, uh, foreign students, for instance, from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, Iran, uh, and in several areas there, the exploitation of uh, groundwater is very, uh, very severe. And uh, uh, so again, in this case, uh, we must uh, um, protect uh, the, the groundwater resources uh, uh, with, uh, with an efficient use of this, uh, these resources. So you cannot uh, uh, pump uh, groundwater uh, storage uh, for irrigation of, uh, uh, <clears throat> of uh, water demanding crops. So you, you cannot uh, afford that. So there were very bad examples of exploitation of uh, groundwater uh, for generating generating cotton for instance in some uh, in some areas and this uh, caused a very severe uh, impact uh, on the existence of uh, lakes for instance uh, so um, some of you know uh, about the, the case studies i'm uh, mentioning probably and uh, this cannot be uh, any more uh, done. So the sort of re reduction of the exploitation of uh, groundwater with an efficient use uh, of, uh, uh, of water is uh, uh, is important. So uh, you uh, received a, a suggestion in our uh, climate change uh, uh, working group. Uh, I will write uh, to all the the panelist um, I can write so we we wrote uh, this um, this white paper which is a four pages uh, uh, document you can uh, browse uh, here this uh, PDF of this uh, document from the from the chat you can go on the the website of our technical committee about uh, climate change adaptation and you can see a summary, a very brief uh, uh, summary uh, about uh, the, the core topics uh, we believe in our community in IHR uh, are, are relevant to, <coughs> to, to approach uh, uh, climate change impact on, uh, on water and the, the adaptation uh, measures. So you are invited to go there to read that uh, document. And if you are interested in the topic discussed here, if you want to become next year IHR member, uh, so some ad advertisement here, uh, you can uh, select also the Climate Change Technical Committee as one of your preferred ones uh, so that we can uh, uh, continue the, the discussion and change of, uh, of ideas uh, uh, there. Because, uh, yes, ideas from uh, younger students are also very, uh, very relevant. So uh, we, we had uh, interesting uh, and innovative uh, uh, ideas uh, also uh, before. So for instance, from uh, Abdullah, uh, who pointed out the, the use uh, of uh, driftwood, for instance, uh, as a, a potential use uh, for uh, mitigation of CO2 uh, emission. So, so you are the generation uh, who will uh, 
probably uh, start to suffer more than our generation from the climate change uh, impact uh, on the water cycle. And, um, and so you have also to, to propose uh, uh, the, some solution together with uh, some hints from our generation. <laughs> Thank you. So there are still 15 minutes of, uh, of questions. So I pose a question to David, David Ferrars. So in your scenarios, in your future scenarios, um, you showed that with RCP 8.5, um, you have a 15% of increase in, in runoff, uh, if I'm not wrong. And for RCP 4.5, you have a, almost a 14% decrease of, uh, of runoff. Isn't it a little bit uh, strange for you that you have this uh, switch from a uh, decrease to an, an increase just because of the uh, forcing of the uh, energy forcing of the water cycle and did you uh, test uh, if uh, these scenarios are the same using different uh, global climate models and not uh, only a few ones so what is your opinion about that Uh, Roberto, sorry, uh, I, I, be, I believe the question is addressed. Ah, you are right, David. you are right. <laughs> sorry about that. I saw so it's, uh, David, David Yaranga, I No, you are right. It is uh, David Yaranga. Yes, yes, sorry, okay. sorry. No problem. Right. So the question is to David Yaranga, yes. Are you there, David? So I see here there is a David, in addition to David Ferras, who is a, an organizer, sorry about that. But I see that there is still a, a David, and I assume he's David Yaranga. Are you not there? Hello? Yes, yes. Yes. I posed a, a question about your your presentation. It uh, it seems to, it seemed to me that in your uh, scenarios so with the RCP eight point point five, you projected a, a an increase about fifteen percent or so of uh, of runoff. Instead, with RCP four point five, you project a fourteen percent decrease. So are you convinced about this uh, switch of uh, decrease and increase of, uh, of runoff? And uh, do you believe this, is, uh, this, this result can be confirmed if you analyze uh, many more global, climate, global situation models and global climate models? What's your opinion? Okay, uh, of the of the semips five models, um, yes. David? Are you still there? Mm. It seems we have uh, 
problems uh, to interact with uh, David uh, Yaranga. So I, I pose a question to Jiheun Kim. So you, you project instead both uh, an, an increase uh, and uh, uh, of, of both uh, runoff uh, and uh, precipitation. And uh, did you analyze uh, your, your evapotranspiration, your potential or effective uh, evapotranspiration uh, uh, scenarios? Uh, do they uh, increase uh, as, uh, as well? And are the changes of runoff, precipitation, uh, and uh, evapotranspiration consistent also with the observation from the last 20 years or, or not? Okay, I remember there was some research about the evapotranspiration and they tend to increase, but uh, there is not many of the number of the research. So yeah. It, it increased though. Okay, and uh, the, the verification of uh, QP and uh, evapotranspiration over the, uh, the data you have uh, uh, over the last uh, uh, 20 years. So are they consistent with the, uh, the global models uh, or not that much? Uh, um, I'm sorry, but I didn't really understand your question clearly. So can you tell me once so, again? So the, uh, the control run of your, your models of the, the global climate models can be uh, performed uh, by comparing uh, the, uh, the global uh, climate model uh, simulation over the last uh, 20 years uh, in both uh, uh, precipitation, uh, runoff, uh, and uh, evapotranspiration. So your, your verification uh, of the, in the control run of your models uh, was uh, consistent uh, with the data in both uh, uh, precipitation, runoff, uh, and uh, evapotranspiration data, or, or in your opinion, uh, there are still wide uncertainties. Was it clear, my question? Uh, yeah, um, I'm sorry, I, I really didn't understand. <laughs> sorry about my short English. Um, okay. No, I, I pose a, a simpler uh, question. Um, so you, you analyze a, a global yeah, uh, yeah. Climate model, global circulation model uh, output. And their output uh, is mainly precipitation, uh, but also uh, evapotranspiration. And you can compute uh, runoff. So the, the output uh, of, the, of these uh, global models uh, is uh, consistent, so is, uh, uh, is similar. So the results uh, are confirmed by the observations uh, over the last uh, 20 years in uh, precipitation, runoff, uh, and uh, evapotranspiration. So are you convinced that their output is uh, confirmed by the data observed? Mm. So maybe there are some uh, some problem. So I, I ask you while maybe David is thinking if you can show up your face because the the organizers would be uh, 
pleased and happy to keep track uh, of this uh, session. And uh, remember that, uh, yes, it was uh, virtual to some extent, but uh, there were really living people and not uh, robots uh, behind that. And so, <laughs> okay, so this is much better. Okay, this is much better. Abdullah, great. Ah, no. Cheng, Cheng Chen. Hey, hello, I'm here. Okay. Can you show up your face okay. so we take a screenshot? Okay, okay. Uh, okay. Okay, that's... Uh, Okay. That's enough. So in the so it is enough that the the speakers show up their their face, but also the guest. I see that there is Elpida. Ciao, Elpida. Ciao. Okay. So I believe that now. Hello, Roberto. Ciao, ciao. Now Estibaliz and David can take a screenshot. Is it fine? Okay, I just took the screenshot. Thanks. Okay, so the um, yes, in short time, uh, in just two minutes, uh, there will be the the session of water resources management. So I will give the the floor to to Elpida, who will uh, chair that uh, the session. And uh, yes, Omar wanted to to got some recommendation about your project but we are short in time because I would like to to give the the floor to to Elpida to manage uh, uh, her session so Omar uh, if you want to pose question you can write uh, to the organizers or write uh, uh, to me so thanks uh, everybody and uh, we we hope uh, to have uh, the opportunity to meet again uh, in, uh, in the real world uh, and not only on Zoom and, <laughs> and similar. Soon, okay, we cross the finger and uh, hope to meet again soon, possibly in, uh, in Granada at the IHR Congress uh, in June 2022. Okay, thank you, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you for bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks Thank everyone you. for giving your presentations. So in about two minutes, we start the next session. Okay. I think we are gathering together. I hope that everybody will get tuned because you know we have a lot of technical issues hoping that everything is okay hello everybody can you hear me yes good okay so eva we as all the chairs we should quit or we can stay here what you're welcome to stay if you like. <laughs> ah, okay, okay. We can stay here in this uh, yes. virtual room. Okay, okay. Okay. So if anyone who is a speaker hasn't joined the main room yet, please put a hand up so we can make you a panelist. Do you think that we will start? It's 
my clock is uh, five Greek time, five p.m. Greek time. So we have all the continents here. Huh? Almost everybody is here from everywhere. The difficult things, the difficult thing here in the webinars and in the web conferences is to match the time, you know. This is a critical issue, but okay. Uh, do you think we shall start or wait for a couple of minutes? Are we have, have is everyone here? I mean, everyone from the presenters, of course. I see that we are a lot of people, 95 participants, I can see. I think um, I am the first presenter, so yeah. if it's up to me, I, th I think I can start. I think that we can start. Okay, if we can start, I would like to say a few words. Mm -hmm. uh, the complexity and globalized economies, the climate change, the extreme hydrological events, uh, all these create a vulnerable context which in combination with the increasing population, the challenges of security of water supplies, uh, indicate that we must consider new approaches to planning and management of water resources. Um, the voc vocabulary of policy formulation, management and implementation entails fundamental changes and the consideration and commitment that uh, social engineering, economic and environmental problems are interrelated and must be integrated. Today, we will have the opportunity to hear the new contributions from the young professionals as uh, integrated water resources management is associated with a whole set of problems regarding the valuing, the governing and the allocation of water resources for the different uses. Therefore, as a chair of the uh, technical uh, committee on integrated water resources management of IAHR, I will uh, uh, welcome you here together with colleagues from the same committee, uh, Professor Carlos Calvao and Professor Philip Gubersville are part of this committee as well. And I would like to start by giving the floor to the first uh, presenter. It's, um, please, uh, I'm not sure for the spelling, but it's uh, Beatriz Negreiros from Brazil. And uh, she's going to present her work under the title Application of the Hydrological Model MGB IPH at the Cerebo River Basin. Okay, yes. thank you. You have uh, five minutes. And now, thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Alpida, for the short introduction. Um, so my name is Beatriz Negreiros. I am the public relations officer of the YPN um, of Baden-Württemberg in Germany. And today I'll be presenting um, an application case study of the hydrological model MGB IPH in a, in a river basin located in Brazil. It is located in the semi-arid northeastern region of Brazil. And um, MGB, well, MGB IPH stands for Model of Large Basins, an Institute of Hydraulic uh, Research, uh, which was developed in the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil. Well, besides the MGB IPH, there are many other hydrological models that are available in the scientific community now nowadays. Um, because hydrological modeling has the potential to aid um, water resources engineers in questions such as how, how um, can a river be dammed and where, 
And um, if um, a certain amount of water can be designated for a specific um, industry region, for example. And these questions are very important, particularly important in the, in the context of arid and semi-arid regions where water, so where, um, water shortage threats to threats the water security in general. And this is a case of the Seridal River Basin, um, which is uh, in our case study here presented. Um, it is located in the northeastern region of Brazil. And the basin comprises um, sort of approximately 10,000 meters squared, where the precipitation is very low and um, it is by, um, unfortunately highly variable in space. So the first step for the modeling consists of deriving the drainage area. And for that, we used the DEM, the G digital elevation model and a pre-processing software called IPH Hydro Tools. Then the basin was discretized in smaller objects called mini basins and sub basins. And finally, calibration was performed um, against observed discharge using observed and calculated hydrographs. And the most sensitive parameters were um, used in, the, in this calibration step, um, which were um, in the end, very similar to the physical characteristics of the, of the basin, um, because that's very important. We always need to vary the parameters according to the physical possible range. Um, then um, we calibrated our model and we got some results. Um, first of all, the what we noticed is that the model was able to reproduce the seasonality the, of the river basin. That means that I was able to differentiate between um, dry and rainy years. And um, that was a very, a, a very good um, aspect, but on the, at, the same side, at the same time, we also had problems with um, the overestimation of the discharges from the, from the part of the model. Um, and that was revealed through the visual assessment of the observed and calculated um, hydrographs, as you can see in the poster. Um, and we think that uh, the NS values, which were used for the calibration step, that means the NS values are the Nash Sutcliffe um, coefficients um, were not satisfactory. Um, we only obtained um, an adequate NS um, coefficient in one stream gauge station, and in the other two, um, we, uh, we obtained negative um, NS values, which means that the prediction was um, worse than the baseline um, prediction. And um, we think that one of the reasons for the low model performance is that we had um, many reservoirs um, which stored a lot of water, um, basically more than two, um, 250, uh, 100,000 um, meters uh, squared. And this accounts for a great um, uh, percentage of the total water that actually um, runs um, every year in these rivers because these rivers are ephemeral. And uh, we think that this, um, that the behavior of the basin was not able to be reproduced by the model because the model simply doesn't um, consider the reservoir operation in the, in the river basin. And um, furthermore, we also had um, challenges associated with the lack of sufficient data, which we think that it might be an additional reason why the calibration was hindered <laughs> As conclusion, we think that you um, need to, to hurry a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So, in conclusion, we think that the presence of the reservoir should be considered in in the future for the implementation of the MGB IPH model. Um, we also think that um, um, future research should um, focus on the automatic calibration using tools offered by the MGB IPH model, because um, that way. Um, the, the model can be correctly calibrated and um, possibly offer a very important tool, uh, management tool for the um, management of water resources in this um, so um, difficult and, 
and arid region of Brazil. Thank you very much. That was my, my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to proceed with the next presentation. Um, we have um, a presentation from uh, Russia, Ilias Begiev, under the title Flow Regulation by Water Reservoir for Irrigation Use. So the floor is to Ilias. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, uh, my name is uh, Ilyas Vilif. Uh, uh, I'm a postgraduate uh, student and uh, uh, at Russian Agricultural University. Uh, my scientific supervisor is uh, Professor Vitaly Linich. Uh, I would like uh, to represent our research. Uh, our research is devoted uh, to flow regulation uh, by water reservoir for rice plantation in the conditions of dry years. Uh, simulation of uh, water reservoir control is carrying out uh, with help of stochastic programming methods. Uh, the main aim uh, of the research is uh, decreasing of volume and uh, duration of the water deficits uh, for the rice periods uh, on the base of imitative uh, simulation of uh, water reservoir operation uh, with help of uh, stochastic programming. Uh, the next prob problem problems uh, were decided for achievement of the goal. Uh, adaptation and uh, development of the simulated mathematical uh, model for the irrigated water reservoir. Uh, modeling of uh, water reservoir storages uh, and uh, water drafts in the conditions of dry years. Uh, comparison results of the offered model uh, and of the existing model uh, for water reservoir regulation. Uh, uh, algorithm uh, for water reservoir control of uh, fair concessions and uh, the corresponded uh, uh, PC program uh, by name uh, IT uh, balance, uh, which uh, were uh, used for the search of effective rules uh, of runoff regulation by water reservoir. Uh, the mathematical recording of the task uh, can be seen on the slide. Uh, the Krasnodar water reservoir was chosen for the uh, uh, research. Uh, it is located on the North uh, uh, Caucasus. Uh, data about uh, runoff uh, to the reservoir uh, contain uh, daily discharges. Uh, simulative model for the reservoir control has been made uh, for the years of low water, uh, in particular uh, for 1994 year. Uh, according to the simulative model of uh, water reservoir, uh, we are determined uh, graph of water reservoir levels and uh, water consumption uh, and uh, water drafts uh, during year. Uh, then uh, the year sum of deficits, uh, most painted deficits uh, for the five day duration uh, period. Uh, amount of the uh, deficit pentads uh, were calculated. Uh, same characteristics uh, were determined uh, with help of uh, traditional uh, water reservoir control uh, according to a dispatcher graph realized by PC program. Uh, result are represented uh, table. Uh, they have showed uh, that all main characteristics of new model are better than uh, old model. Uh, the result of research uh, shown uh, that the model uh, is much more profitable than the old one, uh, but it works by the well-known flow hydrograph uh, to the reservoir. Uh, therefore, uh, the new model uh, may be useful for the decision uh, maker if short uh, term and uh, long term uh, flow forecasts uh, are available. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed for the time because you were very good on the time between three and five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, we will proceed to questions afterwards. That's why I go forth 
for the presentations. And um, I would like to call uh, Roni Araneda Cabrera from Ecuador to present the paper characterization of meteorological droughts in continental Ecuador during the period uh, one, uh, 1902, 2017. Hello, Ronnie, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, uh, hello. Yes, fine. Uh, okay, thank you. Hello, my name is Ronnie uh, from the University of Coruña in Spain. Uh, I am a PhD student and my thesis focuses on the study of droughts on a national scale. In this opportunity, I will share with you the field results on, of an exploratory research in my country of, of origin, Ecuador. Ecuador is in the South America, is in South America in the Equatorial zone. The Andes mountain chain div divided into three different uh, regions the coast, the Andes, and the Amazon region. They are extremely different in their geomorphological and hydrological characteristics, and their interactions result in high risk of drought, of drought in the country. Although, although efforts have been made in recent years to monitor hydrological uh, variables in the country, yet it is a region uh, with this case monitoring. For this region, uh, we have used the, cli the climate uh, database uh, of the climate research unit to extract precipitation and evapotranspiration uh, on a horizontal scale of 0.5 degrees. We have calculated the SPI for the time scales of 3, 6, 12, 36, and 48 months in order to analyze the drought in the different parts of the water cycle. Using clustering uh, techniques, we were able to regionalize, regionalize the country into homogeneous drought zones, which coincided uh, with the natural regions. As a first conclusion, we validated this database for using drought studies in Ecuador. The next step was to use the wrong theory to extract the main drought characteristics uh, of, both, of both the SPI series aggregated in each region and each of the cells. The analysis was performed of the period 1906 and 2017, and we compared the characteristic of droughts during the first and the second part of the time span. The results showed uh, an increase in the frequency, duration, intensity, and severity of drought events, especially in the coastal and Andean regions, where 90% uh, of the total population lives. In addition, these changes were more important for long-term SPI values, uh, which are associated with hydrological droughts. Therefore, groundwater sources or reservoirs could be more affected if this trend continues. Additionally, a drought characteristic was plot on drought maps over the, over the territory, allowing us to identify the exact uh, most prone drought areas in the country. In future studies, the aim is to study each zone and to analyze the specific effects of, of droughts on reservoirs and rivers. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ronnie, for your interesting presentation. And we move forward to another presentation um, under the title, um, water budget using regional hydrological modeling and GIS techniques in Peruvian Amazon case study in Yuraquiacu watershed mayor uh, river. And I ask uh, Victor Hugo Gallo Ramos uh, to take uh, the floor, please, from Peru. Hmm? Victor is here. Victor, I, I can see you, but uh, is Victor 
Hugo Gallo Ramos here with us? No? Maybe we uh, go to the next one and wait until uh, uh, Victor gets connected. This, I think this is a good idea. So let me uh, proceed to the next uh, presentation, which is uh, under the title Water Balance of the Estibana Subcatchments in Panama. And uh, I kindly ask Yuri Rodriguez from Panama to take the floor. Hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, my name is Suri Rodriguez and I'm from Panama. I'm going to present a little bit of the water balance of the Estibana subcashment in Panama. Uh, the Estibana subcashment has an area of 296 square kilometers and is located within the dry R region in South Central Panama. Uh, this region, the dry R, is very important in the country because it has uh, the lowest precipitation, high temperature, and uh, prolonged droughts. So it frequently uh, experiments a decrease in flow during the dry season, to be more specific, December uh, to April. In the case of the Tibana, there are reports of shallow wells and part of the river drying up. So for this reason, we had the interest to evaluate the current situation of the Tibana subcashment with a water balance for the 2018 to 2019 hydrological year. So in general, uh, for the methods, as you can see in the figure one, there is one input and four outputs. So the precipitation was calculated by a decent interpolation from five water stations. Uh, for the potential ET, we use uh, existing data from one station that, that it was calculated by the penman Montif method. The actual ET was calculated using the potential ET and FAO crop coefficient methods. So the runoff was calculated using uh, water level data from uh, the Stevana River. The infiltration was estimated by, based on soil type and hydraulic conductivity. Both were uh, collected by other students. For the water demand, we divide it into uh, human consumption, uh, agricultural water use plus livestock consumption. So also it was necessary to do some interviews uh, to compare with the theoretical data. Some main uh, results are that the precipitation is the only input to the water balance and highest amount occurring in June 2018. As you can see in the figure two, uh, which doesn't follow the historical pattern. The actual ET is the largest output and it correspond to 67% of the precipitation, which has been compared with uh, other studies in tropical regions. Total water demand amounts to only 1% uh, of the annual water availability. However, uh, doesn't mean it isn't important. There is an issue in the dry season. There is more water demand than the water availability. So for conclusion, the water, the water balance indicates that the dry season months uh, have deficit between supply and demand. A normal variation in precipitation due to climate change will, will uh, likely worsen this deficit in the future. So for that purpose, there is necessary uh, efficient water saving policies during the dry season. And this should be the first step to achieve water sustainability. Also, these policies should include uh, incentive for the use of different water sources and thus build the adequate infrastructure for water storage in order uh, to seek water security in the subcashment. So up to here is my presentation. Uh, before I want to thank to Dr. Uh, Fabrega for all the support and thanks for all your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Zuri, 
for your interesting presentation. Uh, just to ask, uh, is Victor Gallo Ramos from um, Peru, maybe is he in? No, okay. So we are going to proceed to um, another paper uh, from Poland under the title Evaluating Historical Drought Using Different Drought Indices and Data Processing Schemes. I would like to ask uh, Tesfa Belay uh, Senbeta. Yes, thank you. Yes, to uh, take the floor. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, Hello, everybody. Good morning. Good afternoon. Depend on the location where you are. Uh, my name is uh, Tazfaye Sambata. At, uh, I'm a PhD student at the uh, Polish Academy of Science in the Institute of uh, uh, Geophysics. The title of my presentation is Evaluating Historical Droughts Using uh, dif uh, Different Indices and the Data Processing Schemes. The main objective of the study is uh, to evaluate historical drought in the uh, Plitza River Basin in Poland uh, uh, during the past uh, uh, six decades since uh, 1951. And another uh, main objective in this study is uh, what are the uh, variations in the magnitude of the drought intensity under different data uh, processing schemes. The data used uh, in this uh, study is uh, meteorological uh, data from uh, nine different stations within the catchment area and the surrounding uh, areas are pre processed and the missing data are filled using uh, uh, normal ratio methods uh, uh, before we use uh, for uh, the analysis. Uh, the drought indices that are selected are for the meteorological drought, uh, standardized precipitation index, which use uh, precipitation as an input, uh, and effective reconnaissance droughts, which use uh, effective rainfall and the potential evapotranspiration and as input is used for determining uh, agricultural uh, drought. And uh, lastly, for investigating hydrological droughts, the stream flow record uh, at the outlet of the catchment area is considered for determining uh, a drought in a given uh, uh, catchment areas. Uh, for the data processing, we considered that I, I considered two different uh, methods. First, calculating indices at individual meteorological stations, especially for the meteorological drought and the agricultural drought assessment. Then the, the indices calculated at individual meteorological station is uh, weighted by using Tyson polygon over the whole catchment areas to know what are the the, average, the, the, the mean impact on the whole the catchment. And the other one is the, the reverse of this. Initially, the input data is pre-processed and the, the weighted uh, average over the area is calculated then using a single uh, input data, the, the drought index are calculated and they compare the result. So as you see in the, the, the uh, figure one is uh, the evolution of historical uh, drought that is uh, meteorological, uh, agricultural, and uh, which is calculated on the 12 main time scales. And as a lower one is uh, the, to compare for one of the indices that is a standardized precipitation index uh, to, uh, to see what type of impact they have when you use different data schematization schemes for the standardized precipitation index. 
So in the results, in both of uh, the, the at different times, uh, the historical uh, from 1951 up to 2019, uh, each decade, uh, the, the intensity of the uh, meteorological drought as well as uh, agricultural drought are relatively uh, okay within the same time period. But uh, there is a different uh, from uh, decade to decade. Uh, hydrological drought, which is uh, mostly the longest hydrological drought, which occur in the uh, basin, is uh, in the late 1918 and the early 1990. And uh, finally, when you compare the frequency of droughts, uh, especially more droughts uh, occur since 2005, uh, frequency of drought is higher than as a relatively the other uh, period in the case of uh, hydrological drought. Uh, comparing the two data processing schemes, um, almost uh, the two results are the same, but uh, to know the spatial variation over the catchment areas, uh, determining at individual station is more better to know uh, uh, at uh, the spatial variation of uh, drought over the catchment areas. Thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Beta. Okay. Thank you very much for your interesting presentation. Uh, uh, in the chat, um, Victor tell us that he has some uh, problems with uh, Tech, some technical problems with the Zoom. I don't know if, ah, now he, I can see him. Okay. Hello, Victor. Yes, hi. We can all see, see you now. So you can proceed with your presentation. Okay, uh, uh, sorry. Then no, pro uh, no problem. Before to start, uh, I, I see my voice. It's okay? Okay, uh, so the, trying the to show my title, screen. The title of the presentation that Victor is going to present is Water Budget Using the Regional Hydrological Modeling and GIS Techniques in Peruvian Amazon, a case study in Uracraku Watershed Mayor River. Victor, oh, the floor is okay. yours. Thank you. I am trying to show my screen. Okay. Thank you. And so I I start, uh, before this to start, I see my watch. Um, sorry. Okay. You Hi everyone. Five minutes. Thanks for this opportunity. Uh, we we'd welcome from my side to this presentation of the poster on water sources. I will give a short presentation about this research. Uh, the title is Water budget using regional hydrological modeling and GIS techniques in Peruvian Amazon, case study and Yuragyaku watershed. And the objective of the work was to estimate uh, flow, flood water availability proposed in Yuragyaku watershed. And the main problem we faced uh, was positive, uh, the positive information. Um, the question here is what kind of information? Uh, mainly topography and hydrometeorological data. And as you can see in the image, and, and, and this is the Mayo Basin. Its altitudinal range from 200 to 4,000 meters and sea level. And the station are an, an available distribute, uh, covering areas of 200 to uh, 1 meters or sea level. And with important parts of the basin without hydrometeorological measurements. And so we designed the cartographic information using ALOS and Sentinel image, and then determine the physiographic parameters. Um, but first, we use um, QGIS uh, for watershed delineation. And so hydrological regionalization allowed the relationship of of physiographic parameters with hydrological variables um, by, by obtaining potential relation models of precipitation, temperature, and evapotranspiration. 
Um, runoff was determined using the water balance. Uh, monthly flows were simulated for the period uh, 1989 to uh, 2015 by a stochastic deterministic model of Lucioles, and which was modified for Peruvian Amazon areas. Uh, the importance of the watershed is that 70% of the area belongs to the Alto Mayo forest. It is a natural area protected um, by Peruvian government. In table one, uh, we can see the main characteristics that, we, that have been determined, the physiographic parameters and, hydro, and hydrometeorological variables uh, using these regional equations. And the flows what obtained of Florida Gauhin Station for the 2001 to 2010. And from the simulated flops, we select the same period to determine the uh, efficiency metrics, uh, which were acceptable. Um, finally, some conclusions uh, are uh, regional models can quantify mesh, uh, mean balance of hydrometeorological variables involves in the water bathhead with an error of 3%, and which is acceptable in regional studies and can be used in similar uh, hydrological regions. And of the results, it was observed that 50% of the precipitate volume is generated in the attitudinal region of 1,600 uh, to 2,100 uh, meters on sea level. And on the other side, our results show high robustness in regional hydrological modeling and to produce a stream flow in terms of Kilian Gupta and Nash efficiency, uh, acceptable. Uh, well, uh, before I finish, uh, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Katerin Camacho, who is co-author of this work. Uh, uh, she is in the room. Uh, also, of course, uh, Dr. Walter Gomez Lora uh, for this important contribution to the realization of this work. Uh, um, I would like to share uh, a final message with you, and that is, uh, who's not Jesus are never alone. And thank you, uh, everyone, for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Victor. Uh, I would like to proceed with the next presentation from China. Uh, we'll ask uh, Lei Yu to take the floor to give us uh, the presentation uh, under the title Multi-Objective op Optimal Operational Cascade Hydropower Plants Based on Water Energy Nexus uh, Water Footprint Approach. Dear Lei Yu, are you? Hello, hello. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 I. I, uh, I, I cannot hear you. Yeah. Uh, see you. I cannot. Ah. Uh, okay, okay. okay. I see you now. I see you now. Okay. Uh, okay. You have okay, the floor. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm, okay. Oh, okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Yu Lei, and I come from Nanjing Hydraulic Research in Institute from China. Today. The title of my presentation is Matter of Objective for All Optimal Operation of uh, Cascade Hydro Power Plants Beside uh, What Energy Nexus, a uh, What Footprint uh, Approach. As we know, hydro power is a king composed of uh, What Energy Nexus, which can meet the energy demand and uh, mitigate the greenhouse effort. The paper construction uh, operation model for cascade hydro power plants can steadily water footprint and uh, quantify the trend of relation between power generation and uh, water cons consumption. The first, the first method leads this study in improving the right right power water footprint uh, and uh, hydro power electricity water footprint uh, to e evaluate the consumption of water by hydro power for cascade hydro power plants. 
Also, this paper can construct an uh, optimal operation model for cascade hydro power plants and uh, uses NSJ2 to structure this model. From this picture, uh, the, the first is the basic data, and then water, 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 print cal cal calculation, and uh, this one includes the calculation of uh, right flower water footprint and uh, hydro e e electricity what WF. Okay, uh, the metal objective. Oh, 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 sorry, uh, the our objective of functions include the maximum cascade plants uh, and uh, manual right, right, right flower what the friend creator of uh, cascade high power plants uh, and the sj2 is uh, improved to shuffle this model uh, this picture is the uh, Pyoto all play set of uh, solutions on the Sennelius S1 and S2 in a normal year. Um, from here, we can see the turning point and the axis, axis is the right forward water footprint of a cascade hydro power plants and the y, y axis is the power, power generation of a Cascade hydro power plants. Uh, the uh, the skin two is the operate skin from the what energy I've lost him. I don't know. Uh, uh, okay, okay. I'm sorry. Ah, okay. So, okay. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, and uh, let's continue. Uh, the thing two is the uh, all op all gain from the water water energy nexus beside on the water fault plane approach. Uh, the the con the con Con conclusions. Uh, the conclusion, the, the following conclusion I draw for this people, paper. Uh, the the first one. Uh, okay. The first one, the skin two is the operation skin from the water energy nexus from both to sunless in a normal year, and the. the and uh, there are clean trial tra offer between high power generation and uh, water consumption. Family, uh, this is a study is a con continuing and uh, maybe and the results and the conclusion may be uh, questionable. Uh, that, that's all, thank you. <laughs> Hello? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Louis. Uh, we go forth to um, the next presentation from uh, Jean Grand Liu under the title Introduce Canopy Temperature to Evaluate Actual Evapotranspiration of Green Peppers Using Optimized NN, uh, ENN Models. Uh, Yangram Liu, the floor is yours. I 
Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Can you speak a little bit more louder, please? Oh, good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to give a presentation here. My name is Jin Ran Liu. I'm from Handan, Hebei University of Engineering, China. The topic of my presentation is modding actual effect transformation, ET, using optimized ENN methods. The high pressure areas of water resources in China are mainly distributed in North China. Irrigation waters accounting for nearly 70% of fresh water has been over exploited and overused in many areas, leading to the water is becoming one of shortage resources in the world. It is particularly important to forecast CT in order to alleviate the shortage of fresh water resources. This is a diagram of a partial straw film, watching viral rich rainfall harvesting and regulated the, uh, deficit trip irrigation system, MFR RDI, in three papers. As an example, the soil water balance methods was used to determine ET, canopy temperature TC, leaf areas index, and plant health were measured. Milan neural networks optimized by GA and the MIT evolutionary uh, algorithm MEA in performance uh, evaluation. RMSE, MAE, and NX were used to evaluate the model performance. Here are the results of our study. First, MFR RDI can provide more suitable for crop growth of soil temperature and maintain high soil moisture content for crop growth. It can improve water using efficiency. Second, the TC was closely related to air temperature, and the air temperature was closely related to ET. The TC can well improve the accuracy of both MEA ELAM and GA ELAM models. Third, the MEA ELAM model was better than the GA ELAM model when the same areas were input. First, Selecting different input variables in different growth stages of crops, MEA ELAM4, played a positive role to improve the accuracy of ET prediction. The fitting below is the, fit, uh, is the fitting relation diagram of MEA ELAM4 models, predicted value and measured value. You can see that. The prediction was good. Our, close, uh, our conclusion are uh, as follows. One, MFR RDI can improve water use efficiency. Two, TC could be used as one of the important to predict CT. Three, in case of the same input factors, the MEA ELAM models was, general, uh, was generally better than the GA ELAM model. Four different factors were selected as input variables for different growth periods to predict CT of crops, and the predict effect was good. This research paper has been accepted by Journal of Hydrology. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. for your contribution to this session. Last but not least, we have um, here uh, Ivan Harris Dayang from Philippines to give us his uh, presentation on uh, deeper departmentalization as a tool for world governance in the Philippines, a policy issue here. Uh, Ivan, it's 
floor is yours. Um, thank you so much. Um, a pleasant evening to all of you from Manila. Um, it's already um, midnight here and almost midnight here. Can you speak a little bit louder so that we can hear you, just oh, sorry, if possible? Sorry. sorry. Can you speak a little bit louder? <clears throat> can you hear me? Hello? That's better. Okay, thank you. Um, so thank you. a pleasant evening to all of you uh, from Manila. Um, today I'll be talking about departmentalization as a tool for water governance in the Philippines. And as you may know, departmentalization is the process of um, converting a, um, a con converting a certain office into, a, into an actual government department as a branch of the executive uh, department inside the government. The prospects of departmentalizing a water uh, office here in the Philippines was uh, initiated back in 2018 when um, when the country faced a series of uh, water shortages as a result of the overlapping functions and responsibilities amongst uh, different government agencies in the overall water distribution. In so far as the Philippine context is concerned, there are uh, four main government agencies that focus on water distribution, which are the National Irrigation Administration, which focuses on distributing water on farmlands, uh, the Local Water Utilities Administration, which focuses on uh, distributing water to local government units, the Metropolitan Water Works Sewerage System, which provides water to Metropolitan Manila, the National Capital Region, and the National Water Resources Board, which overlooks the quality of water in all of these areas. So the context of water govern governance in the Philippines started off when President Marcos, during his time, uh, initiated the Provincial Waters Act as a result of uh, massively in the, uh, uh, distributing waters to the uh, to the villages and provinces in nearby metropolitan Manila. But this was later on instituted as the local wat waters utilities administration was established during his time in which uh, local government units were given the power to uh, manage their own waters without the necessary need pro from the central government to overlook uh, overlook some of the processes that involves water distribution. Uh, some of the problems that, uh, that uh, some of the problems uh, in the water governance sector in the Philippines includes the water privatization, as well as the, um, as well as the outdated water infrastructure in the Philippines, as some of our dams and watersheds were uh, were built during the Marcos regime, and that was in the 1970s, 1980s. Some of this water infrastructure were even uh, loaned to some, of, were even loaned from some of the uh, uh, biggest international banks, such as the IMF and World Bank, which up to this day, uh, the Filipinos are still paying for it. So during this uh, process, uh, I, I, I thought that if it's, if it, really, if it is really economically viable to departmentalize uh, water structure. Um, so, uh, so I compared some of the, um, some of the countries, uh, in, uh, in this case, 162 countries, some of which has a water department or water agency, which are 78. Um, so the essay, this essay looks whether the creation of the water department enhances the level of efficiency of its water resource management across the country. And I do not include the state regulatory agencies and autonomous bodies present in these countries. So as I mentioned, uh, I have focused one, I have looked into 162 countries, 73 of which ha, has a cabinet level water agency 
And the statistical method that I use is the fixed effects correlation, analyzing the parameters effects within and across the countries evaluated in the list using R as my statistical software. So some of these parameters that I have looked are the water accessibility, the level of water-related assistance received from, um, from development agencies, and the level of permanent water bodies extent. So the results. First, water is distributed not because providers considered it as a right, but rather as an essential need. That is, um, providers are just giving water because people need it, not because, not because leaders think it is a right. So conclusions of uh, the benefits of departmentalizing uh, water governance, or at least in the case of the Philippines, one, it improves the level of water accessibility significantly. Two, it streamlines the managerial and financial costs of water demand allocation. And three, it encourages for a multi-sectoral participation in the overall water development initiative. Take note, however, that in this uh, research, I only look in the case of Philippines as different countries has, has their own uh, uh, has their own narrative in respect to their uh, state of water governance. Therefore, um, conclusively, uh, conclusively uh, thinking as de departmentalizing as a solution to uh, streamline the problems of water governance in uh, different countries is not a catch-all solution to all uh, problems plaguing their state of water governance in different countries. So that's my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ivan, for a very interesting presentation. We came to the end of the first part of this session. We've heard uh, very interesting uh, presentations uh, from uh, everywhere, I mean, in the world, from hydrology, from uh, extreme events, uh, engineering, um, policy issues, uh, all the span of water resources management and engineering stuff. Uh, I think that uh, since it's almost uh, five o'clock, we may take a breath and then proceed to questions on the next part of the session where I would uh, in kindly invite my colleague, David Wagner, maybe to start the next session at uh, five, if he wants to, or any, any other person from the group, from the mentors to take the floor for the next session. Rita, Philip, Carlos, just David, and anyone, because I think it would be better yes. to change roles. Yes, I, we, I will be happy to start the next section. session. Good, good. That's fine. I will be there as well. But uh, I think we can take a, a two minute breath and proceed to the next session, okay? Thank you very much all for your contribution and for participation. Feel free to uh, write questions and we'll be again in two minutes together, all together. Thank you. Thank you very much, all of you.
not done. David, uh, you can yeah. click on uh, on the video. I did, and it doesn't seem to say it just. Oops. But there is a um, an option. If we if we if you click on the arrow, there is a, an option that is select a, a virtual background. No, mine says same as system or integrated webcam. Those are the two options. It pops up when I hit the arrow. It does not have the virtual that you refer to. I'm sorry. I don't know why this is different than yours. Yeah, I just did it again. It doesn't make a difference. It says select a camera is all it says. There's no video configuration or advanced settings or something like that? No, nope. it, it just says select a camera is all it says. Okay. So I don't know how to fix that. You let me know when you want to start. I think you can start. Should we start now? Yes. Okay. So first off, I would like to welcome everyone back to this session. Um, secondly, I would like to congratulate each of our young presenters today. Um, I am in the United States in the West, so it's morning here, early morning here, but I know we are all um, coming from different parts of the world. So uh, I appreciate everyone's attention. For those who are up late or getting up early uh, to, to be here today to listen to our young presenters. There's two things that I have heard this morning uh, that I, has struck me as the importance of why we have these, these sessions. The first is, is that globally we're now seeing extreme rates of hydrologic variability. That's represented in both too much water, and, and we're getting floods and, and storm events, and too little water, where we're seeing excessive drought conditions. And I think what's important about a lot of the research we've heard about today is that our young students and engineers and academicians are working hard to try to capture this variability in their various approaches and assessments. The second element is that I think it's important that we as a society and as a uh, group of researchers, engineers, and scientists understand that we have to find ways to communicate and work together to share information and in what I call connect the dots between the science and decision makers. In the United States, we spend a great deal of time trying to ensure that public policy is based on science. Um, that comes with certain challenges about whether entities will believe in science or not. I think it's our job to make people believe in them. So what I would like to do is to let everyone know that you can ask questions either on the bottom of your screen, you'll see a, 
question and ac action answer box or the chat box. And what I will attempt to do is to um, identify the questions they come up. And unless they are specifically addressed to a specific presenter, I will um, attempt to just put them out there for the group to speak at large. Before I go any further, I guess I would like to ask if any of our fellow mentors would like to say a few words um, before we begin with the questions. No? Okay. Um, the one question that, I, that we have, the first question is, can you clarify the main difference between catchment and basin? And specifically, I think what the, the, the individual would like to know is, can you articulate how you're defining the catchments or the basins? And I would also put into that watersheds. Does any one of our presenters wish to, to discuss that? I think that um, uh, normally basins are larger and uh, are more used for the United States because in European, use more catchment. Okay. And how about watersheds? Are those the same as a catchment or a basin? <laughs> we all use different terminology, I know. <laughs> Do any of our, our young presenters wish to answer that question? Okay. Then another question that has come up is as the precipitation is getting highly variable through seasons and years due to climatic changes, what models could be best fit for the data on precipitation to understand changes and effects on groundwater recharge? Does anyone have a perspective on that? Do any of the other mentors online want to address that, that question? Hmm. I hope people are hearing these. Okay. Well, in lieu of anyone actually um, wanting to take that on, I will ask a question. And it would be to our last speaker, um, and specifically Yvonne, um, I am interested in if it, what, in, after doing your research, was there one thing you, if there was one thing you could do to increase water accessibility in the Philippines, what would that be? That would, hello, hello. Yes, okay. I hear you. Um, uh, the screen has frozen, so, okay. In the Philippines. The Hello? political institutions here in the Philippines. Because as I mentioned, there are a lot of government agencies that whose tasks are similar, uh, whose tasks are uh, similar to that of another. So I think. Who, uh, fully. Uh, Nope, I seem to have lost you, sir. Are you there? Up oh, there you are, but I can't hear you. Well, thank you for trying. <laughs> Seems like we've lost you. I'll just so what I would like to oh, box. Okay. Thank you. Um, 
I would like to ask if any of the presenters have questions that they would like to pose to their other presenters. So we give everyone a chance to ask questions. No? Okay. Dave? Go Dave, ahead. Can, can you hear me? Here's yes, Carlos. Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Carlos, uh, welcome. My connection is uh, quite unstable. So, but I, I think I, I would like to, to talk to Singh. That puts okay. the question on groundwater and climate variability and change. Uh, Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Singh, uh, we, we were used to parameter, parameterize the groundwater and other hydrological models as climate uh, would be stable, unchangeable over time, including seasonal variability as well. In regions where we have high variability, intra-year variability, and considering uh, long-term climate changes, we have to have the parameters of the models adaptable. And sometimes we can have multi-models running for each, uh, let's say, cycle or mode of variability. And we can also construct, generate uh, an envelope of scenarios in the long term to base, to, to how to say, to limit, to involve uh, our management options. So we have to get acquainted to a new world where we, we need to adjust continuously uh, the parameters of our models to consider the changing variability of climate. I'm, I'm not sure if I, I was clear enough to answer your questions. Thank you. From my perspective, um, having worked with a lot of hydrologic models, is that they were historically developed around a set of assumptions and sensitivity. And what I, I believe is happening now as with climate change is that the variability is increased substantially between the highs and the lows and the frequencies and the durations. And that many of our historic models don't accurately capture that the sensitivity that I believe we're going to need in the future as we attempt to manage our water resources. And what struck me from several of our presenters this morning is that I, I got the sense that they are trying to find ways to improve the quality of the models through specific sensitivity analysis, uncertainty assessments, and looking for ways that these models can be modified to be more effective in the world we're finding ourselves in now. And I don't know, I, I, I guess I would pose that to our presenters. Are there, is that a correct assumption? Is that where your research is going? Is it trying to make our models more robust? Or are we just trying to look at what's traditionally been used and assume it will be applicable to a future um, hydrologic scenario. Perhaps uh, the young lady who presented from Panama, I was particularly struck by your, your uh, presentation and whether that was something you were considering. Zuri, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you repeat the question, please? 
the question we were chatting about the models that are being used to predict hydrologic variability in respect to water supply. There are many historic models that have been developed over the years that were based on a set of assumptions that didn't necessarily capture variability and that your presentation in particular struck me as you're trying to capture some of that variability in your, in your model, in your analysis. And I'm just wondering whether that is a correct, is a correct conclusion on my part, that you're, you're trying to find the sensitivity in the model to help more accurately reflect what's going on, in your case, in Panama, in the watershed. So uh, one of our limitations are that we are only considered one year uh, of the water balance. So in that year, we have that variability, but uh, we don't know the historical, uh, the historical relation of the water the supply and the demand or the, the uh, availab availability. So we also see the, we also uh, can compare the availability with the precipitation because we had the, the historical data, but we don't have uh, the historical data for all the variables of the water balance. So uh, we don't know, uh, that is one of uh, our limitation. And, but in that year, uh, we see that, uh, uh, variability in the water demand and the, and the supply. Okay. So in the one year you selected, was it a tip, in your opinion, a typical year, an average year, or was it Hydro on one? Hydrolog other? Hydrological year. Was okay. On a, yes. Okay. And is your watershed affected by changes such as um, logging, or development or um, other well, agricultural perhaps? Is that, is that watershed affected by that? I think uh, yes, but in the dry season. And uh, also we don't, uh, we have a, like um, a problem with the uh, evapotrans actual evapotranspiration. And I want to ask, you or other mentors about it uh, because uh, knowing that the evapotranspiration is a complex uh, variable in the water balance, which aspect uh, did you, uh, do you recommend to, at the time of the an analyze that variable in the water balance? Do any of my fellow mentors want to answer that question? I don't hear many coming forth. I will, from my perspective, and that's a very good question because it's critical to making accurate assessments, is that you need to begin with a, what I would call a sensitivity analysis to see how, how much variability exists within that particular catchment. And even though you might not have a large amount of data, you can probably get a sense of looking at the information of surrounding areas to give you a sense of, of how much you need to build in, how much robustness you need to build into your model. Um, in many, and I would just characterize in certain parts of the Eastern United States where there is a lot of forests and a lot of um, land, we don't have as much variability in precipitation you come to the western part of the United States, we have an extreme amount of precipitation variability from snow to rain to, to no, no water at all. So in, in the west, the models, the western parts of the United States where it's much drier, but much more variable, you have to have more sensitivity built into your models to be accurate, to reflect accuracy. Um, versus the east, you don't have to have quite as much variability built in. So it, I think it varies on the catchments you look you're working on. Okay. Thank you. Answer your question. 
I would also like to pose that question if our, our Russian colleague is still online. Um, Ilyas, I would like to know, th does the historic data that you have access to accurately reflect the conditions that exist in the river system you were and the reservoir system you were looking at? And is it prudent to use that data to predict future operational schemes or regimes? Ilias, are you still online with us? I think he's not. He's not, okay. Um, let me see, we've got about eight minutes left. Um, how about our gentle, our person from Ecuador? Rani Ar Araneda Cabrera, and I'm sorry if I've mispronounced the name. I no? Okay. How about our uh, Victor from uh, Peru? No. Oh, he had some problems with the with the microphone. Okay. Clear. Well, I, I'm going. What? Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Who is who is talking? I, I think Victor is still here, but I'm not sure if he can talk. Oh, okay. Um, is our gentleman, as our presenter from um, Li Yu here? Looks like gone somehow. Maybe some people have internet problems. Uh, Maybe so. Okay. Maybe so. I, I'm, gonna, I'm not sure. How about, how about Tess, Tess Faye from Poland? Yes, I'm here. Okay, well, I am going to ask you a question, sir, if you don't mind. Okay. What would you recommend to include in an uncertainty analysis that would assist or help the study that you did? Are there certain things that you would, you think need to be done to understand uncertainty and robustness of the system you're dealing with? Yeah, what I do think is uh, to include uh, different uh, indices, which can able to calculate so that uh, the uncertainty band, uh, which uh, uh, different uh, indices or models have their own uh, advantage and that are different in structures. So the, uh, to include on multiple indices, uh, that can able to serve for the same uh, objective uh, can include the uncertainty within the, uh, the... Okay, very good. Well, one of the things that struck me about your study, sir, was that you identified three different types of drought. You identified meteorological drought, agricultural drought, and hydrologic drought. I think I got those correctly. Yeah. Of those three different types, is there one that seems to predominate in your analysis? In other words, do you see uh, more meteorological droughts, hydrologic droughts, or agricultural droughts? Uh, not much, but uh, there is a, uh, especially the, in the early before in a, the 2000, before, 2000, I think in the 18th and the 19th, more of uh, the met, uh, meteorological and agricultural drought, but there is a less uh, uh, hydrological drought than that in the 70s. And the, uh, but the, the, the magnitude is different in the early, the, 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 the intensity is different, varies. And the time also rate of change, uh, the, Changed from, uh, I think, the, due to propagation, but uh, relatively the others, meteorological uh, dominate uh, that of the uh, meteorological and agricultural drought dominate that of uh, uh, hydrological drought. Okay, so meteor. Uh, what I think I heard you say is meteorological drought is probably the first, the highest um, impacting of the types of droughts. 
Is yeah, they are the, the, the by, uh, agricultural or the soil moisture and the relatively the, the, the response is very immediate as uh, we can easily see than that of the hydrological, uh, in uh, okay. hydrological drought is very, in some time you can find a lot of uh, meteorological drought, but you can't find hydrological drought within uh, uh, the areas. Okay, thank you for that for that answer. We have just a couple of minutes left in our time, our presentation time. Um, is there any one of the other mentors who are online that would like to um, say anything? I, I've kind of monopolized this, and I'm sorry for that. Okay, may I do a question to Beatrice? Uh, okay. Because um, uh, she said that uh, the she identified the the problem of reservoirs to the to the model to be more accurate. Uh, I would like to know what um, she's thinking to improve, or if she's uh, wanting to validate some some minor models for, for such a ponds or such a reservoirs to include in the in the global model. Hi, thank you for the question, Rita. Um, I think it's a major aspect that we need to um, think about in the future, especially for semi-arid regions where the reservoir operation has a big impact in the overall water balance. So one possibility that I think we need to think about in our research is to prepare a plugin for the um, MGB, uh, MGB um, IPH model that can be probably programmed in C++. Um, but our main, I would say our main challenge is that even if we do and program such a plugin, we don't have information about the reservoir operation. So we don't know the specific and um, accurate water levels and um, the temporal um, resolution of those water levels in the reservoirs. And that is a bigger, a big challenge because even if we can program um, such a plugin, uh, we also have um, lack of sufficient data. Thank you, Beatrice. Mm -hmm. I believe we're at the end of our time, and I would like to personally thank all of our presenters this morning. You've done a great job. You're doing great research. Keep it up. Use your mentors and all of us to help help your career continue to move forward. So Elsa, I think we're at the end of our time, at least by my clock here. Um, and I wanna thank you Elsa for helping make this possible. Thank you, David. I would like to remind to all the participants that we will have the keynote lecture starting uh, just now on global water security and sustainable development goals with Angelo Spindikakis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for your participation and the fruitful uh, discussion. Hello, Angelos. <laughs> A big thank you to all the mentors and all the speakers in this session. Thank you for your mentoring. Thank you very much. OK. Going. Th thank you very much for the speakers and mentors and chairs of this session. So uh, now we can move to the next session, which is the keynote lecture. So it's been quite a, an intense day, no? almost 50 poster presentations and uh, very interesting discussions after, after every session. Um, I, I would like to mention maybe the, the words uh, from Tom Su, the IHR director, who said, it is great to feel the enthusiasm of the young, young presenters participating in the sessions. Also with your uh, uh, questions, you made some of the coffee breaks very lively. And, a special thanks, of course, uh, to the chairs who provide such contract, constructive and didactic feedback uh, to the participants. Okay, so now it's time to introduce the, uh, the next speaker, who is Angelos Findikakis. He's a senior principal engineer investor with more than 40 years of working experience uh, in, um, in the sector. He's strongly involved with IHR Association, is an honorary member of the association and editor of the Hydrolink uh, magazine. And he's also the IHR liaison to UN Water. 
in addition, he has uh, always keen interest to give advice to young professionals. And today he will, he will be speaking uh, on uh, global water security and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So, Angelos, uh, you may feel free to start sharing your screen and the floor is yours. So, okay, thank you, thank you, David. Uh, first of all, I would like uh, to thank uh, the committee of organizing this uh, very unique event, this uh, first uh, young uh, professional uh, network uh, congress, and uh, which is uh, very exciting. And uh, I hope that uh, <clears throat> everybody is staying safe, uh, that you are all wearing your mask and keep a safe distance which is very important these days for us uh, to, to survive this, uh, this pandemic. <clears throat> so with that, I would like to start uh, sharing my screen and give me a minute here to make sure that uh, I get it uh, right. And share. And uh, can, uh, can you all see my screen? Yes. Hello? You can see my screen, okay? Yes, we can, can go ahead, Angelo. Okay, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so the, the subject of uh, my talk is uh, global water security and the sustainable development goals. And uh, I would like to give you <clears throat> an overview of um, what I'm going to cover. <clears throat> As uh, you probably know, um, the term water security has been used quite extensively the last few years. So I would like to start uh, with uh, <clears throat> trying to define how we'll use it in, uh, in this talk, and especially talk about how the different scales that uh, we can apply water security from ranging all the way from uh, local issues to global water security. And uh, <clears throat> for this purpose, we'll uh, very briefly look at some uh, global challenges, uh, all related uh, to water, either directly or indirectly. And uh, <clears throat> finally, we'll talk about uh, <clears throat> what uh, are the steps towards uh, achieving global water security, which involves, of course, ways to assess where we are by using metrics and uh, <clears throat> what we can do to raise awareness about it. Now, water security is very closely related to sustainable development and I'll explain uh, the connection that I see. So, so I think it's important to <clears throat> take a very quick look as to <clears throat> where we are and uh, basically after 40 years, um, probably I think, I guess it's uh, uh, since the introduction of uh, <clears throat> the wide and the wide, the wide use of the term uh, <clears throat> uh, sustainable development and how we got where we are today, where we have <clears throat> a specific sustainable development goals and uh, some specifically direct or indirectly directly related to water and some of them indirectly related to water. And finally, I'm going to talk about the UN water program that uh, <clears throat> IHR joined a couple of years ago as a partner. And what are the, some of the specific contributions that IHR has done to the program and to the effort to achieve the SDGs. So let's start with uh, uh, the term water security, which uh, in uh, in uh, a few years ago, probably more than 20 years ago, uh, it was uh, used as a way to indicate the basically uninterrupted water supply in sufficient quantity and quality in order to meet the needs of a specific uh, community, uh, whether it is a country or a region, <clears throat> and in some cases of other specific units like an industry or a specific uh, facility. <clears throat> now, over, over the years, the term uh, took, uh, uh, started including uh, other aspects related to water management, like, uh, for example, the sustainability of uh, water resources development and management, 
the protection of uh, water systems and uh, also protection from some uh, <coughs> uh, disasters or extreme uh, caused by extreme event, extreme hydrologic events like uh, floods and droughts. <coughs> Because of uh, some confusion in uh, <clears throat> the use of the term, uh, the UN came with uh, <clears throat> a sort of uh, formal definition uh, which was used to facilitate the work of uh, different uh, agencies uh, working across uh, <clears throat> the UN system, so they all uh, use a common language. And uh, as uh, you can see there on this slide, this definition is uh, fairly broad. It refers to the capacity of the population to safeguard sustainable access to adequate quantities of acceptable quality water for sustaining livelihoods, human well being, and socioeconomic development for ensuring protection against water bomb pollution and water related disasters and for preserving ecosystems in a climate of peace and political stability. So, this, this is quite uh, quite comprehensive, as you see, <laughs> it includes many issues. And I think most of these uh, issues that are uh, included in this definition, we'll see them later appearing in the Sustainable Development Goals of Agenda 2030 that uh, we're going to talk um, about very shortly. <clears throat> so uh, to set out the scene, uh, the relationship between uh, water security see is that water security is our goal and sustainable development basically provides us the way to get there to achieve this goal. So we need to keep this connection in mind as uh, we go through the rest of this talk. <clears throat> now uh, we shouldn't forget that uh, the term uh, water security has been used in an narrow sense in uh, many circumstances and I think that this should us. Uh, for example, after the <clears throat> uh, terrorist attacks of um, September 11, uh, 2001, in uh, the United States, water security primarily meant the protection of uh, water supplies against the potential terrorist uh, at, uh, act or, or vandalism that uh, could disrupt uh, our water supply. <clears throat> Uh, in other contexts, for example, in uh, countries like Egypt that depend very heavily on a single uh, water resource, uh, water security there is uh, synonymous with uh, basically the continuing use of uh, the waters of the River Nile. <clears throat> and finally, many industries have talked about water security, and there they refer to the <clears throat> uh, uninterrupted uh, water supply so they can keep going with uh, their uh, operations uh, normally. <clears throat> so these are some uh, narrower definitions of uh, uh, the term water security, but again, uh, what uh, we'll be working on is the broader definition that uh, we just talked about uh, <clears throat> a little while. <clears throat> now, Let's uh, think about the scale of water security because we're talking about global water security and we need to understand what we mean and how we got there. And uh, if we look at the evolution of uh, the concept of water security over time, uh, if we go back in history, uh, we all know, of course, that uh, some of the very early civilizations all <coughs> uh, flourished uh, near uh, reliable water supply supply sources, which were major rivers. So we have <clears throat> the development of some of the early civilizations along the <clears throat> River Nile in Egypt, uh, along the banks of the Tigris and the Euphrates in Mesopotamia. Uh, same thing in the Indus River Valley and <clears throat> in the Huanghe Valley in uh, China. <clears throat> uh, over the years though, has, uh, especially in modern times, as uh, engineering and construction methods uh, advanced, it was possible to construct uh, large uh, water infrastructure like dams uh, to store water and uh, <clears throat> long uh, conveyance uh, uh, canals and other facilities. So we start seeing the <clears throat> 
development of major water transfer projects and uh, uh, two of uh, probably the largest examples that come to mind is the transfer of um, water from uh, <clears throat> the north of California to the south uh, with uh, the state water project that uh, was developed more than 50 years ago. <clears throat> and of course, more recently in China, we have the uh, water transfer projects from south to north with the three branches between uh, primarily the two major rivers, the <coughs> Yangtze and the Huanghe or Yellow River. Uh, now, moving on now with the increase of global water trade and especially as we started understanding the <coughs> concept of uh, virtual water, which is basically water that is needed to produce any specific product, we can see that as global uh, <coughs> trade uh, increased, we have uh, the concept of virtual water trade, which uh, sort of represents in essence the transfer of water from uh, between different countries and between, uh, between continents. And uh, so this basically helps us see the issue of water security as, as, a, global, as a global problem. <clears throat> and of course, what uh, <clears throat> make this uh, possible is international cooperation, so the solidarity between, uh, supported by organizations like uh, the United Nations and uh, different other international cooperation methods. <clears throat> so, in order to put things in perspective, we need to consider some of the global challenges that, uh, that we faced. And uh, first, in the area of water, uh, as uh, probably most of us know, uh, based on the most recent data, which happened about two, three years ago, because there is always a lack, of course, between uh, it takes time to compile and collect data. But uh, based on this data, more than two billion uh, people uh, seem to lack uh, um, access to safely managed uh, drinking water sources. And as the result of this, uh, <clears throat> Several hundred million people die every year from waterborne diseases like uh, diarrhea. <clears throat> Closely related to this is, of course, the lack of sanitation, which uh, estimated to affect more than four billion people uh, around the world. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> the problems of, of course, water supply uh, are exaggerated by climate change which uh, affects uh, uh, water resources uh, through prolonged periods of uh, drought, but also, of course, creates uh, challenges because uh, <clears throat> causes extreme events like uh, more uh, <clears throat> intense um, floods that uh, affect uh, a very large number of people. Again, one estimate is that uh, <clears throat> more than 2 billion people uh, worldwide uh, were affected <clears throat> by, by floods over the last um, 20 years. <clears throat> and another estimate is that uh, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, droughts uh, leading to more intense water scarcity uh, may displace uh, several hundred people by the year 2030. <clears throat> There are several other global challenges that we need to keep in mind that are directly or indirectly related to water issues. And of course, a major issue is uh, the population growth, which uh, is estimated to add uh, 2 billion people uh, to the world population by the year 2050. <clears throat> and of course, there is a quite uneven uh, <clears throat> growth rate between uh, different parts of the world. And unfortunately, of course, population grows faster in areas that are more challenged by, uh, by water. <clears throat> and as you see here, the chart here <clears throat> uh, on this uh, slide shows uh, 
trends in, um, in population, in the population growth rate. Uh, and globally, it's been going down over the last uh, 50 years. But uh, as you see, the red uh, <coughs> curve uh, at the top of all the other curves, which represents uh, <coughs> the population growth rate in low income tri countries, seems to be steady and seems to be somewhere in the range between two and a half and three percent, which basically means that uh, <coughs> the population of these countries doubles uh, every. 25 to 28 uh, years, which is, of course, uh, exacerbates the issue of <clears throat> access to, to safe uh, drinking water in these areas. Another trend that uh, <clears throat> also poses a challenge to water supply is uh, the rapid uh, <clears throat> rate of urbanization with an estimate that uh, by the year 2050, 68% of the world population will live in, in large cities. <clears throat> Economic growth, of course, uh, increases the pressure on water because uh, we need uh, more water to produce the different goods that go with economic growth. And uh, a major need is in food production, uh, which again, uh, one estimate of uh, <clears throat> the <clears throat> Um, what is by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations uh, put the need to increase food production to 70% between the years 2007 and 2050. And of course, uh, food production depends uh, primarily on, on water. <clears throat> and uh, one more pressure factor is the change in diets as uh, <clears throat> the <clears throat> standard of living in many parts of the world is rising. It seems like more people tend to eat more meat. And of course, the production of meat requires much more water than the production of products that support a vegetarian diet. <laughs> uh, also, with all that, let's keep in mind that uh, <clears throat> Most people live in dry areas. This, uh, this slide here shows uh, <clears throat> a, an index that uh, helps characterize the dryness of different uh, parts of the world using a dryness index, which is, uh, <clears throat> was defined uh, as uh, the ratio of the mean annual radiation to the mean annual precipitation, which was normalized by the latent heat of urbanization to make this ratio dimensionless. And as uh, you can see here, the lower part of the slide shows the <clears throat> uh, fraction of the population that lives in different areas uh, characterized by different rises index. And as you see, most people live in areas that are more than half of basically the world population lives in areas that are relatively right to quite uh, quite uh, dry. So this again is another another global challenge that we face as we look into the water in the future. So what uh, are the steps towards achieving global water security? So first, we need to know where we are. So we need an assessment of uh, the present situation through the use of different metrics, indicators, indices, etc. Uh, then uh, it's important to raise awareness, uh, develop solutions, uh, and of course, demand policy changes too that will help uh, implement this say, solutions and uh, by introducing new, new policies. <coughs> So let's uh, take a very quick look at uh, some examples of metrics of uh, water security. Here in this slide, uh, we have uh, <clears throat> a national water security index uh, developed <clears throat> uh, in a study for the Asian Development Bank. And uh, this, uh, <clears throat> this index basically uh, consists of uh, four defined, the na defined national security basically as the composite of uh, five uh, <clears throat> uh, 
uh, indicators. One is uh, characterizes household water security. Uh, another uh, water security for cities, for the environment, for the economy, and finally, and the last component was uh, related to the resilience uh, to water <coughs> related uh, disasters. <coughs> And uh, as an example of this, we can take a closer look at uh, one of these uh, indices, uh, the Household Water Security Index, index which uh, <clears throat> was basically the composite of three indicators. One, the percentage of uh, households having a piped water supply. Uh, the second was uh, an indicator of uh, the percentage, basically the percentage of households with improved sanitation. And finally, <clears throat> a, a hygiene indicator, which uh, represented basically the sort of the years of life lost plus years lived with disability due to diarrhea. And uh, as you see, this was applied to all the countries in Asia. And here are the results summarized by <coughs> a region. And you see the difference between uh, different parts of Asia and how they do in each of these uh, <coughs> in this indicators. Uh, like, uh, <coughs> uh, for example, there are quite, there's quite a difference between, for example, East Asia and South Asia. Uh, in terms of uh, all three indicators. <coughs> now, the other side of it is, of course, besides uh, <coughs> assessing the present situation, is raising awareness about it. And the, we've seen several efforts by different uh, bodies uh, over the last few years. Uh, for example, different national academies have raised the issues. One uh, uh, major study focusing on uh, global water security was uh, produced by the <coughs> UK Royal Academy of Engineering in uh, 2010. And in fact, uh, Professor <coughs> Roger Falconer, who is a member of this academy and was the past president of IHR, brought uh, IHR attention to, to this study. But uh, besides this, we have uh, Many popular publications uh, like uh, the National Geographic have uh, devoted uh, special issues on uh, this, uh, on the subject of, of water. And of course, for, uh, the United Nations brought attention to the subject of water security. In uh, 2013, they published an analytical brief on water security, which in fact <clears throat> introduced the working definition of water security that I mentioned in the beginning of this talk. <laughs> now, <clears throat> IHR has uh, tried to contribute to raise awareness about uh, global uh, water security. And uh, one major contribution in this direction was uh, <clears throat> a forum on global water security that was held uh, during the it's our World Congress in 2013. And for this event, uh, again, uh, Roger Falconer, the IHR president at the time, invited the presidents of uh, several, uh, se seven uh, international water associations, which included ICOL, the ICD, uh, the World Council of Engineers, IWRA, IHS, and they all signed a declaration on water security. The text of this declaration is available on the IHR website. And basically, <clears throat> this declaration was calling for joint action of the associations in the areas of policy, education, research, and practice. <clears throat> uh, in addition to that, IHR has a working group on global water security. Uh, which I believe that some of you may be familiar with. Uh, this group was recently revitalized and is currently under the leadership of uh, Roger Falconer and <coughs> Arthur Minot. <coughs> now, in uh, the past efforts, both by HR and others, uh, 
Uh, two concepts that have been used to raise awareness about um, water security are the concepts of virtual water and the water footprint. And uh, <clears throat> uh, these concepts can be used to sort of dramatize the importance in the, um, of water and the amount of water that is used to produce different <clears throat> consumer goods. And here is an example that uh, has been shown several times, I guess, in different presentations, which basically illustrates that in order to uh, produce a pair of jeans, you need uh, more than 10 uh, cubic meters of, of water. Now, of course, where different products uh, are produced and what uh, are the <clears throat> materials is very important. And uh, as uh, you can see in this slide, again, stick and stain with uh, cotton, which is uh, basically what is used to produce uh, blue jeans. Uh, there is a big difference on how much water is needed to produce one kilogram of cotton. <clears throat> around the world. And of course, this uh, primary factor is uh, <clears throat> climatic conditions. In very dry uh, parts of the world, if you use uh, irrigation water to produce cotton, of course, you need much more water because of high rates of evaporation and dry conditions than in other parts of the world. And you see there that uh, if you go from couple of countries in Central Asia to down to China and the United States, there is a difference of a factor of, by a factor of <clears throat> five or six in the amount of water needed to produce one kilogram of cotton. And of course, this uh, has uh, the intense uh, production of uh, cotton in some parts of the world had a devastating effect on the environment as is uh, shown in these uh, <clears throat> slides here, in these um, satellite images here on the right uh, part of the slide that uh, show the impact uh, of, on the RLC of uh, the irrigation and uh, expansion uh, to support the <clears throat> intensification of cotton production uh, in this area. <clears throat> by using basically practically all the waters of the Sir Daria and the Amudaria rivers that uh, in the past were feeding the, the RLC. <coughs> uh, and uh, again, the global, the global importance of, of this can be seen in this slide that shows the <coughs> uh, virtual water that is traded uh, between different countries and Europe. Uh, and you see that, uh, for example, if you take the, <clears throat> the very thick arrow that starts from Central Asia and pointing towards Europe, you see there in, uh, in the circle on this uh, arrow that uh, practically almost 3 billion cubic meters of water, in essence, of virtual water was transferred from this area to Europe, which of course <clears throat> was at the expense of uh, environmental conditions in, in, this, uh, in this area. So the concept of, uh, again, of virtual water, as it's illustrated here, uh, can help understand the importance of uh, global water security. <clears throat> So moving on, uh, we said in the beginning that uh, <clears throat> global water security is uh, the goal, but uh, <clears throat> the way to get there is sustainable development. So let's take a very brief look into <clears throat> the major mile, into some major milestones in uh, the promotion of the concept of sustainable development over the last 40 years. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, the first uh, <clears throat> uh, introduction of the term sustainable development and its definition was in the Broadmoor Report uh, in uh, 1987. This was the report by the World Commission on the Environment and Development of the United Nations, 
led by the former <clears throat> Prime Minister of uh, Norway, Harlan Brundtland, and uh, which was followed five years later by the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro that uh, developed a, a global action plan for sustainable development that was uh, referred to as Agenda 21. And later in the year 2000, the UN uh, <clears throat> set uh, some ambitious goals, the so-called Millennium Development Goals uh, for the next uh, 15 years. Uh, 20 years after uh, the Rio de Janeiro uh, Earth Summit, there was a Rio Plus 20 uh, conference which didn't produce any substantive outcome. But in uh, 2015, uh, at the end of the period of the Millennium Development Goals, uh, the UN adopted Agenda 2030, which set the Sustainable Development Goals for the next uh, 15 years. And we're going to talk more about those uh, shortly. <clears throat> So Agenda 21 uh, in, uh, covered a broad, a broad range of uh, topics, but included several, several uh, specific um, recommendations for to protect the quality and supply of freshwater resources, uh, and uh, including the efficient allocation and equitable allocation of. Uh, of, of water, the provision for enhanced access to sanitation services, and several recommendations for specific institutional, legal, and management reforms. Uh, a few years later, the Millennium Development Goals were quite specific, uh, and uh, they covered a broad range of subjects from poverty, hunger, gender equality, uh, improve, uh, improvements uh, you know, or reduction of child mortality, maternal mortality, environmental sustainability, and specific goals for <coughs> access to safe drinking water and improved sanitation, uh, basically setting as a goal to reduce by half the percentage of people that uh, had uh, that were lacking access to safe drinking water and improved sanitation, <clears throat> and uh, these goals, the the, the uh, safe drinking water and sanitation goals, were basically uh, defined in terms of uh, levels uh, that were. <clears throat> 1990, so in essence, basically, the goal was to reduce to by half the percentage of people uh, lacking access to safe drinking water sanitation relative to 1990. And as you can see here, this goal was achieved in uh, uh, for drinking water, but not for sanitation. <clears throat> and here again, this uh, slide gives a little more information about uh, the progress between 1990 and 2015. And as you can see here at the top, the goal for drinking water was achieved, but the goal for um, sanitation was not. And uh, even though the, the goal for safe drinking water was achieved globally, there are significant disparities between different uh, parts of the world and uh, as you can see here, <clears throat> this slide shows progress between 1990 and 2015 in different parts of the world. And as you can see here on the left, in Sub-Saharan Africa, of course, <clears throat> progress has been much slower and we're far away from <clears throat> reaching the goal, the Millennium Development Goal. <clears throat> and uh, the same thing was, goes from some other parts of the world like Oceania, and here on the right, you, you have basically a grouping of the least developed countries, the developing countries, and the developed regions of the world. And you see there is a big difference in terms of <clears throat> the disparity between these regions in terms of uh, reaching the safe drinking water goal. <clears throat> so this was these were the Millennium Development Goals. Now, in uh, 2015, at the end of the 
period for the Millennium Development Goals, the UN uh, adopted uh, Agenda 2030 with uh, <clears throat> 17 Sustainable Development Goals, which were more comprehensive, have had some very specific targets, uh, namely 169 targets in all. <clears throat> the <clears throat> Many of these goals were uh, related to water. Of course, uh, SDG 6 was specific for clean water and sanitation. But as you can see here, I have highlighted several of other goals that are also directly or indirectly related to water. And for this purpose, we, we devoted the issue of HydroLink on uh, the water-related sustainable development goals uh, back in September 2017. Now, I have to move a little faster here because uh, we are getting, uh, we're more than half, uh, past the half point of this talk. So, um, as I said, uh, SDG 6 had several specific targets, which included, uh, of course, Drinking water for all. This is different than the Millennium Development Goals, which was, which were aiming basically at cutting the percent of people to half. Here we're talking about universal access to safe drinking water, and the same thing goes for sanitation, which is target 6.2. Uh, the third target of SDG 6 was to <clears throat> improve water quality by reducing pollution and uh, reduce the proportion of untreated wastewater by, by half. <clears throat> also, another target was to improve substantially uh, water use efficiency across all sectors, especially irrigation. Uh, integrated water resources management was another uh, of the targets of uh, SDG 6. And uh, <clears throat> finally, <clears throat> we have a target to protect and restore water-related ecosystems. And, and the very last uh, two targets are related to international cooperation and capacity building uh, for in support of uh, <clears throat> achieving the other targets of uh, SDG 6 and also supporting and uh, strengthening participation of local communities in uh, in management. <clears throat> now, this, uh, the effort to achieve this goal is led by the UN Water Program, whose primary purpose is to coordinate the work of the different uh, <clears throat> United Nations organizations that carry out water and sanitation programs. And it works to inform policy, uh, monitor and report progress towards the SDGs, and inspire action uh, through different campaigns like uh, the World Water Day, uh, which is every year on March 22nd, and the World Toilet Day uh, for sanitation, which is <clears throat> basically coming in, uh, in a couple of days on November 19th. <clears throat> uh, the UN Water Program has uh, as members uh, more than uh, 30 United Nations agencies, including the UN Environment Program, uh, UNESCO, FAO, IFAD, uh, UNICEF, and many, many others. And also it has a number of partners, which are different international organizations and associations, including IHR and several other water associations like <clears throat> Uh, IWA, IWRA, the International Association of Hydrogeologists, the World Water Fund, and, and, and many others. <clears throat> the UN Water Program uh, also works with a number of expert groups and task forces, and members of um, the UN agencies and also its partners can be <clears throat> members of this, any of these groups. And, and again, if any IHR members are interested in joining any of these groups, we can uh, request that and uh, facilitate their joining that uh, any of these particular groups. <clears throat> now, a major, a major <clears throat> mission of uh, UN Water is to, uh, of course, uh, <clears throat> help achieve SDG 6 
And part of it is the integrated monitoring of progress towards this. And this, uh, the monitoring has been distributed between different uh, <clears throat> partnerships. Uh, and one of them is JEMI, the Global Environmental Monitoring Initiative that uh, primarily focuses on <clears throat> water resources management ecosystems and uh, water use and scarcity and uh, while the <clears throat> progress towards drinking water and sanitation and hygiene is uh, monitored by the joint monitoring program for water supply and sanitation which again involves different <clears throat> un agencies <clears throat> now <clears throat> to monitor progress uh, towards the specific targets of ADD6. Uh, UN Water defines specific indicators, uh, like for example, for uh, access to <coughs> safe drinking water, uh, is simply the proportion of population that has uh, such access. The same thing for, for sanitation, uh, for, uh, for example, for <clears throat> uh, target, uh, for the third target is the proportion of uh, water that is uh, safely treated and also the proportion of bodies of water that uh, have uh, good ambient quality and again they specify what they mean by good ambient quality and, and so forth. <clears throat> the same thing goes for all the other goals. There are specific, specific metrics, uh, specific that are monitored in order to assess progress towards achieving this goal. <clears throat> now, uh, last year, the UN Water launched uh, <clears throat> a, a data portal, which uh, can, is uh, available online and can be accessed through the link at the bottom of this uh, screen. And uh, if you go there, uh, you can uh, <clears throat> choose to view maps, or tables uh, providing specific data. Here is, this is, for example, is a snapshot from one information that I got from this portal uh, yesterday. And you see this is, uh, these are data on indicator 6.1, which is the percent of uh, the proportion of uh, people using safely uh, managed uh, water supplies. And as you can see here, there are many parts of the world that are gray, which is basically indicates that data are not available. This, these are again the most recent data, which I think are based, uh, these are data for <clears throat> 2017. And uh, so getting data from individual countries is a major uh, challenge because UN Water doesn't collect the data itself. It, it depends on the countries to collect the data and report them. And so this is a challenge for this and several of the other indicators. Here is uh, uh, another indicator that is a little easier defined, which is the freshwater withdrawal as proportion of available water resources. This indicator 6.41. And again, data for this are more readily available. Uh, here is another indicator, which is <clears throat> the degree of integrated water resources management. And again, this is uh, <clears throat> defined on a scale from zero to 100. And again, they, they have set specific criteria as to how you run, you place the different countries on this, uh, on this uh, scale. Now, in order to, because again, of uh, data are coming slowly, and uh, in many cases, we don't know exactly where we are, the U U UN Water introduced uh, an, accelerate, an effort to accelerate progress towards meeting these uh, challenges. And uh, one initiative in this context was the International Decade for Action which is again included specific actions and <clears throat> now <clears throat> UN Water is in the process of preparing for a mid-term conference review in 2013 which will be the midpoint of the 2018 to 2028 20, period and uh, earlier this year also it launched the global acceleration framework which includes increased support to individual countries 
in five areas or five uh, accelerators, as they call them. <clears throat> and this includes financing, uh, improved data information collection, capacity development, innovation, and governance. <clears throat> now, let's take a very quick look before we finish on how IHR has been contributing to UN Water. <clears throat> First of all, as I said, IHR joined uh, UN Water as a partner uh, about two years ago. And uh, since then, I uh, participated in uh, <clears throat> a sem the semi-annual meetings of the UN Water uh, in 2019 and 2020. Uh, this year, the first meeting in January was before the pandemic was in person. Uh, the second main meeting in, uh, at the end of uh, September was uh, <clears throat> virtual. <clears throat> We have also contributed uh, several individual uh, members and IHR committees have contributed to the 2020 World Water Development Report, which uh, whose theme was on climate, uh, climate change. And also we are working to contribute to the 2021 World Water Development Report uh, you know, on valuing water and the 2022 report, which will be focused on groundwater. <clears throat> also, uh, we organized a special event to celebrate, to cel celebrate uh, World Water Day. Uh, this event was held, it was virtual because of the pandemic and we celebrated on uh, March uh, 21st of this year. And I believe that this is uh, this included uh, talks by several IHR members, and uh, it's uh, it's available. I think it's still available on our website. It was recorded and still available. And also, more recently, <coughs> we led the preparation of a white paper on the role of engineers in the effort to achieve SDG six, and this uh, will uh, be formally released uh, uh, shortly. <coughs> So with that, I would like to offer some uh, <clears throat> final thoughts. And uh, as uh, you see and you understand, the SDGs are very ambitious goals. And uh, we don't know whether we'll actually be able to meet them by 2030, because uh, progress in uh, some parts of the world has been slow. And of course, also the reporting and the assessment of progress is also slow. But uh, meeting, them, meeting them will be a challenge, but uh, definitely by working towards uh, achieving them will uh, bring us closer to <coughs> global water security. <coughs> and in, in this uh, effort, IHR has a role to play. Uh, since we are a social engineering association, we can help direct research to topics that are important uh, for the SDGs. Uh, we can facilitate the transfer of uh, research findings to practice, which is very important because of course, uh, research for its own sake is not of any value. And uh, finally, we can raise awareness uh, and especially inform policy on major water issues and support the capacity building in parts of the world where this is needed. <clears throat> so with that, I would like to stop here and uh, I would like to entertain any questions, if there are any. Thank you very much, Angelo, for this insightful keynote lecture, um, supported by so much uh, consistent and solid data. Uh, so we have a few minutes for uh, questions. Mm, maybe I can, uh, I see that in the Q&A box there is already one question from uh, Bill. Uh, considering mining industry is a high water production industry in countries as Australia, South Africa, Canada, Peru, worldwide, and knowing this industry implies considerable use of water, what are the methods this industry is looking for to optimize the use of water in their installations? We're talking about, <clears throat> maybe we need to clarify, when we're talking about water industry, means water providers, water supply yeah, providers. Uh, 
then he, he well, he clarified actually his question with a second question, stating that uh, my question is focused to the management of tailings to be more specific. Okay, so yeah, I guess he, he, he refers to these uh, huge tailing dams that uh, we can find in the mining industry. So what, what, uh, what is the management of the water content in these tailing dams? Is, is it being reused? Is it, what are the, um, the approaches to improve its management? I believe the question is oriented to that. Yeah, this is a major issue, and as uh, you probably know, in the last few years we had a uh, <clears throat> couple of, uh, maybe more, more, more than a couple of uh, incidents of uh, <clears throat> failures of tailings dams with uh, catastrophic uh, consequences for uh, the people uh, <clears throat> living downstream and the environment. <clears throat> So, so this is this is this is the, yeah this is an issue of importance. I think that the industry, the, the mining industry, is doing two things to deal with that. <clears throat> Besides, of course, more uh, safe, following safer practices for the construction of tailing dams. First, <clears throat> they are trying to reduce the amount of water in tailings by trying to figure out how to recycle water and reuse some of this water. And so reduction of the water content in, uh, in uh, disposed tailings is one part of it. The other part of the equation, which is uh, very important for <coughs> countries uh, where <coughs> facing uh, limited water supplies, and I think this is especially true in Chile, which uh, where mining uh, ha is happening uh, in some very dry areas up in the Andes. And there the industry is exploring ways of basically <clears throat> dry processing of the ore without the need for large quantities of water, which will result basically in uh, the problem of uh, <clears throat> uh, water tailings disposal that um, uh, was mentioned earlier. So, so these two areas, one is of course the reduction of the amount of water in these post ailings is one. And the other, the other effort I think is in the direction of uh, dry processing of oil. Okay, thank you very much. This was an interesting question and also with an interesting answer. Um, are there any other questions for Angelos? Of course, I, I invite also the, not only the attendees, but also the panelists, the hosts, they are free to, uh, to, to ask questions. In the meantime, maybe, maybe I have also a couple of questions. Um, yeah, one of your closing thoughts uh, that you mentioned uh, is, um, how challenging is meeting these um, SDG uh, goals and that every step we do moves, moves us closer to, to meeting these goals. But I wonder if uh, COVID has moved us further instead of, of course, closer. And if this global health uh, economic crisis we're facing now will affect the targets uh, specified in the Agenda 2030. Yeah, the first part of your question uh, um, definitely has, uh, of course, COVID has uh, <clears throat> an impact on face-to-face uh, -face meetings and uh, communications. Uh, on the other hand, there may be a sort of silver lining, as I say, like a positive uh, unexpected result, which is that uh, we all have learned how to <clears throat> collaborate uh, remotely uh, which uh, I think uh, makes it easier to reach uh, people who cannot travel very easily. And uh, like, uh, like, for example, like uh, today's event that is virtual um, gave the opportunity for, to people around the world who, who may not otherwise have been able to attend this event if this event was an in-person event in, one uh, part of the world, <clears throat> because usually you, you get people from close to that location coming in, but people from remote locations from other continents, for example, is more difficult and quite expensive to travel, especially for, uh, for younger people. So, so I think that uh, the fact that uh, 
COVID has helped us learn to work more collaboratively virtually, maybe a positive, a positive, a positive effect. Uh, and uh, what was the second part of your question, uh, David? Well, it was uh, uh, a bit uh, oh, redundant related. No, if uh, if the uh, current health crisis will affect the 2030 agenda, if it will have to be postponed yeah. or. Uh, I, 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 as far as I know, there is there are no so far there are no plans to delay. I think we need to continue. Hopefully, we have of course we have another ten years to go till uh, 2030, and hopefully, in uh, uh, from what I hear, and maybe two years, uh, we'll be back uh, to close to normal, especially after. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, vaccines become available and which obviously will help <clears throat> uh, control the, the spread of uh, COVID. So, so at this point, uh, there are no plans to, to delay the implementation of the 2030 agenda. And uh, I think that uh, maybe this can be a motivation to redouble the efforts. And, uh, and I think that, uh, again, as I said earlier, IHR can play a role. And, and again, the experience with uh, virtual connections, I think, can help us connect with uh, areas where IHR has not been very, uh, has not been very active. Uh, like, <clears throat> I know that, David, you, you, you are working with others on uh, how to expand IHR's uh, efforts in Africa. And I think that, again, the virtual connections can help us in that respect. <clears throat> yes, I fully agree. Um, well, in any crisis, I guess there are some uh, positive side effects, no? And in this case, working virtually is definitely this uh, positive side effect. And maybe we, we would have not come up with this idea of organizing such events without COVID. So yeah, we, we have sure. to acknowledge this, this part. Um, mm -hmm. OK. So there is another question in the Q&A um, from Fakar. Is regarding water consumption by irrigation sector in Pakistan. Irrigation consumes more than 90% here. Any tips for better management? Yeah, I think that uh, the, remember I mentioned that one, one of the <clears throat> targets for SDG 6 is to include, increase water use efficiency and, uh, and I think that uh, this definitely applies to um, irrigation uh, because irrigation, as you know, is the largest water use around the world, maybe 70 to 80% of uh, water used goes to irrigation. And in countries like uh, Pakistan <clears throat> is even, even higher than that. <clears throat> so I think that there are, there are two, two areas, two directions there. One is to use water more efficiently, del deliver water more efficiently to the plants, which is basically <clears throat> something that uh, <clears throat> in countries uh, like uh, Israel, they have uh, perfected it through drip irrigation or, or other, <clears throat> other irrigation, irrigation methods that again, deliver the water closer to where it's needed instead of <clears throat> wasting a lot of water either through evaporation in the air or in parts of the soil where it's not needed. So this is one, one area, water use efficiency. And I think that there may be innovations there that uh, uh, hydraulic engineers can, uh, can, can contribute to. Of course, the other direction comes from uh, the development of uh, crops that are more resistant to drought. So they need, uh, they need less water and there is progress in that, uh, that direction too. So these two directions, more efficient delivery of water to the crops, the development of drought resistant uh, crops uh, are probably what uh, we hope to see in, uh, in the years ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Um, then there is a question from uh, Joseph. Uh, is the government or even the water utilities must be compromised with the with this uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals? I'm sorry, what, what must be compromised? Uh, I think he, he refers to if they have to be um, compromised, engaged, formally engaged to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. 
at the level, first he's asking at the level of governments, but if we can scale down to the level of water utilities. Uh, I don't fully understand the question. <clears throat> uh, I guess uh, what I would say is that the goals apply basically to, in order to meet the goals, basically, everybody has to work together. <clears throat> of course, governments play a major role because they set policies, development policies, uh, infrastructure development policies, uh, which includes water infrastructure, uh, agricultural uh, policies, which are very important and affect, of course, as we said, but because of irrigation is the largest consumer of water. So governments play a major role, but, but <clears throat> individual utilities or industries also within their own workspace can play a major role by again increasing the efficiency of water use, reducing waste and maximizing water use through recycling. I don't know if this answers his question. You may want to ask him if, uh, if he wants to follow up. Yeah, maybe uh, if you want to clarify your question, uh, Joseph, or if you are happy already with uh, the answer of, from Angelos. I have a question as well, and that would be uh, for our young professionals attending today. So when you talk about the SDGs, in the water sector, it's all about like interlinked systems and networks, etc. So, what's your top tip for like an individual engineer in an engineering firm, or for an individual young researcher to take all of this into consideration? Uh, well, I would say that uh, first at the personal level. Uh, in whatever a young uh, researcher or engineer is doing uh, can uh, <clears throat> keep this in mind, basically. Because so so sometimes you, 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 I know that uh, having gone through the process of uh, working for a doctoral dissertation myself many years ago, I know that you're focusing on a topic that you know will get funding and uh, sometimes it's sort of like, um, uh, very complicated, very elaborate topic, sometimes uh, what we call esoteric, very esoteric topic. But, but I think that uh, we shouldn't forget that uh, <clears throat> whatever all the research is of no value if it doesn't serve a specific purpose, uh, and especially if it doesn't help, uh, if it doesn't help uh, others. I mean, uh, otherwise it becomes, a, you know, an intellectual exercise that it's just for our own pleasure without uh, in satisfaction, without uh, benefiting anybody else. So I would advise that uh, young researchers uh, to keep that in mind and see the question basically, what is the purpose of the research they're doing? And if they have an opportunity to influence the, the direction of this research, to something that will end up addressing a practical problem, especially a problem that helps others around the world. I think that this is very important because we shouldn't be working in isolation, like in a laboratory or in an office without, <clears throat> you know, ignoring basically everybody else. So, so we need to make sure that we are part of a larger world and that uh, we should do our best to, to serve our fellow fellow humans around the world. So, so I think the, the, this, would be, this would be my advice to, 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 young, to young researchers. And of course, for practice and engineers, keep that in mind, whether you work in the industry. You know, some, <clears throat> some industries in the past have been accused of uh, uh, not respecting the environment. I think this um, has been changing. I see this change myself. I've uh, been having work in the industry for the last uh, 40 years plus. So, so there is a change and there is a recognition by <clears throat> uh, large corporations that uh, they need to respect the environment. They need to work towards meeting these goals. And I don't know, someone may argue whether this is a genuine belief or they're doing it for public relations purposes, but whatever, whatever the motivation is that 
the end result, I think, is good. So, so those working in practice, keep again that in mind, and again, always question uh, what we, what you, why we, you're doing what we, what you do, and how does this affect the environment and your fellow people? Thank you. Okay, yeah, now I'm going to start. You were mentioning about uh, research in, in IHR, no? Uh, we cover all the, uh, I think, most of the water science teams, um, and, and also from both per perspective, fundamental and applied research. So uh, would you give the same advice, for instance, to a young researcher working on a, a very specific topic on fluid dynamics, very fundamental, because it's, sometimes it's hard to see the, um, they, they seem quite detached to, to realistic goals like the sustainable development goals. Yeah, I, th I think that it, some of the fundamental research basically, uh, again, is aimed at supporting something else. I mean, it's, uh, <clears throat> If we're trying to understand the fundamentals is that we need to question how, how we got there, why, why we came up with this question. And we came up with this fundamental question because we don't understand something that hopefully will help us address another problem. So, so I think if, if you follow and you, you try to go back as to why and how you came up with this fundamental question, you may find that, uh, again, this was because it was supposed to serve a, a more practical purpose. Uh, again, many of the practical uh, things that we have today from, I don't know, from cell phones to, to computers uh, are based on some very fundamental science. So, 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 so fundamental science, yeah, here help us get here. And, uh, and I think that, uh, again, we have to ask the same question as, as we work on uh, our uh, research on hydraulic issues. Okay. Yeah, true. Um, well, in the ultimate instance, no, there is always some linkage with uh, real world problems. And it's important to keep in mind this big picture. That's, I think, a good piece of advice on your side. Thank you. Uh, okay, so um, what are... Uh, uh, overpassing the time, almost 10 minutes, and I see there are no more questions in the Q&A. So, uh, yeah, if you agree, maybe we can uh, close the session now. So, If anybody has any questions or if uh, they want to know how to get more involved in uh, IHR's work to support the SDGs and uh, <clears throat> get connected with different parts of UN Water, please uh, feel free to contact me. Great. Okay. So thank you very much, uh, Angelos. It was a real pleasure to listen to your lecture and the discussion afterwards. And uh, well, I hope to see you all tomorrow. I think tomorrow we are starting at 11.30 a.m. Central European time, uh, where Eva, will give the, Eva and uh, Jose Maria will give the, um, the welcome. And then the technical sessions will start at 12 a.m. Central European time. So yeah, in the meantime, stay, stay safe and hopefully see you tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.